History of the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, by James Ford Rhodes. Preface This is not an abridgment of my three volumes on the Civil War, but a fresh study of the subject in which I have used my work as one of many authorities. Whenever I have transferred sentences, paragraphs, and pages, I have done so because, after a study of the original authorities, I found that I could give my conclusions no better than in my first work. Since writing the three volumes published respectively in 1895, 1899, and 1904, much new original material has come to light and valuable treatments of certain periods of the Civil War have appeared. I owe a special indebtedness to the official records of the Union and Confederate Navies, Diary of Gideon Wells, Life of Rollins, which J. H. Wilson kindly permitted me to read in manuscript before publication, The Letters and Diaries of John Hay, Miss Nicolay's Personal Traits of Lincoln, Life and Letters of General Meade, W. R. Livermore's Story of the Civil War, J. Bigelow, Jr., The Campaign of Chancellorsville, W. R. Thayer, Life of John Hay, The Reminiscences of Carl Schurz. I owe a literary revision of this volume to my son, Daniel P. Rhodes. I am indebted to D. M. Mattison for valuable assistance in historical research and for a careful reading of the manuscript with verifications. I acknowledge the aid of my secretary, Miss Wyman, that of Charles K. Bolton, librarian, Miss Wildman and Miss Catanac, assistants in the Boston Athenaeum. Boston, 1917 End of Preface 1. Part 1 The great factor in the destruction of slavery was the election of Abraham Lincoln as president in 1860 by the Republican Party, who had declared against the extension of slavery into the territories. The territories were those divisions of the national domain which lacked as yet the necessary qualifications for statehood through insufficient population or certain other impediments. They were under the control of Congress and the President. The Republicans were opposed to any interference with slavery in the states where it already existed, but they demanded freedom for the vast unorganized territory west of the Missouri River. How the election of Lincoln was brought about I have already related at length in my history of the United States from the Compromise of 1850 to the final restoration of home rule of the South in 1877, and more briefly in the first of my Oxford lectures. It was a sectional triumph, inasmuch as Lincoln did not receive a single vote in ten out of the eleven states that afterwards seceded and made up the Confederate states. Charleston, South Carolina, an ultra-pro-slavery city and eager for secession, rejoiced equally with the northern cities over the election of Lincoln, but the Charleston crowds were cheering for a southern confederacy. Herein were they supported by the people of South Carolina generally, who saw in the election of Lincoln an attack on their cherished institution of slavery, and cared no longer for political union with the people who held them to be living in the daily practice of evil. They regarded their slaves as property, and believed that they had the same constitutional right to carry that property into the common territory as the northern settlers had to take with them their property in horses and mules. Lincoln as president would deny them that privilege. In other words, he would refuse them equality. In his speeches he had fastened a stigma upon slavery. Believing it wrong, he must oppose it wherever he had the power, and he certainly would limit its extension. Could a free people, they asked, have a more undoubted grievance? Were they not fired by the spirit of 1776, and ought they not to strike before any distinct act of aggression? Revolution was a word on every tongue. The crisis was like one described by Thucydides when the meaning of words had no longer the same relation to things, reckless daring was held to be loyal courage, prudent delay was the excuse of a coward, moderation was the disguise of unmanly weakness, frantic energy was the true quality of a man. The people of South Carolina, amid great enthusiasm, demanded almost with one voice that their states secede from the Federal Union. The authorities promptly responded. A convention duly called and chosen passed an ordinance of secession which was termed a Declaration of Independence of the State of South Carolina. This act, in view of the South Carolinians and of the people of the other cotton states, was based on the state's reserved right under the compact entitled the Constitution. Martial music, bonfires, pistol firing, 
fireworks illuminations cries of joy and exultation greeted the passage of the ordinance which seemed to the people of charleston to mark the commencement of a revolution as glorious as that of seventeen seventy six meanwhile the united states senate through an able and representative committee of thirteen was at work on a compromise in the spirit of earlier days in eighteen twenty according to jefferson the knell of the union had been rung the slavery question said he like a fire-bell in the night awakened and filled me with terror but then the missouri compromise had saved the union again in eighteen fifty when the south and north were in bitter opposition on the same issue of slavery and threats of dissolution of the union were freely made by southern men the controversy was ended by clay's compromise and now in eighteen sixty the people of the northern and of the border slave states ardent for the preservation of the union believed that congress could somehow compose the dispute as it had done twice before the senate committee of thirteen at once took up the only expedient that could be expected to retain the six remaining cotton states in the union this was the crittenden compromise called after its author a senator from kentucky and the portion of it on which union or disunion turned was the article regarding territorial slavery crittenden proposed as a constitutional amendment that the old missouri compromise line of thirty-six degrees thirty feet should serve as the boundary between slavery and freedom in the territories north of it slavery should be prohibited south of it protected as phrased the article was satisfactory to the northern democratic and border slave state senators who together made up six of the committee the two senators from the cotton states would have accepted it had the understanding been clear that protection to slavery was to apply to all territory acquired in the future south of the compromise line the five republican senators opposed the territorial article and as it had been agreed that any report to be binding must have the assent of a majority of these five they defeated in committee this necessary provision of the compromise william h seward one of the thirteen the leader of the republicans in congress and the prospective head of lincoln's cabinet would undoubtedly have assented to this article could he have secured lincoln's support but lincoln though ready to compromise every other matter in dispute was inflexible on the territorial question that is to say as regarded territory which might be acquired in the future he could not fail to see that the territories which were a part of the united states in eighteen sixty were in webster's words dedicated to freedom by an ordinance of nature and the will of god and he was willing to give the slaveholders an opportunity to make a political slave state out of new mexico which was south of the missouri compromise line but he feared that if a parallel of latitude should be recognized by solemn exactment as the boundary between slavery and freedom filibustering for all south of us and making slave states of it would follow in spite of us a year will not pass he wrote further till we should have to take cuba as a condition upon which they the cotton states will stay in the union lincoln therefore using the powerful and direct influence of the president-elect caused the republican senators to defeat the crittenden compromise in the committee who were thus forced to report that they could not agree upon a plan of adjustment then crittenden proposed to submit his plan to a vote of the people so strong was the desire to preserve the union that had this been done the majority would probably have been overwhelming in favor of the compromise and although only an informal vote it would have been an instruction impossible for congress to resist crittenden's resolution looking to such an expression of public sentiment was prevented from coming to a vote in the senate by the quiet opposition of republican senators the last chance of retaining the six cotton states in the union was gone between january nine and february one eighteen sixty one the conventions of mississippi florida alabama georgia louisiana and texas passed ordinances of secession early in february the confederate states was formed delegates from six cotton states assembled in montgomery and proceeding in an orderly manner formed a government the cornerstone of which rested upon the great truth that slavery is the negro's natural and normal condition they elected jefferson davis president and adopted a constitution modeled on that of the united states but departing from that instrument and its express recognition of slavery and the right of secession when lincoln was inaugurated president on march fourth he confronted a difficult situation elected by a union of thirty-three states he had lost before performing an official act the allegiance of seven believing 
that no state can in any way lawfully get out of the union without the consent of the others and that it is the duty of the president to run the machine as it is he had to determine on a line of policy toward the states that had constituted themselves the southern confederacy but any such policy was certain to be complicated by the desirability of retaining in the union the border slave states of maryland virginia kentucky and missouri as well as north carolina tennessee and arkansas whose affiliations were close with the four border states all seven were drawn towards the north by their affection for the union and towards the south by the community of interest in the social system of slavery one of Lincoln's problems, then, was to make the love for the Union outweigh the sympathy with the slave-holding states that had seceded. It is difficult to see how he could have bettered the policy to which he gave the key note in his inaugural address. I hold, he said, that the Union of these states is perpetual. Physically speaking, we cannot separate. The power confided to me will be used to hold, occupy, and possess the property and places belonging to the government. This last declaration, though inevitable for a president in his position, outweighed all his words of conciliation, and rendered of no avail his closing pathetic appeal to his dissatisfied fellow countrymen, not to bring civil war on the country. During the progress of the secession, the forts, arsenals, custom houses, and other property of the federal government within the limits of the cotton states were taken possession of by these states, and in due time, all this property was turned over to the Southern Confederacy, so that on March 4th, all that Lincoln controlled was four military posts of which Fort Sumter, commanding Charleston, was much the most important. Since the very beginning of the secession movement, the eyes of the North had been upon South Carolina. For many years she had been restive under the bonds of the Union. Her chief city, Charleston, had witnessed the disruption of the Democratic National Convention and the consequent split in the party which made certain the Republican success of 1860 that in turn had led to the secession of the state and the formation of the Southern Confederacy. Fort Sumter had fixed the attention of the Northern mind by an occurrence in December 1860. Major Anderson, with a small garrison of United States troops, had occupied Fort Moultrie but convinced that he could not defend that fort against any attack from charleston he had secretly on the night after christmas withdrawn his force to fort sumter a much stronger post next morning when the movement was discovered charleston fumed with rage whilst the north on hearing the news was jubilant and made a hero of anderson lincoln recognized the importance of holding fort sumter but he also purposed to use all means short of the compromise of his deepest convictions to retain the border slave states and north carolina tennessee and arkansas and the union the action of these three turned upon virginia whose convention was in session ready to take any action which the posture of affairs seemed to demand the fundamental difficulty now asserted itself to hold Fort Sumter was to Lincoln a bounden duty, but to the Virginians it savored of coercion, and coercion in this case meant forcing a state which had seceded back into the Union. If an attempt was made to coerce a state, Virginia would join the Southern Confederacy. The Confederate states now regarded the old Union as a foreign power whose possession of a fort within their limits flying the American flag was a daily insult. They attempted to secure Sumter by an indirect negotiation with the Washington government, and were encouraged by the assurances of Seward, Lincoln's Secretary of State and most trusted counselor. Had the President known of Seward's intimation, which was almost a promise, that Sumter would be evacuated, he would have been greatly perturbed, and would have called a halt in the negotiations to the end that the Southern commissioners be undeceived. On April 1st he was further troubled by a paper— some thoughts for the president's consideration which seward had privately submitted to him as an outline of the fit policy to be pursued this was briefly the evacuation of fort sumter the reinforcement of the other posts in the south a demand at once for explanations from spain and france and if they were not satisfactory a call of a special session of congress to declare war against those two nations also explanations to be sought from great britain and russia with that same rash disregard of his chief and blind reliance on his own notions of statecraft which he had shown in his negotiations with justice campbell the intermediary between himself and the southern commissioners who had been sent to washington by davis he gave the president a strong hint that the execution of this policy should be devolved upon some member of the cabinet and that member himself the proposed foreign policy was reckless and wholly unwarranted 
our relations with these four powers were entirely peaceful. To use Seward's own words less than three months before, there is not a nation on earth that is not an interested admiring friend. Seward had got it into his head that if our nation should provoke a foreign war, the cotton states would unite in amity with the North and like brothers fight the common foe under the old flag. Lincoln, of course, saw that the foreign policy proposed was wild and foolish, but ignored it in his considerate reply to some thoughts for the President's consideration. He kept the existence of the paper rigidly a secret. He did not demand the Secretary's resignation. He had for him no word of sarcasm or reproach. The President submitted to another drain on his time and strength in the persistent scramble for office. The grounds, halls, stairways, closets of the White House— wrote Seward, are filled with office-seekers. And Lincoln said, I seem like one sitting in a palace assigning apartments to importunate applicants while the structure is on fire and likely soon to perish in ashes. When he ought to have been able to concentrate his mind on the proper attitude to the seceding states, he was hampered by the ceaseless demands for a lucrative recognition from his supporters and by the irrational proposals of the chief of his cabinet. The great problem now was Sumter. What should be done about it? On the day after his inauguration, the President was informed that Anderson believed a reinforcement of 20,000 men necessary for the defense of the post. After being transported to the neighborhood by sea, they must fight their way through to the fort. For the South Carolinians had been steadily at work on the islands in Charleston Harbor, erecting batteries and strengthening the forts which bore on Sumter. Moreover, Anderson's provisions would not last beyond the middle of April. General Scott, the head of the army, advised the evacuation of Sumter, a logical step in the course of action toward the South, which he and other men of influence had advocated, and which he expressed in the pertinent words, Wayward sisters depart in peace. At the cabinet meeting of March 15th, the President asked his advisers, If it be possible to provision Fort Sumter, is it wise to attempt it? Four agreed with Seward, saying, No. Only two gave an affirmative answer. Lincoln undoubtedly had moments of thinking that the fort must be evacuated. With his eye upon Virginia, whose convention he hoped might adjourn without action, he may have promised one of her representatives that he would withdraw Anderson, provided the Virginia convention, always a menace of secession while it continued to sit, would adjourn sine die. The evidence is too conflicting to justify a positive assertion, but if such a proposal were made, it was never transmitted to and acted upon by the convention. In the final decision, the sentiment of the North had to be taken into account. To abandon Sumter would seem to indicate that a peaceful separation would follow, that the principle of the sovereignty of the states and secession had triumphed. Finally, with increasing support in his cabinet, Lincoln came to a wise decision. Reinforcement from a military point of view was impracticable. To reach the fort, the North might have to fire the first shot. But, as a political measure, he decided to send bread to Anderson, so that Sumter would not have to be evacuated from lack of food. In accordance with his previous promise, he sent word to the governor of South Carolina of his intention. Beauregard, commander of the Confederate troops at Charleston, who in company with the governor heard the formal notification, telegraphed it to the Confederate Secretary of War at Montgomery, receiving two days later, April 10th, the order to demand the evacuation of Fort Sumter and, if this was refused, to proceed to reduce it. The demand was made, and when Anderson had written his refusal to comply with it, he observed to the Confederate aides, the bearers of Beauregard's note, If you do not batter the fort to pieces about us, we shall be starved out in a few days. Beauregard, acting with caution, transmitted this remark to Montgomery, where equal caution not to precipitate hostilities was shown in the reply. Do not desire needlessly to bombard Fort Sumter. If Major Anderson will state the time at which he will evacuate Sumter, you are authorized thus to avoid the effusion of blood. Evacuation was redemanded by Beauregard's aides at three quarters of an hour after midnight of April 11th. This was again refused, but Anderson wrote, I will evacuate Fort Sumter by noon on the 15th instant, should I not receive prior to that time controlling instructions from my government or additional supplies. The aides considered these terms manifestly futile, and acting in accordance with the letter of their instructions, they gave the order to Fort Johnson to open fire. The first shell was fired at half-past four on the morning of April 12th. 
This shot, the signal for the bombardment to begin, caused a profound thrill throughout the United States, and in point of fact, it inaugurated four years of civil war. The bombardment was unnecessary. Sumter might have been had without it. Beauregard was needlessly alarmed over the relief expedition that was bringing bread to Anderson. He feared a descent upon the South Carolina coast by the United States fleet then lying at the entrance of the harbor for the supposed purpose of reinforcing Fort Sumter. One of his aides reported that four large steamers are plainly in view standing off the bar. The people in Charleston thought that there were six men of war in the offing. In connection with the general alarm on shore, it is interesting to note the actual mishaps of the relief expedition. This was intended to consist of four warships, three steam tugs, and the merchant steamer Baltic. The Baltic, with G. V. Fox, who had command of the expedition on board, arrived off Charleston one hour and a half before the bombardment began, but found there only one warship. Another arrived at seven in the morning, but without the Powhatan, the most important of the warships, and the one carrying the equipment necessary for the undertaking, nothing could be accomplished, and no attempt was made to provision the fort. Administrative inefficiency, Seward's meddlesomeness and a heavy storm at sea conjoined to cause the failure of the expedition. Fox and his companions watched the bombardment, chafing at their powerlessness to render their brothers-in-arms any assistance. Before leaving Sumter, Beauregard's aides notified Anderson in writing that in an hour their batteries would open on the fort. Anderson and his officers went through the casemates where the men were sleeping, waked them, told them of the impending attack and of his decision not to return the fire until after daylight. The first shell was from Fort Johnson. At half-past four it rose high in air and, curving in its course, burst almost directly over the fort. The next shot came from Cummings Point, fired, it is said, by a venerable secessionist from Virginia who had long awaited the glory of this day. The official account does not confirm the popular impression, but the lieutenant colonel in command wrote that his men were greatly incited by the enthusiasm and example of this old Virginian who was at one of the Cummings Point batteries during the greater part of the bombardment. After Cummings Point all the batteries opened in quick succession. Sumter was surrounded by a circle of fire. Meanwhile the men in the fort, alive to the novelty of the scene, watched the shot and shell directed at them, until, realizing the danger of exposure, they retired to the bomb-proofs to await the usual roll-call and order for breakfast. Having no more bread, they ate pork and damaged rice. At seven o'clock, Anderson gave the order, and Sumter discharged its first gun at Cummings Point, following up this shot with a vigorous fire. An hour and a half later, Sumter opened upon Moultrie, and from that time, a steady and continuous fire between the two was kept up throughout the day. For the people of Charleston who gathered on the housetops and thronged to the wharves and to their favorite promenade, the battery, this artillery duel, was a mighty spectacle. They had lost all love for the Union. They hated the American flag somewhat as the Venetians hated the Austrian, and, though apprehensive of danger to their husbands, sons, and brothers, they rejoiced that the time was drawing near when the enemy should no longer hold a fort commanding their harbor and city. In the early afternoon the fire of Sumter slackened. Cartridges were lacking, although the six needles in the fort were kept steadily employed until all the extra clothing of the companies, all coarse paper and extra hospital sheets, had been used. After dark, Sumter stopped firing. The Confederate batteries continued to throw shells, though at longer intervals. As, during the dark and stormy night, it was almost confidently expected that the United States fleet would attempt to land troops upon the islands or to throw men into Fort Sumter by means of boats, there was ceaseless vigilance on Morris and Sullivan's Islands. Early on Saturday morning, April 13, the bombardment was renewed. The men in the fort ate the last of the damaged rice with pork but they sprang briskly to their work. Fort Sumter opened early and spitefully and paid a special attention to Fort Moultrie, wrote Moultrie's commander. Soon hot shot from Moultrie and other batteries set the officers' quarters on fire. The powder magazine was in danger. Anderson ordered fifty barrels removed and distributed around in the casemates, the magazine doors to be closed and packed with earth. As in the meantime the wooden barracks had taken fire, endangering the powder in the casemates, he commanded that all but five barrels should be thrown into the sea. At one o'clock the flagstaff was struck and fell, 
and the fallen flag though soon hoisted again together with the smoke and the flames gave the confederates reason to believe that anderson was in distress an aide under a white flag was dispatched to him from cummings point three more from the city by beauregard negotiations followed resulting in honourable terms i marched out of the fort sunday afternoon the fourteenth instant reported anderson with colours flying and drums beating bringing away company and private property and saluting my flag with fifty guns in this momentous battle no man on either side was killed as compared with the military writing of two years later the crudity of the contemporary correspondence and reports is grimly significant they told of the work of boys learning the rudiments of war boys who would soon be seasoned veterans wise in the methods of destruction a strenuous schooling this and the beginning of it was the artillery duel in charleston harbor beauregard's aides assumed too great a responsibility in giving the order to fire the first shot they should have referred anderson's reply to their chief there can be no doubt that the confederate states would have obtained peacefully on monday what they got by force on sunday if beauregard had had anderson's last response he would unquestionably have waited to ask montgomery for further instructions the presence of the united states fleet was of course disquieting yet the danger from this source even as exaggerated in beauregard's mind could be averted quite as well by acting on the defensive as by the bombardment of fort sumter but south carolina was hot for possession of the fort and the aides who gave the order that precipitated hostilities were swayed by the passion of the moment in april eighteen sixty one war was undoubtedly inevitable the house divided against itself could not stand the irrepressible conflict had come to a head words were a salve no longer under the circumstances it was fortunate for lincoln that the south became the aggressor davis's elaborate apology and the writing inspired by it could never answer the questions put by northern to southern soldiers when they met under a flag of truce or in the banter between confederates and federals when opportunities offered who began the war who struck the first blow who battered the walls of fort sumter at one stamp of his foot the president called the whole nation to arms wrote henry adams in eighteen sixty one while in washington he referred to the proclamation asking for seventy five thousand volunteers whose first service would probably be to repossess the forts places and property which have been seized from the union lincoln wrote this on the sunday when anderson marched out of sumter april fourteen and following closely the act of february twenty eighth seventeen ninety five his authority he called forth that number of militia apportioned among twenty-seven states to suppress in the seven cotton states combinations beyond the ordinary course of judicial proceedings and he summoned congress to meet on july fourth in special session in the particulars communicated by the war department to the several governors the time of service was fixed at three months but this represented in no way the president's opinion as to the probable duration of the war he was simply following the act of seventeen ninety five which provided that the militia could be held to service for only thirty days after the next meeting of congress after two days full of indignant outbursts at the insult to the flag the people of the north read the president's call for troops that first gun at sumter wrote lowell brought all the free states to their feet as one man the heather is on fire said george tickner i never before knew what a popular excitement can be at the north there never was anything like it governors legislatures wherever these were in session and private citizens acted in generous cooperation men forgot that they had been republicans or democrats the partisan was sunk in the patriot washington was supposed to be in danger of capture by the southern troops flushed with their victory at sumter armed and equipped soldiers were needed for its defence the sixth massachusetts was the first regiment to respond leaving boston on april seventeenth and arriving in baltimore two days later the only approach by rail to washington was through baltimore where the strong feeling for secession was vented in threats that northern troops bent on the invasion of the south would not be permitted to pass through its streets the colonel of the sixth being informed in philadelphia of the situation timed his arrival in baltimore for the morning of april nineteenth here a transfer was usually made by means of horses drawing the passenger cars through the streets from the philadelphia to the washington station a mile distant where a change was made to the cars of the baltimore and ohio railroad which owned the forty miles of single track to the nation's capital 
seven companies were thus driven rapidly through the city. Meanwhile, an angry mob had collected, torn up the railroad, and erected a barricade to dispute the passage of the rest of the regiment. Informed of this, the captains of the four remaining companies decided that they must march to the station. But before they had started, up came the mob, carrying a secession flag and threatening that, if an attempt were made to march through the streets, every white nigger of them would be killed. The captain of whom the command devolved gave the order to march, a policeman leading the way. As the soldiers stepped forward, they received a volley of brick bats and paving stones from the mob. A hundred yards farther on, they came to a bridge which had been partially demolished. We had to play hopscotch to get over it, said the captain. The order double quick was then given, which led the mob to believe that the soldiers either had no ammunition or dared not use it. In their growing rage, they fired pistol shots into the ranks, and one soldier fell dead. The captain gave the order, fire. A number of the mob fell. The mayor of Baltimore arrived and placed himself at the head of the column. The mob grew bolder, he wrote, and the attack became more violent. Various persons were killed and wounded on both sides. As his presence failed to allay the tumult, the mayor left the head of the column, but the four companies marched on, fighting their way through their comrades, aided by the city marshal with fifty policemen who covered their rear. In the Baltimore and Ohio cars, with the blinds closed, the regiment received a volley of stones which so infuriated one of the soldiers that he fired and killed a prominent citizen, a mere looker-on. Finally the train got away and reached Washington late in the afternoon. Of the regiment, four had been killed and thirty-six wounded. The casualties in the mob were larger. In Baltimore the excitement was intense. The streets are red with Maryland blood are the marshal's words. Secessionists and southern sympathizers were rampant. Stifling the Union sentiment of the city, they carried everything with a high hand and dictated the action of the constituted authorities. The excitement is fearful. Send no more troops here, is the joint dispatch of the governor of Maryland and the mayor of Baltimore to the president. So great was the commotion that a part of the state and city military was called out. Citizens volunteered, and, after being more or less adequately furnished with arms, were enrolled for the purpose of defense under the direction of the Board of Police. In Monument Square, a mass meeting assembled, whose sentiment was decidedly opposed to any attempt at coercion of the Confederate States. Apprehending a severe fight and bloodshed, if more northern troops attempted to pass through Baltimore, the mayor and city marshal ordered the burning of certain bridges on the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad, the line to Philadelphia, and on the northern central, the line to Harrisburg. Three bridges on each railroad were burned, thus completely severing the rail communications with the north. The seven days since the evacuation of Sumter had been crowded with events of a deeply ominous character. On April 17, the Virginia Convention, sitting in secret, had passed an ordinance of secession, an act which became known to the authorities in Washington on the following day. As a rejoinder to Lincoln's call for 75,000 troops, Jefferson Davis, by proclamation, invited applications for letters of mark and reprisal against the Merchant Marine of the United States. The President retorted, April 19th, by proclaiming a blockade of southern ports from South Carolina to Texas inclusive, and declaring that privateers, acting under the pretended authority of the Confederate States, would be treated as pirates. On the 18th, the United States commander at Harper's Ferry in Virginia, deeming his position untenable, abandoned it after demolishing the arsenal and burning the armory building. On the 20th, the Gosport Navy Yard was partially destroyed by the Union forces and left to the possession of the Virginians. On the same day, Robert E. Lee, who was esteemed by Scott the ablest officer next to himself in the service, and who had been unofficially offered the active command of the Union Army, resigned his commission, thus indicating that he had decided to cast his lot with the South. The gravity of the situation was heightened by the severance of communications between the national capital and the North as a result of the trouble in Baltimore. On Sunday night, April 21st, the telegraph ceased to be available. The only connection the government now had with its loyal territory and people was by means of private couriers. These made their way with difficulty through Maryland, where for the moment an unfriendly element prevailed. Correct information was difficult to get, and rumors of all sorts filled the air. The government and citizens alike were apprehensive of an attack on the capital. 
they feared that beauregard's south carolina army would be transported north as fast as the railroads could carry it and reinforced in richmond by virginia troops would easily take washington preparations were made to withstand a siege panic seized the crowds of office seekers driving them northwards many secessionist citizens fearing that the whole male population of the city would be impressed for its defense left for the south washington wrote general scott on april twenty second is now partially besieged threatened and in danger of being attacked on all sides in a day or two or three the arrival of the eighth massachusetts and seventh new york at annapolis who had finished their journey to that point by water prompted the governor to telegraph to the president advising that no more troops be ordered or allowed to pass through maryland and he suggested that lord lyons the english minister be requested to act as mediator between the contending parties of our country john hay then one of the president's private secretaries has given in his diary a graphic account of these days of the novel scene of the sixth massachusetts quartered in the capital he wrote the contrast was very painful between the gray-haired dignity that filled the senate chamber when i saw it last and the present throng of bright-looking yankee boys the most of them bearing the signs of new england rusticity in voice and manner scattered over the desks chairs and galleries some loafing many writing letters slowly and with plough-hardened hands or with rapid glancing clerky fingers while gro representative from pennsylvania later speaker of the house stood patient by the desk and franked for everybody the town is full to-night april twentieth of feverish rumors about a meditated assault upon the city this morning april twenty first we mounted the battlements of the executive mansion and the ancient lincoln took a long look down the bay troops were expected to arrive via fort monroe chesapeake bay and the potomac river it was a water hall a telegram intercepted on its way to baltimore states that our yankees eight massachusetts and new yorkers seventh new york have landed at annapolis april twenty second weary and footsore but very welcome they will probably greet us to-morrow housekeepers here are beginning to dread famine flour has made a sudden spring to eighteen dollars a barrel the president was keenly alive to the importance of holding the capital and feared greatly for its safety as tuesday the twenty-third passed and no soldiers came he paced the floor of the executive office in restless anxiety looking out of the window down the potomac for the long-expected boats thinking himself alone he exclaimed in tones of anguish why don't they come why don't they come that same day had brought a mail from new york three days old containing newspapers which told that the uprising of the north continued with growing strength and unbounded enthusiasm that the seventh new york regiment had already departed and that troops from rhode island were on the way next day april twenty fourth wrote hay was one of gloom and doubt everybody seems filled with a vague distrust and recklessness the idea seemed to be reached by lincoln when chatting with the volunteers six massachusetts this morning he said i don't believe there is any north the seventh regiment is a myth rhode island is not known in our geography any longer you are the only northern realities meanwhile the seventh new york and eight massachusetts were marching to annapolis junction where they found a train which took them quickly to washington the seventh regiment arrived first april twenty fifth forming as soon as they left the cars they marched up pennsylvania avenue to the white house to the people who noted their military bearing and to the president who reviewed them they were a goodly sight their arrival indicated that the route from the loyal north to its capital was open that other regiments were on the way soon to arrive and that washington was safe it was not until may ninth however that northern troops attempted to pass through baltimore coming from perryville in transports and landing under the guns of a revenue steamer they were then carried in cars under ample police protection through south baltimore they were not molested four days later and twenty-four after the severance of communication the first train from philadelphia arrived at the capital and shortly afterwards regular railroad communication with the northern cities for passengers as well as for the military was re-established end of chapter one part one one part two the people of the confederate states looked upon lincoln's call for seventy five thousand troops as a declaration of war implying a policy of invasion of their territory an attack upon themselves and their property the uprising in the south was precisely similar to that in the north 
The people declared that they would resist the Lincoln government as long as they could command a man or a dollar. The cooperation of governors and individuals with Davis matches the cooperation of northerners with Lincoln. If a European, ignorant of the names of our states or of our public men in 1861, were to read the official records, the only way he could tell which side he was reading about would be by reference to the editor's titles of Union or Confederate Correspondence. The first stakes for Lincoln and Davis to play for were Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, and Arkansas. Despite the unfortunate demonstrations in her chief city, Baltimore, Maryland contained a powerful element whose love of the Union was shared by her governor. Under his guidance, with the tactful help of the president, she cast her lot with the North. Two days before the bombardment of Sumter, Roger A. Pryor, a Virginia secessionist, in an impassioned speech in Charleston said, I will tell you, gentlemen, what will put Virginia and the Southern Confederacy in less than an hour by Shrewsbury clock. Strike a blow. He knew his countrymen. The excitement in Virginia was equal to that in the cotton states. To the requisition for her quota of troops under the President's call for 75,000, her governor expressed the public opinion in a defiant refusal. Montgomery had already heard that Virginia was in a blaze of excited indignation against Lincoln's proclamation. On April 17, her convention, by a vote of 103 to 46, adopted an ordinance of secession which was to be valid if ratified by a vote of the people on the fourth Thursday of May. As the authorities assumed the result of the popular vote, they proceeded to join the fortunes of Virginia with the Confederate States. Having telegraphed to Montgomery the common desire, the governor received at once this dispatch from Davis. Resolution for alliance received. Proposition cordially accepted. Commissioner will be sent by next train. In fulfillment of this promise, Alexander H. Stevens, the vice president of the Confederate States, went to Richmond. Although he wrote of the embarrassment and difficulties in getting the arrangement effected, the common aim and sympathy were so certain that he negotiated a military alliance between the Confederate States and Virginia, giving the control and direction of her military force to Davis. On May 7th, the Confederate Congress admitted her into the Confederacy, and accepting the offer of her convention, April 27th, made Richmond their capital, May 21st. The governor of North Carolina replied to the Secretary of War, I regard the levy of troops made by the administration for the purpose of subjugating the states of the South as in violation of the Constitution and a gross usurpation of power. I can be no party to this war upon the liberties of a free people. You can get no troops from North Carolina. Before Lincoln's call for troops, two-thirds of the people of North Carolina were opposed to secession. Now, however, as speedily as a convention could be assembled, an ordinance of secession was adopted by unanimous vote, and North Carolina became one of the Confederate states. On May 6, Arkansas, through her convention, passed an ordinance of secession with only one dissenting vote. Soon afterwards, she joined the Southern Confederacy. In answer to Lincoln's requisition for troops, Tennessee's governor said, Tennessee will not furnish a single man for purpose of coercion. She did not adopt an ordinance of secession, but during the month of May her legislature made a military league with the Confederate States, and she became one of them, subject to the vote of the people which was taken on June 8th. By a majority of nearly 58,000, they declared in favor of separation from the Union and joined the Southern Confederacy. Kentucky, so telegraphed her governor, will furnish no troops for the wicked purpose of subduing her sister Southern States. But he could not draw her into the secession movement. A drift of conflicting opinions held her in the balance, but Lincoln knew his native state well, and, by tact and forbearance, he guided the Union men so that their influence continually spread until the month of August when, in the newly elected legislature, they had a majority of nearly three-fourths in each branch. Missouri's governor was likewise favorable to secession, replying to the call for troops. Your requisition, in my judgment, is illegal, unconstitutional, and revolutionary in its object, inhuman and diabolical. Not one man will the state of Missouri furnish to carry on any such holy crusade. He had, however, a resolute antagonist in Francis P. Blair, Jr., a man of extraordinary physical and moral courage, of high social position in St. Louis and personally very popular. 
between him and the governor there ensued four months of political and martial manoeuvring but blair won in the end and missouri remained in the union the array was now complete twenty-three states were pitted against eleven twenty-two million people against nine and of the time three and one-half million were slaves each side had peculiar advantages but neither section understood the other if the South had known that secession must result in war and that the foe would be a united North, it is doubtful if she would have proceeded to the last extremity. It is still more doubtful if the North would have fought had she known that she must contend against a united Southern people. The remark of Chatham, conquer a free population of three million souls, the thing is impossible, had become an axiom of the English race. But now the North confronted five and a half million earnest and brave people, supported by three and a half million servants, who grew the food and took care of the women and children at home while the men fought in the field. The North was contending for the Union on the theory that a strong and unscrupulous minority had overridden the majority of Southerners who had no desire for secession, loathed the idea of civil war, and, if protected and encouraged, would make themselves felt in a movement looking towards allegiance to the national government. Lincoln comprehended the sentiment of the North, and he never gave public expression to any opinion that he did not sincerely hold. In his Fourth of July message to the special session of Congress, he said, It may well be questioned whether there is today a majority of the legally qualified voters of any state, except perhaps South Carolina, in favor of disunion. There is much reason to believe that the Union men are the majority in many, if not in every other one, of the so-called seceded states. I have discussed this matter so thoroughly in my history that it is unnecessary for me to recur to it at length. Nevertheless, I may observe that on returning to the subject twenty years after my first discussion of it, and on going through the original materials again, I have been more firmly convinced than before of the unanimity of the Confederate States after the President's call for troops. The citations from William H. Russell's letters to the London Times and from his diary, which I gave in my third volume, furnish an authoritative corroboration of the other evidence. This intelligent and fair-minded man, who sympathized with the North because he hated slavery and was convinced that the invocation of state rights was for protection to slavery, extension of slave territory, and free trade in slave produce with the outer world, made a journey through the southern states between April 14th and June 19th, 1861, and became convinced that the people of the Confederacy were united. Summing up the results of his tour, he wrote, I met everywhere with but one feeling, with exceptions which proved its unanimity and force. To a man the people went with their states and had but one battle cry, States' rights and death to those who make war against them. In spite of his supercilious criticism, Russell wished the North to win, because he foresaw in her victory the destruction of slavery. But he did not believe that she could triumph. In April, while in Charleston, he wrote, I am more satisfied than ever that the Union can never be restored as it was, and that it has gone to pieces, never to be put together again in the old shape, at all events, by any power on earth. In New Orleans, on May 31st, he set down in his diary, Now that the separation has come, there is not, in the Constitution or out of it, power to cement the broken fragments together. On the steamer on the Mississippi, which brought him from a Confederate camp to Cairo, he met an Englishman who was steward of the boat and not averse to giving his opinion, which Russell quotes with apparent approval of the concluding statement. This war, the steward said, is all about niggers. I have been sixteen years in the country, and I never met one of them yet was fit to be anything but a slave. I know the two sections well, and I tell you, sir, the North can't whip the South, let them do their best. Mixed with a stern determination on both sides to fight out the conflict was a sincere regret that the Union should be broken. When an old gentleman whom Russell met in Charleston spoke of the prospect of civil war, tears rolled down his cheeks, but regarding it as the natural consequence of the insults, injustice, and aggression of the North against Southern rights, he had no apprehension for the result. Mrs. Chestnut wrote of the separation, The wrench has been awful. When the Virginia Convention was considering the Ordinance of Secession, one delegate, who spoke against it, became incoherent in his emotion and finally broke down sobbing. Another who voted for it wept like a child at the thought of rending ancient ties. 
it is henry adam's opinion based on his recollections of washington in the winter of eighteen sixty one that not one man in america wanted the civil war or expected or intended it similar was nicolay's impression at the same period in springfield while assisting lincoln nobody wanted war is the word and when it came j d cox and james a garfield then members of the ohio legislature groaned at the shame the folly the outrage of civil war in our land john t morse in his biography of lincoln which possesses somehow the authority of a contemporary document as well as the interest of an artistic study of a great man wrote historians say rhetorically that the north sprang to arms and it really would have done so if there had been any arms to spring to but muskets were scarce the correspondence in volume one series three of the official records amply confirms this statement the governors of the several states in their communications to the united states war department began by asking for muskets and cannon soon they were begging for them ohio was undoubtedly a fair example of the states west of the alleghanies mcclellan who had been appointed major-general of her volunteers made an inspection of the state arsenal and found a few boxes of smooth-bore muskets rusted and damaged two or three smooth-bore six-pounders which had been honeycombed by firing salutes a confused pile of mildewed harness which had once been used for artillery horses as he went out of the door he said half humorously half sadly a fine stock of munitions on which to begin a great war the governor of iowa's demand of the secretary of war for god's sake send us some arms exemplified the feeling of all all the states wanted rifled muskets of which the government had only a small supply and when they received old flint-lock muskets or the same percussion they felt that due attention was not being paid to their necessities morton the governor of indiana reported that the arms received by his state were of an inferior character being old muskets rifled out in very many instances he added the bayonets have to be driven on with a hammer and many others are so loose that they can be shaken off our boys wrote the governor of iowa don't feel willing to carry old-fashioned muskets to the field to meet men armed with better weapons appreciating the impotence of the federal government massachusetts sent an agent to europe with money for the purchase of improved arms and new york bought enfield rifles in england the governors of several states begged for accoutrements uniforms and clothing there was urgent need of forage caps infantry trousers flannel sack coats flannel shirts booties stockings greatcoats and blankets the government wrote the secretary of war to morton finds itself unable to furnish at once the uniforms and clothing demanded by the large force suddenly brought into service mcclellan wrote of his ohio troops i have never seen so fine a body of men collected together the material is superb but has no organization or discipline a captain of the regular army who came to muster a number of these regiments into the united states service looking down the line of stalwart men clad in the garibaldi red flannel shirt for lack of uniforms exclaimed my god that such men should be food for powder good-looking and energetic young fellows too good to be food for gunpowder wrote john hay of the sixth massachusetts and the same remark might have been made of nearly all the three months men from every state before the end of april lincoln had made up his mind that he had embarked on a long war the quotas of three months volunteers were rapidly filled and as more men came forward he determined to turn the prolonged outburst of patriotism to account by prevailing upon the latecomers to enlist for three years on may third he increased the army by proclamation the response to his different calls for troops was thus described in his fourth of july message one of the greatest perplexities of the government is to avoid receiving troops faster than it can provide for them in a word the people will save their government if the government itself will do its part only indifferently well our secretary of war cameron to judge from the official correspondence during the first months of the war appears to have been good-natured inefficient short-sighted a man of narrow views lincoln on the other hand keenly alive to the situation was repeatedly urging the war department to accept the men who offered themselves for three years and to take the chance of providing them with arms uniforms and monthly pay thus in the beginning even as in the later years of his presidency his first thought was for the chief requirement of his side he would have the men the provision to be made for them could be left to the future
the unpreparedness of the southern people was similar to that of the northern but their difficulty in procuring arms and ammunition was greater accustomed as they had been to buy their powder from northern factories they were now obliged to develop this industry within their own borders with less money and inferior credit they found it more difficult to make purchases abroad moreover the blockade soon became a serious impediment to their commerce on may third general scott wrote we rely greatly on the sure operation of a complete blockade of the atlantic and gulf ports soon to commence mrs chestnut who had dined with jefferson davis in richmond on july sixteenth set down in her diary we begin to cry out for more ammunition and already the blockade is beginning to shut it all out the confederate secretary of war walker seemed to lack geniality and showed in his correspondence with the governors more acerbity than was desirable in an officer of a new government organizing for a protracted conflict on the other hand davis was at first superior in administrative capacity to lincoln his west point training army service in mexico and efficient conduct of the war department for four years had made him familiar with military details which lincoln had now to master with painful effort lee as commander of the virginia forces was an efficient aid to the governor in richmond which city was destined to be the most important military point in the confederacy but affected by the disposition that prevailed on each side to overrate the other he like the governor of iowa thought that the enemy had much superior arms in perusing the confidential union and confederate correspondence between the bombardment of sumter and the battle of bull run one is struck with the unreadiness of both south and north for war and with the contrast generally between military conditions in this country and in europe in eighteen seventy the french minister of war told his colleagues and the emperor that france was ready more than ready and to a commission of the corps législatif declared so ready are we that if the war were to last two years not a gaiter button would be found wanting within ten days he had transported by railroad to the frontier nearly two hundred thousand men with cannon horses and munitions meanwhile bismarck was asking moltke what are our prospects of victory i believe replied moltke that we are more than a match for them always with the reservation that no one can foresee the issue of a great battle and a rapid outbreak is on the whole more favorable to us than delay in a little over a fortnight's time moltke had a prussian army more than twice as large as the french on the french frontier had either south or north had the comparatively imperfect preparation of france with no similar development on the part of the other that side would have swept everything before it had both south and north had the perfect organization of prussia the war might have been shorter but the prussian military system was impossible in the united states and even if possible it would not have been considered worth while the americans like the athenians of the time of pericles then preferred to meet danger with a light heart but without laborious training davis in his message of april twenty ninth to his congress maintained that lincoln's call for seventy five thousand troops was a declaration of war against the confederacy and he asked them to devise measures for their defense arguing that each state was sovereign and in the last resort the sole judge as well of its wrongs as of the mode and measure of redress he justified secession and the formation of the confederate states we feel that our cause is just and holy he declared all we ask is to be let alone that those who never held power over us shall not now attempt our subjugation by arms this we will this we must resist to the direst extremity davis as president was obliged to make the best out of a situation which he regarded with considerable misgiving he had been averse to war and had wished his southern brethren less precipitate toward the end of june in richmond mrs chestnut had with him a talk of nearly an hour through which there ran on his part a sad refrain his tone was not sanguine he anticipated a long war he laughed at the common brag that every southerner was equal to three yankees only fools he continued, doubted the courage of the Yankees or their willingness to fight when they saw it. The Confederates said the President in his Fourth of July message forced upon the country the distinct issue, immediate dissolution or blood. It was with the deepest regret that the Executive found the duty of employing the war power in defense of the government forced upon him. He could but perform this duty or surrender the existence of the government. 
using an expression of which he grew fond, the plain people, he addressed to them an argument in support of his position. Lincoln, of all men in 1861, was most thoroughly convinced that the Southerners would never have carried the doctrine of state rights to the point of secession had it not been for the purpose of repelling what was considered an aggression on slavery. Yet in his message there is not a word on this subject, and the reason is not far to seek. Restricting the object of the war to the restoration of the Union, he had with him Democrats and Bell and Everett men as well as Republicans. A mention of slavery would at once have given rise to partisan contentions. At this early day, however, Lincoln understood the scope of the conflict and thus unbosomed himself to the private secretary who was in sympathy with him. For my own part, I consider the central idea pervading this struggle is the necessity that is upon us of proving that popular government is not an absurdity. We must settle this question now whether in a free government the minority have the right to break up the government whenever they choose. If we fail, it will go far to prove the incapability of the people to govern themselves. There may be one consideration used in stay of such final judgment, but that is not for us to use in advance. That is, that there exists in our case an instance of a vast and far-reaching disturbing element which the history of no other free nation will probably ever present. That, however, is not for us to say at present. Taking the government as we found it, we will see if the majority can preserve it. An official report of July 1st gives the strength of the Union Army as 186,000. The newspapers, especially the New York Tribune, had already been clamoring for an advance on Richmond. General Scott was urged not to lose the services of the three months' men whose time would soon expire. Politicians, fearing the effect of delay on public sentiment, supported this demand, and men of experience and good judgment joined in the popular cry. As early as May, Governor Andrew complained of the want of vigor in the northern operations, and Senator Fessenden wrote, I am hoping every day to hear of some decided blow. William H. Russell, basing his opinion on the European standard with which his experience in the Crimea had made him familiar, gave an account of the wretched condition of the Union soldiers in camps near Washington, whose number available for a campaign he estimated at 30,000. I am opposed to national boasting, he wrote, but I do firmly believe that 10,000 British regulars, then apparently thinking he must say something for England's ally, or twelve thousand French with a proper establishment of artillery and cavalry, under competent commanders would not only entirely repulse this army with the greatest ease, but that they could attack them and march into Washington over them or with them whenever they pleased. The popular cry, on to Richmond, was dinned in the President's ears until he yielded to the opinion that the Union Army force a battle in eastern Virginia. A victory would maintain the unanimity of feeling that had prevailed since the firing on Sumter, it would be the earnest of a short war. With a short war in prospect, patriotism would continue at its present high beat, and such dissensions as might issue in an opposition party would not arise. Moreover, the goodwill of Europe would be preserved. Europe was now in sympathy with the President's assertion of the national authority, but it would be well to let her perceive that the United States government to which she sent her envoys had the stronger battalions. Furthermore, if the excellent men who had volunteered for three months were to be used at all in active service, they must soon take the field as their term of enlistment was fast drawing to a close. Having taken all these considerations into account, the President called a number of generals in council with his cabinet. McDowell, a graduate of West Point, a staff officer during the Mexican War, and the present commander of the troops on the Virginia side of the Potomac, said that he would move against Beauregard, who had a force of 21,900 behind the stream called Bull Run, provided that Joseph E. Johnston, who was in the Shenandoah Valley with 9,000, could be prevented from joining Beauregard. General Scott, who felt that the army was in no condition to fight a battle in Virginia, but who had deferred to the President's wish, said, if Johnston joins Beauregard, he shall have Patterson on his heels. Patterson, with 18,000 to 22,000, was depended upon to keep a sharp watch on Johnston, and had been instructed to beat him or detain him in the valley. On the afternoon of July 16, McDowell's Grand Army, about 30,000 strong and composed, for the most part of three months' volunteers supported by 1,600 regulars, marched to the front and on the 18th occupied Centerville. 
no living American general had ever commanded so large a body of men, and McDowell's experience as staff officer in Mexico had been with a much smaller number. Excepting the regulars, the troops were raw as were likewise most of their officers, and this march of twenty-seven miles, which a year later would have been considered a bagatelle, was now a mighty undertaking. There was lack of discipline, wrote William T. Sherman, who commanded a brigade. With all my personal efforts I could not prevent the men from straggling for water, blackberries, or anything on the way they fancied. The troops did not know how to take care of their rations, to make them last the time they should, reported McDowell. Moreover, their excitement found vent in burning and pillaging. These excesses, however, were checked by McDowell. Johnston, having received a telegram from Richmond to join Beauregard if practicable, managed to elude Patterson and started for Bull Run at noon of July 18th. The discouragements of that day's march to one accustomed like myself, he wrote, to the steady gait of regular soldiers is indescribable. Because of frequent and unreasonable delays and lack of discipline, he despaired of reaching Beauregard in time. He accordingly made arrangements for covering the final stage by rail. After a march of twenty-three miles, he and his infantry completed the remaining thirty-four by train. The cavalry and artillery continued on the wagon road. On Saturday the twentieth, he had six thousand in union with Beauregard. McDowell had heard rumors that Johnston had joined Beauregard, but he did not credit them, so he went forward with his original plan, which was to turn the Confederate left. On Sunday morning, July twenty-first, he attacked. Owing to the inexperience of both officers and men, the delays in marching and maneuvering made the attack three hours late, yet at ten o'clock the Union troops engaged the enemy and, being in superior force, drove him before them. The Confederates were in full retreat, but as they ran up the slope of the plateau about the Henry House, Thomas J. Jackson's brigade stood there calmly awaiting the onset. General B. cried out in encouragement to his retreating troops, "'There is Jackson standing like a stone wall!' As Stonewall Jackson, he was known till the day of his death and ever afterwards. Patterson had greatly overestimated Johnston's force and feared to make an attack. Indeed, in his alarm, he marched north, directly away from the Confederates instead of following them. Unaware of his actual movement, the Confederate generals thought that he would make haste to join McDowell. Beauregard, therefore, deemed it advisable to attack the Union forces with his right wing and center before the expected reinforcement came. Johnston, the ranking officer, approved the plan. A miscarriage of orders prevented the movement. At the same time, McDowell's attack came as a surprise, and it was the sound of a cannon that first told them he was trying to turn left. It was four miles to the scene of action, but Johnston and Beauregard rode thither as fast as their horses would carry them. We came not a moment too soon, said Johnston. The Confederates were demoralized. A disorderly retreat had begun and it needed all the firmness and courage of the commanding generals to stem the tide. Beauregard remained in the thick of the fight, in command of the troops there engaged, while Johnston rode regretfully to the rear to hurry forward reinforcements. It was high noon when the two Confederate generals appeared on the field. The battle lasted until three. The hottest fighting was for the possession of the Henry Plateau, which the Union troops had seized. At two o'clock, Beauregard gave the order to advance to recover the plateau. The charge was made with spirit. Jackson's brigade pierced the Union center at the bayonet's point. The other troops moved forward with equal vigor, broke the Union lines, and swept them back from the open ground of the plateau. The Union troops rallied, recovered their ground, and drove the Confederates from the plateau into the woods beyond. McDowell, who had this part of the field immediately under his own eye, thought this last repulse final and that the day was his. Jefferson Davis, too anxious to remain in Richmond, went by rail to the scene of action. As he approached Manassas Railroad Junction, he saw a cloud of dust raised by wagons that had been sent to the rear and heard distinctly the sound of firing. At the junction were a large number of men who had left the field in panic and who now gave Davis graphic accounts of the defeat of the army. He asked a grey-bearded man whose calm face and composed demeanor inspired confidence how the battle had gone. "'Our line was broken,' came the reply. "'All was confusion. The army routed and the battle lost.' 
the conductor of the train refused to go farther but on davis's stern insistence detached the locomotive and ran it to the headquarters where davis found horses for himself and his aide two officers guided him thence toward the battlefield on the way he met a large number of stragglers and received frequent warnings that there was danger ahead but the sound of firing was now fainter which seemed to indicate both an advance of the confederates and a waning of the battle meeting johnston on a hill overlooking the field he might in his question have used the words of henry v at agincourt i know not if the day be ours or no when johnston at once assured him that we had won the battle it was three o'clock when mcdowell saw the confederates retire to the woods when he hoped that the fight was over and that his army had gained possession of the field this hope was rudely dispelled his men had made their last desperate effort they had been up since two in the morning one division had had a long fatiguing march the day was intensely hot and the fight had lasted four and a half hours many of the men had thrown away their haversacks and canteens they were choked with dust thirsty hungry and spent beauregard ordered forward all of his force within reach including the reserve for the purpose of making a last supreme effort to regain the plateau he intended to lead the charge in person then loud cheers were heard proceeding from fresh troops they were the remainder of the army of the shenandoah who had followed johnston as quickly as the railroad could bring them and who were now personally ordered by him to assail mcdowell's right flank from mouth to mouth went the word johnston's army has come at the same time beauregard moved forward his whole line the union troops were instantly seized with one of those unaccountable panics to which great armies are liable they broke and ran down the hillside in disorder mcdowell and his officers tried to rally them but the regular infantry alone obeyed commands covering the volunteers retreat they crossed the fords of bull run and crowded the warrenton turnpike a confused mass of disorganized frightened men the confederates pursued them only a short distance and mcdowell intended to make a stand at centreville that was found to be impossible nor could the disorderly flight be arrested at fairfax courthouse the larger part of the men telegraphed mcdowell from there are a confused mob entirely demoralized they are pouring through this place in a state of utter disorganization the flight of the troops was not stopped until they reached the fortifications on the southern side of the potomac and many of the soldiers crossed the long bridge into washington all were soon to learn that they had been fleeing before an imaginary foe as the confederates made no effective pursuit lincoln in washington was a prey to the same anxiety as davis in richmond after his return from church he scanned eagerly the telegram sent to him from the war department and from the army headquarters these dispatches were from the telegraphic station nearest the battlefield and toward three o'clock became more frequent and reported the apparent course and progress of the cannonade impatient as he was to talk over the news he repaired to scott's office where he found the aged and infirm general taking his afternoon sleep on being waked scott told him that such reports as had already been received possessed no value but expressing his confidence in a successful result he composed himself for another nap dispatches continued to come with cheering news it was reported that the confederates had been forced back two or three miles one of the scots aides brought to the president a dispatch from a lieutenant of engineers at centreville saying that mcdowell had driven the enemy before him ordered the reserve forward and desired reinforcements without delay as scott deemed the report credible the president thinking all doubt at an end ordered his carriage for his usual evening drive at six o'clock secretary seward appeared at the white house pale and haggard where is the president he asked hoarsely of lincoln's private secretaries gone to drive they answered have you any late news he continued they read him the telegrams announcing victory tell no one said he that is not true the battle is lost mcdowell is in full retreat and calls on general scott to save the capital returning from his drive a half hour later the president heard seward's message walked over to army headquarters and there read the dispatch from a captain of engineers general mcdowell's army in full retreat through centreville the day is lost save washington and the remnants of this army the routed troops will not reform the president did not go to his bed that night morning found him still on his lounge in the executive office 
listening to the recitals of newspaper correspondents and other civilians who had followed McDowell to Centerville and, after the repulse, fearing for their own safety, had rushed back to Washington beginning to arrive at midnight. Monday broke dismally in the capital, a drizzling rain adding to the gloom. But by noon it was known that the Confederates had not pursued the retreating troops in the aim of taking Washington. The disaster caused some prominent men to lose their nerve. Not so the President. Bitterly disappointed as he was at the result, he from the first showed no discouragement or loss of control. During the week he paid visits to the camps surrounding Washington, and in one of these had William T. Sherman for his guide. Sherman, standing by the roadside, was recognized by Lincoln and Seward, who rode side by side in an open hack, and on his inquiring if they were going to his camps, he received from Lincoln the reply, "'Yes, we heard that you had got over the big scare, and we thought we would come over and see the boys.' The President asked Sherman to get into their carriage and direct their course. Sherman perceived his emotion and his desire to speak to the men, so he ventured to utter a word of caution. "'Please discourage,' he said, "'all cheering, noise, or any sort of confusion. We had enough of it before Bull Run to ruin any set of men. What we need is cool, thoughtful, hard-fighting soldiers. No more hurrahing, no more humbug.' The commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy of the United States took the advice of his colonel in good part, and on reaching the first camp, stood up in his carriage and made, as Sherman characterized it, one of the neatest, best, and most feeling addresses I ever listened to, referring to our late disaster at Bull Run, the high duties that still devolved on us, and the brighter days yet to come. At one or two points the soldiers began to cheer, but he checked them with, "'Don't cheer, boys!' I confess I rather like it myself, but Colonel Sherman here says it is not military, and I guess we had better defer to his opinion. As he went the rounds, he made the same speech to other soldiers. The effect of his visit was good, and proved an earnest of the hold he was soon to acquire on the army. Sherman thought Bull Run a well-planned battle, but badly fought, and Johnston agreed with him. If the tactics of the Federals had been equal to their strategy, wrote Johnston, we should have been beaten. Ropes, on the other hand, believed McDowell's tactics better than his strategy. The difference of opinion does not concern the layman, to whom the Battle of Bull Run appears as the encounter of two armed mobs in an open field, fighting with the utmost courage to solve a question that had baffled the wisdom of their statesmen. A spectator watching Henry House Hill would have seen many of the Union companies and regiments clad in the brilliant militia uniforms which they were accustomed to wear in Fourth of July processions. The showy zouave dress with fez or turban and red or yellow baggy trousers was affected by many. These uniforms, as contrasted with the sober United States blue of after battles, are strikingly emblematic of the difference between a holiday parade responding to the call on to Richmond and the stern purpose of subduing a United South. At Bull Run, the rank and file of both armies heard for the first time in their lives the sound of cannon and muskets in hostile combat, saw cannonballs crashing through trees and saplings above and around them striking down their friends and brothers, saw a blood-stained field strewed with dead men and horses, and fighting blood was there even though fighting craft were yet to be acquired. The numbers of the dead and wounded show hard fighting. Apart from the newspapers, there seems to have been little boasting in the South. The men in authority did not for a moment believe that the North would give up the contest. On the contrary, they felt that a long and hard struggle was before them. For a while bitter discouragement prevailed at the North, and the blow was the harder to bear inasmuch as England, from whom sympathy was ardently desired, now regarded the dissolution of the Union as an accomplished fact. Friends of the South saw in this victory a promise of her eventual triumph, and to help forward her cause endeavored to cloud the issue. "'It is surprising,' wrote Charles Francis Adams, our minister to Great Britain, in a private letter from London, "'to see the efforts made here to create the belief that our struggle has nothing to do with slavery, but that it is all about a tariff. I cannot conceal from myself the fact that as a whole the English are pleased with our misfortunes.' Fifty-two years after the struggle, this feeling may be accounted for by the remark of Rochefoucauld. The misfortunes of our best friends are not entirely displeasing to us. But such an attitude during the war on the part of the kin across the sea was felt bitterly by men who were risking life and fortune in what they deemed a sacred cause. End of chapter 1
Two, Part One. On the day after the Battle of Bull Run, Congress met at the usual hour and transacted the usual amount of business. Outwardly, at least, the members were calm. The House, with only four dissenting votes, adopted a resolution of Crittenden's introduced two days previously, which gave expression to the common sentiment of the country regarding the object of the war. This resolution declared that the war was not waged for conquest or subjugation or in order to overthrow or interfere with the rights or established institutions of the southern states, but to maintain the supremacy of the Constitution and to preserve the Union. Three days later it passed the Senate by a vote of thirty to five. Congress had convened July 4th, and, in response to the President's request for means to make the war short and decisive, had authorized him to accept the services of 500,000 volunteers for three years unless sooner discharged, and had empowered the Secretary of the Treasury to borrow on the credit of the United States $250 million. Although failing to use its power of taxation as effectively as the occasion required, Congress, nevertheless, did something in that direction, increasing some of the tariff duties, imposing a direct tax of twenty millions on the states and territories, and an income tax of three percent subject to an exemption of eight hundred dollars. Congress showed great confidence in the President and went far toward meeting his wishes. As one of its members afterwards wrote, it was during this session only, a giant committee of ways and means. But it hesitated in regard to two of his dictatorial acts. The call for three years' volunteers and the increase of the regular army and navy by proclamation, and his order to Scott, the commanding general of the army, authorizing him personally or by deputy to suspend, if necessary for the public safety, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus at any point on any military line between Philadelphia and Washington. A rider to the bill, raising the pay of private soldiers passed on the last day of the session, August 6th, legalized the proclamation increasing the army and navy. But senators differed so widely as to the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus that they were unable to agree upon any action. Some senators thought that an act of Congress was necessary to suspend the writ, and in this belief were sustained by a decision of Chief Justice Marshall, the opinions of Story and Tansy and English precedents for two centuries. Others, agreeing that the Constitution vested this power in Congress alone, were nevertheless willing to make legal and valid the President's orders for the suspension of the writ. Still other senators did not care to take any action whatever, believing that the President, as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, had complete power to suspend the habeas corpus, they did not wish to bring this power in question by an act of confirmation. Encouraged by the attitude of the President and Congress, the country soon recovered from the dismay caused by the defeat at Bull Run. A second uprising took place. Men came forward in great numbers enlisting for three years. On account of some successes in western Virginia, McClellan was placed in command of the troops at Washington, July 27, which he soon named the Army of the Potomac. Lincoln and Davis were both willing to obscure the true reason of the conflict. Lincoln, because he did not wish the border slave states, the Northern Democrats and conservative Republicans, to get the idea that the war was waged for the destruction of slavery. Davis, because he knew that the Southerners' devotion to slavery, if allowed to appear in too strong a light, would stand in the way of the recognition of the Confederate states by European powers which he so ardently desired. But as the Union armies advanced southward, they came into contact with the Negro who had to be dealt with. On the day after Virginia had ratified by popular vote her ordinance of secession, three Negroes who had come to Fort Monroe were claimed by an agent of their owner. General Butler, who was in command, refused to deliver them up on the ground that, as they belonged to a citizen of a state offering resistance to the federal government and had been employed in the construction of a battery, they were contraband of war. The application of this phrase, as Butler himself admitted, had no high legal sanction. Nevertheless, technical inaccuracy, as Morse wrote, does not hurt the force of an epigram which expresses a sound principle. This one was promptly seized upon by the popular mind as indicating a proper attitude toward the Negro. The difficulty, however, could not be solved by an epigram. Contrabands or fugitive slaves came continually within the lines of the Union armies, and the question how to dispose of them became a grave one for the President. Having carefully thought out a policy, he sent the following instructions to Butler to serve as a guide for his and other commands. The general should not interfere with the reclamation of fugitive slaves who had escaped from masters in the Union slave states, 
but, in accordance with the Confiscation Act, he should respect no claim for Negroes who had been employed in the military service of the Confederacy. In spite of the murmurs of the abolitionists and some radical Republicans, a large majority of the Northern people had already acquiesced in this policy as a wise temporary expedient when General Fremont opened the question afresh by his proclamation in Missouri. Fremont, the pet and protégé of the Blairs, as Lincoln afterwards called him, had upon the earnest solicitation of his patrons been made a major general and been placed in command of the Western Department, which included Missouri. A kind of romantic hero was he, the brave pathfinder, who had planted the American flag on presumably the highest peak of the Rocky Mountains. Winning the first nomination of the Republican Party for president, he had polled a large electoral and popular vote and lincoln undoubtedly impressed by the remembrance of his first campaign so brilliant in many ways thought well of him and had entertained the idea of nominating him for minister to france he was supposed to have military talent and his appointment to a command was very popular with earnest republicans who had looked upon him five years earlier as the champion of a sacred cause lincoln and the blairs were to suffer a grievous disappointment the first month in his headquarters at st louis showed fremont to be utterly unfit for a responsible command over fond of display and wishing to maintain the state of a european monarch he surrounded himself with dishonest men to whom he was always accessible whilst high military and civil officers and worthy union citizens were obliged to wait days in his ante-room for an interview the reason was apparent these last had the sole purpose in mind to defeat the southern sympathizers and the confederate army who were disputing with them the possession of missouri but the others were interested in securing fat contracts the kind of suit for which fremont had a ready ear and he was deaf to the entreaties of well-informed union citizens for an order to reinforce a capable general who was actively engaged in the field distrusted by men of worth and influence in missouri flattered by speculators it is little wonder that the charge was made that the department of missouri was managed for the purpose of making private fortunes rather than for the country's weal such was the posture of affairs on the evening of august twenty nine when fremont went to bed with an undoubted perception of the strength of anti-slavery sentiment in the north and the need of some diversion to maintain his sway inspiration must have come to him in the night at all events he decided upon a proclamation freeing the slaves Next day he issued it, declaring the slaves of all persons in the state of Missouri, taking up arms against the United States, free men. That it was a play to retain his power was evident to hard-headed men. The truth is, wrote Montgomery Blair to Sumner, with Fremont's surroundings, the set of scoundrels who alone have control of him, this proclamation setting up the higher law was like a painted woman quoting scripture. Lincoln learned through the newspapers of Fremont's proclamation and of his Bureau of Abolition, set up for the purpose of issuing deeds of manumission to slaves. Although this major general of two months standing without careful survey of the whole field, without comprehension of the important and various interests involved, had, on a sudden impulse, assumed to solve a question which the President, his Cabinet, and Congress were approaching only in a careful and tentative manner, Lincoln's letter to Fremont of September 2nd, sent by a special messenger, was full of kindness and of wisdom. The liberating slaves of traitorous owners, he wrote, will alarm our Southern Union friends and turn them against us. Perhaps ruin our rather fair prospect for Kentucky. Allow me, therefore, to ask that you will, as of your own motion, modify that paragraph so as to conform to the Confiscation Act of Congress. This letter is written in a spirit of caution and not of censure. Fremont was unwilling to retract the provision objected to and asked that the President should openly direct him to make the correction. This Lincoln cheerfully did by public order. Fremont's proclamation stirred the anti-slavery sentiment of the country to its utmost depths, receiving enthusiastic commendation from many states. Senator Sumner wrote, Our President is now dictator, imperator, which you will but how vain to have the power of a god and not use it godlike a large number of men in ohio were furious and found fit expression in the words of an eminent lawyer and judge our people are in a state of great consternation and wrath on account of the quarrel between fremont and the administration public opinion being entirely with general fremont and if the election were next fall to displace him would be to make him president Herndon, the old law partner and later biographer of Lincoln, living in Illinois, said, 
Fremont's proclamation was right. Lincoln's modification of it was wrong. Senator Grimes wrote from Iowa, The people are all with Fremont and will uphold him, through thick and thin. Everybody of every sect, party, sex, and color approves his proclamation in the Northwest, and it will not do for the administration to causelessly tamper with the man who had the sublime moral courage to issue it. These expressions in private letters represented a phase of intelligent sentiment which troubled Lincoln, as is evident from his confidential letter to Senator Browning of Illinois, who, though regarded as a conservative, had approved Fremont's proclamation. It endangers the loss of Kentucky, he wrote, September 22nd. I think to lose Kentucky is nearly the same as to lose the whole game. Kentucky gone, we cannot hold Missouri, nor as I think Maryland. These all against us, and the job on our hands is too large for us. We would as well consent to separation at once, including the surrender of this capital. Lincoln had such a hold upon the people that he carried with him an efficient public opinion, and after due waiting proceeded to the next step. He never had any thought of removing Fremont on account of his proclamation but he felt that the mismanagement and corruption in Missouri must be corrected. Proceeding with caution, he sent to St. Louis Montgomery Blair and Meggs, the quartermaster general of the army, and later Secretary Cameron and Adjutant General Thomas. The four made a thorough and candid investigation. Meggs heard a rumor that Fremont had in mind a project resembling the conspiracy of Aaron Burr's. Somewhat more than two years later, Lincoln, in an expansive mood, unbosomed himself to his private secretaries and two other friends, saying, Mrs. Fremont, who had brought a letter from the general justifying his proclamation, sought an audience with me at midnight and taxed me so violently with many things that I had to exercise all the awkward tact I have to avoid quarreling with her. She more than once intimated that if General Fremont should conclude to try conclusions with me, he could set up for himself. To this, the minister of the United States to Prussia, an old Illinois friend of Lincoln's, replied, It is pretty clearly proven that Fremont had at that time concluded that the Union was definitely destroyed, and that he should set up an independent government as soon as he took Memphis and organized his army. That Lincoln felt there was some basis for this report is indicated by a paper which Nicolay left in a sealed envelope endorsed, A Private Paper, Conversation with the President, October 2, 1861 in which one of the headings is, Fremont Ready to Rebel. Nevertheless, it is hardly probable that Lincoln was disturbed enough by the report to let it have the slightest weight in his action. It was more to the point that Montgomery Blair had recommended Fremont's removal for inefficiency, and that Cameron's and Thomas's conclusions had made it imperative. These two reported that Fremont was incompetent and unfit for his extensive and important command, and that he had, around him in his staff, persons directly and indirectly concerned in furnishing supplies. On October 24th, the President issued the order for his removal. Before the removal was effected, E. B. Washburn, an intimate friend of Lincoln's who was at the head of the House Subcommittee on Government Contracts, that spent two weeks in St. Louis, taking a large amount of testimony relative to the procedure of Fremont and his friends, wrote to Chase, such robbery, fraud, extravagance, peculation as have been developed in Fremont's department can hardly be conceived of there has been an organized system of pillage right under his eye. He has really set up an authority over the government and bids defiance to its commands. The government, in failing to strike at Fremont and his horde of pirates, acknowledges itself a failure. Lincoln must have seen this letter, and if further justification for Fremont's removal were necessary, this was ample. While the people of the country could not know of these confidential letters and reports, enough was known for Lincoln's action to receive effective support. But a large minority looked upon Fremont as a martyr in the anti-slavery cause. Here are two out of the many instances of worthy people who were led astray by a charlatan because he knew how to play upon the one idea dearest to their hearts. Henry Ward Beecher said in his church, I cannot but express my solemn conviction that both our government and in a greater degree the community have done great injustice to the cause in Missouri in the treatment which has been bestowed upon that nobleman General Fremont. Is it known to the administration that the West is threatened with a revolution? Asked in a private letter Richard Smith, the editor of the Cincinnati Gazette, a very important and influential Republican journal. What meaneth this burning of the President in effigy by citizens who have hitherto sincerely and enthusiastically supported the war? Why this sudden check to enlistments? 
the public consider that Fremont has been made a martyr of. Consequently, he is now, so far as the West is concerned, the most popular man in the country. He is to the West what Napoleon was to France, while the President has lost the confidence of the people. Meanwhile, McClellan was at work with energy and talent, erecting fortifications around Washington and organizing the Army of the Potomac. He had good executive ability and aptitude for system, and being in robust health, an immense capacity for work. All these qualities were devoted without stint to the service. In the saddle from morning to night he visited the several camps, mixed with the different brigades and regiments, and came to know his officers and men thoroughly. Himself a gentleman of sterling moral character, having come to Washington with the respect and admiration of these soldiers, he soon gained their love by his winning personality, and inspired a devotion such as no other northern general of a large army with one exception was ever able to obtain. Overrating his successes in western Virginia, he was called the Young Napoleon, for he was believed by the army, the administration, and the country to have military genius of the highest order. And at first he seemed to have an adequate idea of what was required of him, for he wrote to the President on August 4th, The military action of the government should be prompt and irresistible. The rebels have chosen Virginia as their battlefield, and it seems proper for us to make the first great struggle there. Not only was McClellan working with diligence, but everyone else was cooperating with him in a way to give his talent for organization the widest scope. The President, the Treasury, and the War Departments, the Secretary of State, the Governors of the Northern States assisted him faithfully with their full powers. The officers under him displayed zeal and devotion. He had the sway of a monarch. And at the outset, this complete harmony yielded results of a most encouraging nature. Troops poured in from the enthusiastic North, swelling the army of 52,000 of July 27th to one of 168,000 three months later. One of McClellan's limitations, however, came early into view. Although personally courageous, he feared reverses for his army. Moreover, either his intelligence of the enemy was defective, or his inferences from such accurate information as he possessed were radically unsound. In August he was haunted by the notion that the Confederates largely outnumbered him, that they would attack his position on the Virginia side of the Potomac, and also cross the river north of Washington. At this time, however, Johnston did not purpose either movement. He was chafing at the smallness of his force, the lack of food and ammunition, the disorganization and sickness amongst his troops. During the month of September and well into October, he was encamped about Fairfax Courthouse with strong outposts on hills six and a half miles from Washington, where the Confederate flag could be plainly seen by the President and his general. On October 19, he withdrew his army to Centerville and Manassas Junction, farther from Washington but a much stronger position. The great object to be accomplished, wrote McClellan to the Secretary of War shortly after October 27, is the crushing defeat of the rebel army now at Manassas. The Union troops were sufficient in number and fighting quality to accomplish it. All the authorities agree that McClellan's organization of the Army of the Potomac was little short of magical. The training to fit men for active service generally required six months. Under McClellan it had been accomplished in three. The change from the Grand Army before the Battle of Bull Run to McClellan's Army of the Potomac, according to William H. Russell, was marvelous. The soldiers of July, who in his opinion could have been overcome by one-third their number of British regulars, were in September perhaps as fine a body of men in all respects of physique as had ever been assembled by any power in the world. When McClellan and McDowell rode together from camp to camp on the south side of the Potomac, McClellan used to point toward Manassas and say, We shall strike them there. What might have been is doubtless as unprofitable a subject of speculation in war as in the other affairs of life. But it is a fact of importance that during the autumn the President and the country rightly began to lose confidence in McClellan's military ability. They had good reason for this distrust. His apology in his report of August 4, 1863, and in his own story, receive little justification from the pitiless contemporary record and from other facts since brought to light. On October 27, according to his own account, his effective force was 134,000, the number disposable for an advance, 76,000, Johnson had 41,000. 
The Union artillery was superior, the infantry had better arms. The health of the Union army was good, that of the Confederate bad. The weather was fine and dry. Up to Christmas the roads were in suitable condition for military operations. On the other hand, the Confederates had an immense advantage in the moral effect of their victories at Bull Run and Ball's Bluff. Nevertheless, the officers and men of the Army of the Potomac were devoted to McClellan and eager to fight. They would have been glad to follow if he would lead. It only remained for him to give the word. The Confederate were little, if any, better disciplined than the Union soldiers, but their cautious general was willing to take the offensive. Give me nineteen thousand more men as good as the forty-one thousand that I have with the necessary transportation and munitions of war said Johnston to President Davis on October 1st, and I will cross the Potomac and carry the war into the enemy's country. At that time he knew that the Union force was superior in number. When McClellan wrote as military critic, he condemned by implication his own inactivity as commander. I am induced to believe, he wrote to General Scott from Washington on August 8, that the enemy has at least one hundred thousand men in front of us. Were I in Beauregard's place, with that force at my disposal, I would attack the positions on the other side of the Potomac, and at the same time cross the river above this city in force. Yet McClellan himself, with at least seventy-six thousand to forty-one thousand of the enemy, would not make in November a movement similar to, but not so extended as, the one he laid down for the Confederates in August. I am not such a fool, he said to the President, as to buck against Manassas in the spot designated by the foe. To judge from McClellan's private letters at this time, he seemed to think that the men in authority were endeavoring to add difficulties to his task. I am thwarted and deceived by these incapables at every turn, he wrote. As a matter of fact, everybody, from the president to the humblest orderly who waited at his door, was helping him according to his means. The fault was not of the president, the cabinet, General Scott, or the senators. It was entirely his own. McClellan fed himself upon the delusion that the enemy had 150,000 men. This estimate would indeed have justified his inaction, but after an evening's conversation with him it became painfully evident, to John Hay, that he had no plan. The President's attitude towards his general was sublime. They talked sadly over the disaster at Ball's Bluff. Alluding to the death of Colonel Baker, McClellan said, there is many a good fellow who wears the shoulder straps going under the sod before this thing is over. There is no loss too great to be repaired. If I should get knocked on the head, Mr. President, you will put another man immediately in my shoes. I want you to take care of yourself, was the reply. On the evening of October 26, the Jacobin Club, represented by Senators Trumbull, Chandler, and Wade, came up to worry the administration into a battle. The agitation of this summer is to be renewed wrote Hay. The President defended McClellan's deliberateness. On going over to the General's headquarters, the Jacobins were discussed. The President deprecated this new manifestation of popular impatience, but said it was a reality and should be taken into the account. At the same time, General, you must not fight till you are ready. I have everything at stake, replied McClellan. If I fail, I will not see you again or anybody. I have a notion to go out with you, said Lincoln and stand or fall with the battle. On October 31, Scott voluntarily retired from active service, and McClellan succeeded him in the command of all the armies of the United States. Next evening at his headquarters, he read to Lincoln and Hay his general order in regard to Scott's resignation and his own assumption of command. The President said, I should be perfectly satisfied if I thought that this vast increase of responsibility would not embarrass you. It is a great relief, sir replied McClellan, between whom and Scott there had been friction. I feel as if several tons were taken from my shoulders today. I am now in contact with you and the secretary. I am not embarrassed by intervention. Well, rejoined Lincoln, draw on me for all the sense I have and all the information. In addition to your present command, the supreme command of the army will entail a vast labor upon you. I can do it all, said McClellan quietly. The country had a right to expect an offensive movement. Inasmuch as McClellan was apt to underestimate the number as well as the fighting quality of his soldiers, his seventy-six thousand disposable for an advance could likely enough have been increased to one hundred thousand. 
He ought to have fought Johnston, or maneuvered him out of Manassas, or raised the Confederate blockade of the Lower Potomac, or taken Norfolk. Any one of these movements attempted in the autumn of 1861 would have satisfied the country and maintained their confidence as well as the President's in McClellan, and this would have been an asset of great value. But he was no fighter and at this time could not have handled 100,000 men. It is doubtful if any other general in the Union Army could have done so. Long after the war, Grant referred to the vast and cruel responsibility, devolving upon McClellan at the outset, and added, if McClellan had gone into the war as Sherman, Thomas, or Meade, had fought his way along and up, I have no reason to suppose that he could not have won as high a distinction as any of us. In McClellan's army was Colonel William T. Sherman, who in 1864 led an army of 100,000 with great ability, but at this time he told the President that his extreme desire was to serve in a subordinate capacity, and in no event to be left in a superior command. To march, maneuver, feed and fight to the best advantage an army of one hundred thousand comes near being the highest executive achievement of which man is capable joseph e johnston quiet and sad thought that he could now conduct sixty thousand in an offensive campaign but he had had the invaluable experience of commanding half that number at bull run if mcclellan had shown modesty so striking a characteristic of lincoln and grant criticism would be tempered but he was one of the men who cannot stand prosperity rapid advancement had swelled him with conceit one manifestation of this was discourtesy to the president of whom he once wrote in a patronizing way he is honest and means well on the evening of november thirteenth the president secretary seward and john hay called at mcclellan's house and were told by the servant at the door that the general was at an officer's wedding and would soon return we went in as hay recorded the incident in his diary and after we had waited about an hour mcclellan came in and without paying any particular attention to the porter who told him the president was waiting to see him went upstairs passing the door of the room where the president and secretary of state were seated they waited about half an hour and sent once more a servant to tell the general they were there and the answer came that he had gone to bed i merely record this unparalleled insolence of epaulettes without comment continued hay it is the first indication i have yet seen of the threatened supremacy of the military authorities coming home i spoke to the president about the matter but he seemed not to have noticed it specially saying it was better at this time not to be making points of etiquette and personal dignity on another occasion when the general failed to keep an appointment with the president he said never mind i will hold mcclellan's horse if he will only bring us success in december mcclellan fell ill with typhoid fever the president the army of the potomac the country waited on his recovery to great britain it seemed that as a question merely of fact a war existed between the north and south which must be officially recognized davis had invited applications for letters of mark and lincoln had proclaimed a blockade both acts being permissible only in war seemed to indicate that the conflict would extend to the ocean where it would concern all maritime nations as a matter of course great britain issued a proclamation of neutrality may thirteenth but this natural step was by no means acceptable to the north since the proclamation by its terms recognized the confederate states as a belligerent power the theory of the united states government that the southerners were rebels against their authority was undermined as soon as these rebels became belligerents in the eyes of europe the censure of this declaration by seward and by adams was therefore in conformity with diplomatic usage nor was the sentiment of boston as reported by motley surprising the declaration of lord john russell he wrote that the southern privateers were to be considered belligerents was received with great indignation by the most warm-hearted england-loving men in this england-loving part of the country in other sections of the north where england was less liked the feeling of resentment was still more acute and the sum of this dissatisfaction may have served a useful purpose in helping to prevent great britain from acknowledging the southern confederacy in the following year nevertheless a calm survey of the facts can hardly lead to any conclusion but that great britain was abundantly justified for her recognition of the belligerent rights of the confederate states the cogent argument for it was put in a nutshell by the foreign secretary who issued the proclamation upwards of five million free men wrote lord russell in a private letter to edward everett have been for some time in open revolt against the president and congress of the united states 
it is not our practice to treat five millions of free men as pirates and to hang their sailors if they attempt to stop our merchantmen. But unless we meant to treat them as pirates and to hang them, we could not deny them belligerent rights. The concession of belligerent rights to the Confederate States was made with no unfriendly purpose, and as repeated assurances to that effect were received from both public and private sources in England, and as a proper comprehension was gained of the wide difference between the recognition of the belligerency and acknowledgment of the independence of the Confederate States, the irritation of the North began to subside. The President showed his understanding of the attitude of England and other European powers, and believed that his government had their sympathy. The feeling toward the United States, wrote Adams from London on May 31, is improving in the higher circles here. It was never otherwise than favorable among the people at large. The division of English sentiment was well expressed by Palmerston, the Prime Minister, in his words. We do not like slavery, but we want cotton, and we dislike very much your moral tariff. Punch declared sympathy with the North, but confessed that with the South we've stronger ties which are composed of cotton, and where would be our calico without the toil of niggers? Then the North keeps commerce bound. Thus we perceive a divided duty. We must choose between free trade or sable brothers free. But, so Adams wrote, our brethren in this country, after all, are much disposed to fall in with the opinion of Voltaire that Dieu est toujours sur le côté des gros canons. End of chapter 2, part 1 2, part 2 For our standing in England, it was unfortunate that we did not win the Battle of Bull Run, as our defeat caused a marked revulsion of feeling. The aristocracy and upper middle class made no secret of their belief that the bubble of democracy had burst in America. By the autumn of 1861, the commercial and manufacturing people began to realize the disaster with which they were menaced by our cutting off the supply of cotton. Ordinarily, the new crop came forward during the early autumn. Now, practically none was being received. Stocks of cotton were rapidly sinking. A manufacturer, said the London Times, which supports a fifth part of our whole population, is coming gradually to a stand. Mills were working short time. Manufacturers were reducing wages. Mill owners and laborers were dismayed at the prospect of a cotton famine. The blockade stood between them and a supply of cotton, threatening the owners with business derangement and the workmen with starvation. The self-interest of the manufacturers and the sentimental predilections of the aristocracy were forces which, sometimes merging, sometimes reacting on one another, gave rise to a desire amongst these classes that the North should fail. It seemed more favorable to England's power and trade that the United States should be divided into two nations, especially as the Southern Confederacy would offer England practically free trade, hence a large market for her manufactured goods that would be paid for in raw cotton. The wish was father to the thought, and the inference to be drawn from Bull Run settled the matter. The nobility and upper middle class came to the conclusion that the North could not conquer the South and that separation would be the result. This opinion was advocated by the Times and Saturday Review with a power of sarcastic statement that stung their northern readers to the quick. "'Help us to a breath of generous strengthening sympathy from old England,' was Sumner's appeal to William H. Russell. "'Do not forget, I pray you,' was Russell's reply, "'that in reality it is rightism and republicanism at home, which the conservative papers mean to smite. America is the shield under which the blow is dealt.' The exponents of the ten-pounders, who, in their smug complacency, believed their constitution and government to be not only the best on earth, but the best that had ever existed, criticized the North freely in a tone of flippant and contemptuous serenity, highly irritating to a people engaged in a life-and-death struggle. The sneers at the panic and cowardice of northern troops at Bull Run, as the common measure of a people fighting their countrymen to suppress their desire for independence, were hard to bear. Edward Dicey, when in America, argued with James Russell Lowell about what seemed to him an unreasonable animosity toward England. It is possible, Lowell replied, that my feelings may be morbidly exaggerated, but, pointing to a portrait of a handsome young man, a near and dear relative, a captain of the 20th Massachusetts, who was shot dead at Ball's Bluff, he asked, How would you like yourself to read constantly that that lad died in a miserable cause, and as an American officer should be called a coward? 
Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote to Dicey, I have a stake in this contest which makes me nervous and tremulous and impatient of contradiction. I have a noble boy, a captain in one of our regiments, which has been fearfully decimated by battle and disease, and himself twice wounded within a hair's breadth of his life. Still another drift of sentiment must not be ignored. The sympathy of the British government and public with Italy during the war of 1859, and the progress made in that war towards Italian liberty, impressed upon the English mind the doctrine that a body of people who should seek to throw off an obnoxious dominion and form an orderly government of their own deserved the best wishes of the civilized world. Why, it was asked in England, if we were right to sympathize with Italy against Austria, should we not likewise sympathize with the southern confederacy whose people were resisting the subjugation of the north? This argument swayed the judgment of the liberal-minded Grote, and colored other opinion which was really determined by considerations of rank or of commerce and manufactures. But there were English statesmen and writers of ability who understood that the fight of the north was against slavery. They urged her cause without ceasing, although many times their hearts failed them as they feared she had undertaken an impossible task. They had as their followers the working men whom hunger stared in the face, but who realized, as did the upper class, that the cause of the Union was the cause of democracy in England. Up to the latter part of November Great Britain preserved a strict neutrality. Louis Napoleon, the Emperor of the French, though in his American policy he did not represent the intelligent and liberal sentiment of his country, asked England officially to cooperate with him in recognizing the Confederacy and breaking the blockade. Earl Russell, in a letter to Palmerston, took the ground that it would not do for England and France to break a blockade for the sake of getting cotton, but they might offer their mediation between the North and the South with the implied understanding that the section which refused it, the United States, of course, as the South would grasp eagerly at the offer, would be their enemy. Palmerston replied that, Our best and true policy seems to be to go on as we have begun and to keep quite clear of the conflict between North and South. Later, Lord Palmerston, in his speech at the Lord Mayor's dinner, gave it clearly to be understood that there is to be no interference for the sake of cotton. But meanwhile, the American press, apparently with no feeling of responsibility, was carrying on a duel with the English. The irritation caused by the ungenerous criticism of the London journals was vented by our own in bitter recrimination. Chief in attack was the New York Herald. Let England and Spain look well to their conduct, it said, or we may bring them to a reckoning. It is unfortunate, wrote John Bright to Sumner on November 20th, that nothing is done to change the reckless tone of your New York Herald. Between it and the Times of London there is great mischief done in both countries. In spite of this skirmish of journalists, the two governments were approaching diplomatically a good understanding when a rash, ambitious, self-conceited, and self-willed naval captain not only undid in an hour all the advantage Adams, Seward, and Lincoln had gained in six months, but brought the two countries to the brink of war. James M. Mason and John Slidell, commissioners from the Confederate States to Great Britain and France, left Charleston on a little Confederate steamer, and evading the blockade, reached a Cuban port, whence they proceeded to Havana and took the British mail packet Trent for St. Thomas, where direct connection could be made with a British steamer for Southampton. On November 8, next day after leaving Havana, the Trent was sighted in the Bahama Channel by the American man-of-war San Jacinto under the command of Captain Wilkes. He fired a shot across her bow without result and then a shell. This brought her to. He ordered a lieutenant, accompanied by other officers and a number of marines, to board and search the Trent, and, if Mason and Slidell were found, to make them prisoners. The British captain opposed anything like a search of his vessel, nor would he consent to show papers or passenger list. But Slidell and Mason announced themselves, were seized, and despite their protest as well as those of the captain of the Trent and of a commander of the Royal Navy in charge of the mails, were taken by force from the Trent to the San Jacinto. On November 15th, Wilkes arrived at Fort Monroe. Next day the country had the news. Rejoicing over the seizure as if a great battle had been won, the northern people completely lost their heads. Having yearned for a victory, they now held in their hands the two southern men whom, next to Davis and Floyd, they hated the worst, and they had struck a blow at Great Britain for her supposed sympathy with the South. All the members of the cabinet except Montgomery Blair were elated at the seizure. 
the secretary of war read aloud the telegram announcing it to the group of men in his office and led the cheers in which governor andrew and the rest heartily joined andrew who thought that in comparison with mason and slidell benedict arnold was a saint said at a dinner in boston in honor of the captain that wilkes had shown wise judgment in the act which was one of the most illustrious services that had made the war memorable we are met to-night he added to congratulate a gallant officer who to uphold the american flag fired a shot across the bow of a ship that bore the british lion the secretary of navy wrote to wilkes a formal letter of congratulation on the great public service you have rendered in the capture of the rebel emissaries the house of representatives on the first day of its session passed a resolution thanking him for his brave adroit and patriotic conduct montgomery blair denounced the act of wilkes as unauthorized irregular and illegal senator sumner then in boston said at once we shall have to give them up the president too resisted the general infection on the day that the news came to washington he said i fear the traitors will prove to be white elephants we must stick to american principles concerning the rights of neutrals we fought great britain for insisting by theory and practice on the right to do precisely what captain wilkes has done the president ought to have acted on his first impulse and had an immediate consultation with sumner to be sure of his law and history it is evident from a private letter that sumner's advice would have been to act on the case at once and to make the surrender in conformity with our best precedents and it is clear from seward's subsequent action that if urged by the president he too would have consented to the surrender of mason and slidell before a demand for them was made the president might then have adopted blair's recommendation that wilkes be ordered to take mason and slidell on an american warship to england and deliver them to the british government such an act would have been graceful astute honorable and politic and needed no more courage in breasting popular sentiment than lincoln had already shown in his treatment of fremont he would have had at his back sumner seward blair and general mcclellan and if the surrender had been made immediately before many lawyers and statesmen had fed the public excitement by alleging that the act was justifiable according to international law the country tersely and emphatically instructed that we were carrying out the principles for which we had always contended would doubtless have acquiesced yet lincoln clearly feared to give up mason and slidell although he must have appreciated that their voices were more eloquent from their prison than they would have been in london and paris indeed as a mere matter of policy the united states ought to have made it easy for the author of the fugitive slave law to reach london and the champion of filibustering in the interest of slavery to reach paris since their pleading could in no way injure the northern cause so well was it understood at any rate in england that they represented slavery slow to act and distrustful of his impulses lincoln let the great opportunity slip when with a word he might have won the equivalent of a successful campaign in the field alike a leader and a representative of popular sentiment he in this instance suffered his representative character to overtop the leadership the fellow feeling with the american public that in any dispute with great britain there is but one side to be considered prevented him from making a brilliant stroke as he took no action and made no public utterance his silence was misconstrued and he was reported falsely as having put down his foot with the declaration i would sooner die than give them up as there was no atlantic cable england did not receive the news of the seizure of mason and slidell until november twenty seventh the opinion was general that it was an outrage to her flag it has made a great sensation here wrote john bright to sumner from london and the ignorant and passionate and rural britannia class are angry and insolent as usual the excitement is so great said adams in a dispatch to seward as to swallow up every other topic for the moment charles mckay a friend of seward's wrote to him for his own and for the president's information the people are frantic with rage and were the country polled i fear that nine hundred ninety nine men out of a thousand would declare for immediate war lord palmerston cannot resist the impulse if he would if he submits to the insult to the flag his ministry is doomed it would not last a fortnight the english cabinet decided that the seizure of mason and slidell was an act of violence which was an affront to the british flag and a violation of international law and that their liberation and a suitable apology for the aggression be demanded in accordance with this decision earl russell on november thirtieth prepared a despatch to lord lyons 
the tone of which was softened and made more friendly on the suggestion of the queen and prince consort the prince's direct words somewhat at variance with the queen's and his kindly spirit were put into courteous diplomatic language but the substance of the demand was in no way changed and on sunday december first a queen's messenger bearing it was on his way to washington great britain began preparations for war instructions for such an eventuality were sent to lord lyons and to the vice-admiral commanding the british fleet in american waters eight thousand troops were dispatched to canada the queen by proclamation prohibited the export of arms and ammunition and the government laid an embargo on three thousand tons of saltpetre the whole stock in the market which had been recently bought for immediate shipment to the united states curiously enough the english like the american government was acting in response to popular sentiment and not in accordance with its law and precedents four days after the seizure of mason and slidell but fifteen days before the news of it reached england adams on the invitation of palmerston had an interview with him in his library november twelfth the prime minister supposed that the confederate commissioners were then approaching england as passengers in the west indian packet and that a united states vessel of war then at southampton was on the watch for her with the intention of taking them from her by force i am not going into the question of your right to do such an act palmerston said perhaps you might be justified in it or perhaps you might not such a step would be highly inexpedient it would be regarded here very unpleasantly if the captain should within sight of the shore commit an act which would be felt as offensive to the national flag nor can i see the compensating advantage to be gained by it it surely could not be supposed that the addition of one or two more to the number of persons who had already been some time in london on the same errand would be likely to produce any change in the policy already adopted palmerston's friendly advice was a mystery to adams and remained so to american writers until nineteen hundred eight when the life of delaney was published delaney was the editor of the london times and had a close political friendship with the prime minister who thus wrote to him on the day before the interview with adams my dear delaney it may be useful to you to know that the chancellor dr lushington the three law officers sir g gray the duke of somerset and myself met at the treasury to-day to consider what we could properly do about the american cruiser come no doubt to search the west indian packet supposed to be bringing hither the two southern envoys and much to my regret it appeared that according to the principles of international law laid down in our courts by lord stowell and practised and enforced by us a belligerent has the right to stop and search any neutral not being a ship of war and being found on the high seas and being suspected of carrying enemies dispatches and that consequently this american cruiser might by our own principles of international law stop the west indian packet search her and if the southern men and their dispatches and credentials were found on board either take them out or seize the packet and carry her back to new york for trial consequently as charles f adams wrote the san jacinto might on english principles of international law stop the trent search her and if the southern men were on board do exactly what captain wilkes had already just done take them out and then allow the packet to proceed on its voyage such was the opinion of the law officers in a hypothetical case on november eleventh but eighteen days later when they considered an actual seizure until then justified by english principles and practice they reversed their decision and declared wilkes act illegal and unjustifiable by international law in other words they abandoned the english precedent and adopted the hitherto american contention as more in accordance with the age of steam and conditions on the sea in the last half of the nineteenth century the english public showed in its outburst of indignation that the opinion of november eleven was antiquated and demanded that the law be expounded and that the government should act in a manner to enforce their own opinion it is a common belief that our ministers and ambassadors to great britain succumb to the charm of english society that dinners of the duchesses in london and country visits to persons of quality distinction and influence are apt to weaken the american fibre that was not the case with adams he went much into society in london and was frequently invited by persons of influence to visit them in their houses in the country indeed he was at monkton milne's house in yorkshire when the news of the seizure of mason and slidell came but with him the dinners receptions and country visits were all in the line of his work which was to do his part towards saving the republic during the forty-two days of suspense until he learned the settlement of the question he maintained his equable temper although he appreciated fully the gravity of the case 
there can be not a shadow of doubt, he wrote to Seward on December 6, that the passions of the country are up and that a collision is inevitable if the government of the United States should sustain Captain Wilkes. It is evident from his private letters that if Adams had been Secretary of State, he would have recommended the immediate surrender of Mason and Slidell. The uniform tendency of our own policy, he wrote to Motley, has been to set up very high the doctrine of neutral rights and to limit in every possible manner the odious doctrine of search. To have the two countries virtually changing their ground under this momentary temptation would not, as it seems to me, tend to benefit the position of the United States. To R. H. Dana, he said, What provokes me most is that we should consent to take up and to wear Great Britain's cast-off rags. At eleven-thirty on the night of December 18th, the Queen's messenger delivered Earl Russell's dispatch to Lyons, and also two private letters in which full instructions were given in words of tender consideration. Next day Lyons called upon Seward at the State Department, and in accordance with his instructions acquainted him with the tenor of the official dispatch. Seward asked Lyons, informally, Was any time fixed by your instructions within which the U.S. government must reply? I do not like to answer the question, was the response. Of all things, I wish to avoid the slightest appearance of a menace. Seward still pressed for private and confidential information. On this understanding, Lyons replied, I will tell you. According to my instructions, I must have your answer in seven days. Seward then requested a copy of the dispatch, unofficially and informally, as so much depended upon the wording of it that it was impossible to come to a decision without reading it. To this, Lyons replied that if he gave him the copy officially, the seven days would at once begin to run. Seward suggested that he be given the copy on the understanding that no one but the President and himself should know that it had been delivered. Lyons gladly complied with this suggestion, and on returning to the embassy, sent a copy of the dispatch to the secretary in an envelope marked Private and Confidential. This brought an almost immediate visit from Seward, who expressed himself pleased to find that the dispatch was courteous and friendly and not dictatorial or menacing. Now, he asked in strict confidence, suppose that I sent you in seven days a refusal or a proposal to discuss the question. My instructions are positive, Lyons replied, and leave me no discretion. If the answer is not satisfactory, and particularly if it does not include the immediate surrender of the prisoners, I cannot accept it. On the morning of December 23rd, the delay having occurred to suit Seward's business engagements and his wish to master the question completely, Lyons called again, read the dispatch, and left with the secretary a copy of it. From this day, the seven days of waiting began to run. As long as the English public required that their government present an ultimatum, it could not have been couched in words more considerate to the susceptibilities of the American people, nor could the instructions in the private letters have been bettered. Lyons carried out the spirit as well as the letter of his instructions. Doubtless he was glad to be supported in his sympathetic consideration for the Secretary of State's difficult position. When announcing the seizure he wrote to Earl Russell, to conceal the distress which I feel would be impossible, and during the period of suspense his attitude of reserve was irreproachable. I have avoided, he wrote, the subject of the capture on board the Trent as much as possible, and have said no more than that it is an untoward event which I very much regret. Apparently the President submitted the question to his Secretary of State. As long as Seward could not bring himself to Sumner's, Adams and Blair's position and advise the immediate surrender of Mason and Slidell, he conducted himself in an exemplary manner. Reticent of speech, he was receptive of information and advice which came to him from many quarters abroad and at home. Much of it was excellent. In his communication to Adams of November 27th, he had explained to him that Captain Wilkes had acted without any instructions whatever, and that the United States intended no action until— we hear what the British government may have to say on the subject. It was undoubtedly between the two interviews with Lyons, if not before, that Seward came to the conclusion that the commissioners must be surrendered. Thenceforth he conducted the affair in his most skillful manner. His own decision made, he had to convince the President, the overruling authority necessary to consult in all cases. Governor Seward, Lincoln said, you will go on, of course, preparing your answer, which, as I understand it, will state the reasons why they ought to be given up. Now I have a mind to try my hand at stating the reasons why they ought not to be given up. 
We will compare the points on each side. The President made a draft of a dispatch in which he expressed his unwillingness to believe that Great Britain would now press for a categorical answer. He would like the question left open for discussion in order that the United States might present her case. She would then be willing to submit the question to a friendly arbitration. But if Great Britain would not arbitrate, and, after listening to the American case, still insisted on the surrender of Mason and Slidell, the surrender would be made, provided this disposition of the matter should serve in the future as a precedent for both countries. The key to the President's attitude lay in his words, We too, as well as Great Britain, have a people justly jealous of their rights. Obviously, the draft did not satisfy him, as suited to the present exigency, and he did not present it to his cabinet. The result justified William H. Russell's entry in his diary of December 20th to the effect that Seward would control the situation. And a day earlier, Charles Elliot Norton had written from New York to Lowell, There is apparently no reason to fear war as the result of any popular excitement here or of any want of temper or discretion on the part of the administration. It is a fortunate thing for us that Seward has regained so much of the public confidence. He will feel himself strong enough not to be passionate or violent. The cabinet met at ten o'clock on the morning of Christmas Day. Probably only two members of it, Seward and Blair, were at that hour in favor of the surrender. Seward submitted the draft of his answer to Lord Lyons, complying with the British demand. Sumner came by invitation and read letters from Bright and Cobden, staunch friends of the North, giving an account of English public sentiment and offering advice that may be summed up in Bright's words. At all hazards, we must not let this matter grow to a war with England. If Sumner's opinion was asked, he doubtless expressed himself warmly in favor of Seward's decision. The discussion went on until two o'clock, when the cabinet adjourned until next day. It was then resumed. Seward maintained that the claim of the British government was just and had not been made in a discourteous manner. Bates, attorney general, came to his support, arguing that war with England would be ruin, but, as he recorded in his diary, there was great reluctance on the part of some of the members of the cabinet and even the president himself to give up the commissioners. In the end, however, from the considerations that Wilkes had acted contrary to our precedents, violated international law, and that we could not afford a war with Great Britain, all came to Seward's position and approved his answer December 26. He said at the end of his long dispatch to Lyons, the persons in question will be cheerfully liberated. The disavowal of the act was accepted as a sufficient apology. Fearing popular excitement, Seward arranged with Lyons that Mason and Slidell should not be delivered to an English vessel in Boston Harbor. An American steam tug therefore took them to Provincetown, where they were delivered to a British ship of war, which sailed immediately for Halifax, whence they made their way to Europe. There was no excitement in Boston nor anywhere else in the country when Mason and Slidell left Fort Warren. Bates had explained the reluctance of the President and some members of the Cabinet in coming to Seward's position as being due to a fear of the displeasure of our own people lest they should accuse us of timidly truckling to the power of England. They had misread public sentiment. During the forty days that had elapsed between the news of the seizure of Mason and Slidell and their surrender, the sober second thought had asserted itself, and the decision of the government was unitedly and thoroughly sustained by the whole people. This seemed to indicate that if the President and his Secretary of State had come at once to their final decision, they might have reckoned on having the country at their back. Such a disposition of the case would have made the subsequent history of the relations between England and the North far different. As it was, the transaction left a rankling wound. Many Americans thought that their country had been humiliated by being obliged to submit to a peremptory demand. Chase, in his opinion during the Cabinet Council, expressed that view. While giving his adhesion to the conclusion at which the Secretary of State has arrived, he said, it is gall and wormwood to me. Rather than consent to the liberation of these men, I would sacrifice everything I possess. Pending the settlement and afterwards, there was a complete misunderstanding between the two countries. The impression prevailed abroad that the North was determined to pick a quarrel with England. On the other hand, there was a general belief here that Great Britain only wanted a pretext for a quarrel with the United States. Even among those who did not hold such extreme views, a spirit of grim resolution prevailed. I cannot believe, wrote Norton to Lowell, 
that the English ministry mean more. If they do, they will get it and its consequences. The misunderstanding arose from each country believing that the chauvinists represented the majority in the other. As a matter of fact, a large majority in England and at the North rejoiced at the peaceful settlement of the Trent difficulty. In the South, there was bitter disappointment. End of chapter 2 3. Part 1 An unfortunate political appointment of the President's was that of Simon Cameron as Secretary of War. Unequal as he was to the task of conducting a great war, he managed his department as if it were a political machine. He had two competent subordinates whose work was efficient, yet Cameron left behind him where his own hand could be traced a continuous line of peculation. Contracts mounting up to enormous sums were repeatedly awarded to his political followers as a reward for past services or in anticipation of future work. He paid exorbitant prices, gave commissions, accepted inferior goods. Early in the autumn, Lincoln became aware of the defects of his secretary, and undoubtedly held the view set down in Nicolay's private paper conversation with the President, October 2, 1861. Cameron utterly ignorant and regardless of the course of things and probable result, selfish and openly discourteous to the President, obnoxious to the country, incapable either of organizing details or conceiving and executing general plans. "'We are going to destruction,' wrote Senator Grimes to Senator Fessenden, "'as fast as imbecility, corruption, and the wheels of time can carry us.'" Imitating Fremont, Cameron, in order to turn the public mind from his maladministration, made an appeal to the rising tide of anti-slavery sentiment. In his report to the President of December 1st, he made the suggestion in terms which could be construed as strongly recommending the measure that the slaves should be armed and when employed as soldiers should be freed without submitting the report to lincoln he had mailed it to the postmasters of the chief cities with instructions to hand it to the press as soon as the president's message was read in congress when this act came to his knowledge lincoln ordered that the copies which had been sent out should be recalled by telegraph and that the report should be modified to accord with his own policy in regard to slavery on January 11th, 1862, the President sent Cameron a curt note dismissing him from the position of Secretary of War and nominating him as Minister to Russia. There was reason enough for the change. The inefficiency of his administration, the belief of the country that it was corrupt, the insubordinate act in the matter of the report, all combined undoubtedly to lead the President to his decision. He then appointed Edwin M. Stanton Secretary of War. Stanton, in his private correspondence during the summer of 1861, had written freely of the painful imbecility of Lincoln and the impotence of his administration, and as he was neither politic nor reserved, he had undoubtedly been equally outspoken in conversation with his friends and acquaintances in Washington, where he was then living. If Lincoln had cared to listen to Washington gossip, he might have heard many tales of this sort, but if any actually reached his ears as he was considering the appointment of Stanton, they certainly counted as nothing against his growing conviction that, in respect of local origin, previous party association, and inherent ability, this democratic lawyer from Pennsylvania was the man for the place. The appointment was acceptable to Seward and Chase, to Congress and to the country, for Stanton had gained the confidence of all by his sturdy patriotism when a member of Buchanan's cabinet. It proved as admirable a choice as Cameron's was unfortunate. Stanton made a great war minister, bringing to his task an indomitable spirit, overpowering energy, and hatred of all sorts of corruption. "'I feel that one clear victory at home,' wrote Adams to Seward on January 10, 1862." might perhaps save us a foreign war. Soon after his letter reached Washington, his wish was gratified. Commanding two important gateways to the southwestern part of the Confederacy were Fort Henry on the Tennessee River and Fort Donelson on the Cumberland, the two rivers here being but eleven miles apart. Flag Officer Foote and General Ulysses S. Grant thought the capture of Henry feasible and asked Halleck, the commander of the department with headquarters in St. Louis, for permission to make the attempt. This was given by telegraph on January 30th, and two days later detailed instructions were sent by post to Grant. Next day he and Foote started from Cairo with four iron-clad and three wooden gunboats and a number of transports carrying the advanced troops of the expedition. Four days later Foote poured into Fort Henry a destructive fire which, though responded to with unabated activity, 
resulted in the Confederate flag being hauled down after an hour and a quarter's very severe and closely contested action. The cooperation of the army in the attack was prevented by the excessively muddy roads and high stage of water. Fort Henry is ours, telegraphed Grant to Halleck on February 6th. I shall take and destroy Fort Donelson on the 8th. Albert Sidney Johnston, the departmental commander of the Confederate Army, esteemed by Jefferson Davis, the ablest of Southern generals, was dismayed at the fall of Fort Henry, and determined to fight for Nashville at Donelson, assigning to his enterprise the better part of his army. Heavy rains made the roads temporarily impassable for artillery and wagons. Moreover, Grant desired the cooperation of the gunboats which were detained for needed repairs. Hence he was unable to fulfill his promise to the letter. But, having sent the gunboats and some of the troops round by water, he left Fort Henry on the morning of February 12 with his main force and marched across country toward Donelson, arriving in front of the enemy about noon. Here he began the investment of the fort and, amid constant skirmishing, extended it next day on the flanks of the enemy. On February 14th, Foote attacked with his gunboats, hoping for a repetition of the success at Fort Henry. The same courage and determination were in evidence, but the conditions were different and fortune adverse. He proved no match for the Confederate batteries. Two of the ironclads were rendered unmanageable, drifting helplessly down the river, and the other two badly damaged soon followed. Foote had been wounded. The Navy was for the moment out of the contest. I concluded, wrote Grant, to make the investment of Fort Donelson as perfect as possible, and partially fortify and await repairs to the gunboats. That night the disappointment of the Union troops was aggravated by physical discomfort. When they had left Fort Henry the weather was warm and spring-like. Many of them had left blankets and overcoats behind. Next day a driving north wind brought a storm of sleet and snow, which continuing through two nights tried the patience and endurance of the men, who were without tents and who could not risk fires because of the proximity of the enemy. Cast down by the fall of Fort Henry, the Confederate generals were now elated at the repulse of the gunboats which had not cost them a single man or gun, but, after observing the arrival of reinforcements for Grant, they were satisfied that he would soon be able to beleaguer the fort completely, and that to save the garrison they must cut their way through the besiegers and recover the road to Nashville. They determined to make the attempt early the next morning. Reinforcements had increased Grant's army to 27,000. McClellan's division was on the right, holding the Nashville Road, Lew Wallace's was in the center, and C. F. Smith's on the left. Extending beyond the earthwork of Fort Donelson was a winding line of entrenchments nearly two miles in length, protected at certain points with abatis. These entrenchments were occupied by the Confederates, whose total force was 21,000. At five o'clock on the morning of February 15th, they fell upon McClernand, who, after a stubborn resistance to superior numbers, was obliged to fall back in some confusion. The fugitives who crowded up the hill in the rear of Lew Wallace's line brought unmistakable signs of disaster. A mounted officer galloped down the road shouting, We are cut to pieces! The Confederates had gained possession of the Nashville Road, but were too broken and exhausted by the severe battle to retreat in order over a road covered with snow and ice. Nor were all the men provided with rations. Nor had certain other precautions been taken that are generally deemed indispensable for a retreat in the face of the enemy. Early that morning, Foote had requested Grant to come to his flagship for a consultation, he himself being too badly injured to leave the boat. Having complied with this request, the commanding general of the Union Army was not in the field when the Confederates attacked. On going ashore after his conference with Foote, he met a captain of his staff, white with fear, for the safety of the national troops. He rode back with the utmost speed over the four or five miles of icy roads. Here was a critical moment in Grant's life. The war had given him an opportunity to mend a broken career. Should he fail in this supreme hour? Another chance might never come to him, and his unfortunate absence during the morning's battle would certainly be misconstrued. Anyone used to affairs knows that there are times when after a bad beginning everything seems to go awry, perplexity reigns, and no remedy appears, when ordinary men are bewildered and know not what to do. All at once the master appears, takes in the situation, cheers up his associates, gives a succession of orders, and the difficulty is unraveled. Failure gives way to success. 
Such was the case on the field of Donelson. Grant arrived. Out of confusion came order. Determination out of despair. When he learned of the disaster to his right wing, his face flushed slightly and he crushed some papers in his hand. But saluting McLaren and Aunt Wallace, he said in his usual quiet voice, Gentlemen, the position on the right must be retaken. Then galloping towards his left, he stopped somewhere to send a dispatch to foot requesting his assistance. While on the way he heard some of the men say that the enemy had come out with knapsacks and haversacks filled with rations. This was evidence to him that the sortie of the Confederates amounted to nothing less than an attempt to escape from the fort, and he said to the staff officer who was riding with him, Some of our men are pretty badly demoralized, but the enemy must be more so, for he has attempted to force his way out but has fallen back. The one who attacks first now will be victorious. Call out to the men as we pass. Fill your cartridge boxes quick and get into line. The enemy is trying to escape, and he must not be permitted to do so. Wherever Grant appeared, confidence followed in his train. He rode quickly to Smith's headquarters and ordered him to charge, assuring him that he would have only a thin line to contend with. Through a battus which looked too thick for a rabbit to get through, Smith led the charge with unusual energy and courage, carried the advanced works of the enemy, and effected a lodgment in his entrenchments, securing a key to his position. After the order to Smith, Grant commanded McClernand and Wallace to charge. They advanced with vigor and recovered their position of the morning, regaining possession of the Nashville Road. There was now no way of escape for the Confederates from Fort Donelson except by the river and by a road that had been submerged by the river's overflow. Grant made arrangements for an assault at daybreak the next morning. Hardly a doubt of its success could exist. Inside the fort, the general discouragement that prevailed led the Confederate generals to the same opinion. The two ranking officers turned over the command to Buckner. One of them escaped with a number of his troops in two small steamboats that had just arrived with reinforcements. The other crossed the river in a skiff. The cavalry rode out over the submerged road, finding the water about saddle skirt deep. At an early hour next morning, February 16th, Grant received a note from Buckner proposing to capitulate and suggesting an armistice until noon. To this he made his famous reply. Yours of this date, proposing armistice and appointment of commissioners to settle terms of capitulation, is just received. No terms except unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. Buckner was compelled to accept what he called the ungenerous and unchivalrous terms. Grant, in his dispatch to Halleck of that day, said that he had taken twelve to fifteen thousand prisoners, twenty thousand stand of arms, forty-eight pieces of artillery, seventeen heavy guns, from two to four thousand horses, and large quantities of commissary stores. Judged by its moral and strategical results, wrote Ropes, the capture of Fort Donelson was one of the turning points of the war. It caused the evacuation of Nashville and resulted in a Union advance of more than two hundred miles of territory before the enemy could rally or reorganize. It set at rest all doubts, if any still existed, of the permanent position of Kentucky in the civil conflict, and it deprived the Confederate of a large part of Tennessee, a fruitful ground for recruits and supplies. The people were terrified and some of the troops were disheartened, wrote Albert Sidney Johnston to Davis. The blow was most disastrous and almost without remedy. When the governor of Tennessee proclaimed that the troops must evacuate Nashville and adjourn the legislature to Memphis, panic seized upon the people, and disorder, turbulence, and rapine ensued. The magnitude of the victory was fully appreciated at the North. The underpinning of the rebellion seems to be knocked out from under it, wrote Chase. The almost universal feeling is that the rebellion is knocked on the head, said Oliver Wendell Holmes. The capture of Fort Donelson was regarded in England as a victory of high importance and greatly helped the cause of the North. The victory was due to Grant. The more clearly one studies this campaign, the more firmly is one convinced that the great general longed for by the North had appeared. His quickness to guess the enemy's design and the predicament in which they stood, his rapidity in forming a plan and putting its several elements in operation, his ability to conceal his disappointment and alarm at the disaster to his right wing, and his grim determination to snatch some advantage from it. Here, surely, we must recognize the stamp of military genius. 
It is true that when he gave the order to charge the enemy, he could not be certain of a complete success, and that he would have liked the aid of the gunboats. It may be, as Ropes has suggested, that he only did the obvious thing. But how many generals in the Northern Army at that time would have acted as he did and turned a defeat into so complete a victory? After Smith had carried the trench and the position on the right had been recovered, Grant must have expected demoralization to follow in the enemy's ranks. Finally, Buckner's note left no room for doubt. In his reply, which by an allusion to the initials of his name made him known henceforward as unconditional surrender Grant, he showed that in the hour of success he would exact the whole loaf. This attitude amid the amenities of our civil war was the mark of a masterful character. Five days after the surrender he wrote to his close friend E.B. Washburn, Our volunteers fought a battle that would figure well with many of those fought in Europe where large standing armies are maintained. I feel very grateful to you for having placed me in the position to have had the honor of commanding such an army and at such a time. I only trust that I have not, nor will not, disappoint you. Halleck and McClellan were two good theoretical soldiers not to understand that Donelson was a signal victory, and they treated Grant in a manner that savors of professional jealousy. General Grant left his command without any authority and went to Nashville, telegraphed Halleck to McClellan. I can get no returns, no reports, no information of any kind from him. Satisfied with his victory, he sits down and enjoys it without any regard to the future. I am worn out and tired with this neglect and inefficiency. Do not hesitate to arrest Grant at once if the good of the service requires it, was McClellan's reply, and place C.F. Smith in command. Next day Halleck telegraphed, A rumor has just reached me that since the taking of Fort Donelson, General Grant has resumed his former bad habits, habits of drink. I do not deem it advisable to arrest him at present, but have placed General Smith in command of the expedition up the Tennessee. These dispatches were a cruel injustice to Grant. Since his victory his conduct had been proper, discreet, and orderly. Important as was the taking of Donelson, the full fruits of the victory were not garnered forthwith. Celerity was needed, and Grant was the one general of the North who had shown that he could move quickly and fight an army effectively. If, instead of being unjustly criticized by Halleck, he had received the consideration that was his due and had been recommended for the active command, he could undoubtedly, if keeping himself at his best level of personal efficiency, have maintained the permanent occupation of Kentucky and Tennessee, and taken Vicksburg and Chattanooga, thereby cutting off from the Confederacy a region that was considerably productive of troops and supplies. The gloom at Richmond reflected the real dimensions of the disaster. On February 22nd, six days after the fall of Donelson, the Provisional gave way to the permanent government of the Confederate States, and Davis was inaugurated President for a term of six years. Amid the profound depression, at the darkest hour of our struggle, as he phrased it, Davis, pale and emaciated from illness and grief, delivered his inaugural address in the course of which he admitted that, We have recently met with serious disasters. Adversity drove the Confederates to extreme acts. Six days after his inauguration, Davis, by authority of an act of Congress passed in secret session, proclaimed martial law in the city of Richmond and the adjoining country for ten miles around and declared the suspension therein of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus. Seven weeks later, in response to his recommendation, a rigorous conscription act was passed. Oh, for a grant in command of the Army of the Potomac to take quick advantage of this demoralization in the capital of the Confederacy! And indeed it seemed for the moment as if McClellan would be spurred to action, as is evident from two of his dispatches to Halleck of February 20th. If the force in West can take Nashville, or even hold its own for the present, I hope to have Richmond and Norfolk in from three to four weeks. The rebels hold firm at Manassas. In less than two weeks I shall move the Army of the Potomac, and hope to be in Richmond soon after you are in Nashville. On February 24th, Nashville was occupied by the Union troops. McClellan had a wonderful opportunity. In command of 150,000 men, superior so far as the average raw material of the rank and file is concerned to the armies of most European countries, with roads to traverse no worse than many of those in the south of Italy over which the Sardinian army had marched in 1860, roads no more difficult of passage than were the roads in Tennessee, on which the Union troops had marched and were still marching to good purpose, 
he should unquestionably have struck at Joseph E. Johnston at Manassas. He had three men to the enemy's one, and though the outcome of a great battle may never be predicted with certainty, especially one with a McClellan pitted against a Joseph E. Johnston, nevertheless the chances were decidedly with the Union Army. Moreover, Johnston was about to retire from Manassas. He began his preparations on February 22nd, started the movement itself on March 7th, and four days later had his army safely on the south bank of the Rappahannock River. Here had been an excellent opportunity for inflicting damage, to use McClellan's own words, on a large army that was withdrawing in the face of a powerful adversary. Let us now return to Grant during the days following the capture of Fort Donelson. In a private letter to Washburn of March 22nd, he gave an account of his misunderstanding with Halleck. After getting into Donelson, he wrote, General Halleck did not hear from me for near two weeks. It was about the same time before I heard from him. I was writing every day and sometimes as often as three times a day, reported every move and change, the condition of my troops, etc. Not getting these, General Halleck very justly became dissatisfied and was, as I have since learned, sending me daily reprimands. Not receiving them, they lost their sting. When one did reach me, not seeing the justice of it, I retorted and asked to be relieved. Three telegrams passed in this way, each time ending my requesting to be relieved. All is now understood, however, and I feel assured that General Halleck is fully satisfied. In fact, he wrote me a letter saying that I could not be relieved and otherwise quite complimentary. But in his article in the Century magazine, February 1885, and in his personal memoirs, both written after he had seen the whole correspondence, he criticized Halleck severely. Halleck, however, at this time had the confidence of the War Department in Washington and had been appointed to the sole command of the United States forces in the West. On March 13th, he restored Grant to the active command of the Army of the Tennessee from which he had been temporarily suspended. In 1884, Grant wrote, My opinion was, and still is, that immediately after the fall of Fort Donelson, the way was open to the national forces all over the southwest without much resistance. If one general who would have taken the responsibility had been in command of all the troops west of the Alleghenies, he could have marched to Chattanooga, Corinth, Memphis, and Vicksburg with the troops we then had, and as volunteering was going on rapidly over the north, there would soon have been force enough at all these centers to operate offensively against any body of the enemy that might be found near them. As a matter of fact, when after the inexcusable snubbing he had received from Halleck, Grant was again placed at the head of his army, he had an opportunity for action which, if he had availed himself of it to the best of his ability, would, by common consent of government and people, have pointed to him unmistakably as the one man for this work. During the last days of March, Grant's headquarters were at Savannah. He had five divisions in camp at Pittsburgh Landing, nine miles higher up on the west side of the Tennessee River, the side toward the enemy, and also Lew Wallace's division at Crump's Landing, five miles below Pittsburgh Landing and on the same side of the river. General Buell, in command of the Army of the Ohio, about 36,000 strong, was marching toward Savannah to join Grant in an offensive movement against the Confederates who were at or near Corinth. Albert Sidney Johnston, grieved as he was over the disaster at Donelson, was always cheered by the support and friendship of Jefferson Davis, who wrote to him, My confidence in you has never wavered. Beauregard, then the idol of the South, had been persuaded to leave Virginia and go to the Southwest to the aid of Johnston in the hope that, by his personal popularity, he might succeed in arousing the people to resist the invasion of their territory. Through the exertions of these two, an army of forty thousand was collected at Corinth. "'What the people want,' said Johnston, "'is a battle and a victory,' and he hoped to crush Grant before Buell could join him. Leaving Corinth on April 3rd, with the idea of surprising the Union forces, he expected to make the attack two days later, but owing to a number of delays was unable to deliver the blow until the early morning of Sunday, April 6th. On the eve of this battle, called Shiloh, Grant's remarkable faculty of divining the enemy's movements displayed at Donelson and later during his military career seemed to be utterly in abeyance. Grant never studied the opposing commander with the thoroughness of Lee, and this time he failed to guess that desperation would drive Johnston to the offensive. 
he had made up his mind that the enemy would await his attack, and so obstinate was he in this belief as to ignore certain unmistakable signs of a projected movement. On the day before the attack, April 5th, he telegraphed to Halleck, The main force of the enemy is at Corinth. I have scarcely the faintest idea of an attack, general one being made upon us, but will be prepared should such a thing take place. At three o'clock that afternoon he said to a colonel of Buell's army, There will be no fight at Pittsburgh Landing. We will have to go to Corinth, where the rebels are fortified. At this hour Johnston's advance corps was two miles from the Union camp, and the rest of his forty thousand within supporting distance. William T. Sherman, who, in addition to his own division, had general command of three others at Pittsburgh Landing, was even more careless than Grant, for he was in close contact with the evidence. He had, however, received no order to throw up entrenchments, although Halleck had directed Grant to fortify his position. While the utility of hasty entrenchments on the field of battle was not yet appreciated, it is remarkable that with an enemy estimated at from sixty thousand to eighty thousand, and located according to their own guess, not farther than twenty-three miles away, generals as resourceful as Grant and Sherman did not put their soldiers to work with a pick and spade. At a later period of the war, wrote Sherman, we could have rendered this position impregnable in one night. Sherman, restless, ardent, and enterprising, felt the enemy more than once. On the afternoon of Friday, April 4th, he made a reconnaissance and captured ten prisoners who said they were the advance guard of an army commanded by Beauregard that was marching to attack the Union camp. One who was mortally wounded told the colonel of an Ohio regiment that the army was fifty thousand strong and would certainly attack within twelve hours. Of this, Sherman was promptly informed. Pickets of this Ohio regiment called the attention of their captain to the rabbits and squirrels that were running into the lines. They saw a body of cavalry and a large infantry force in line. These and other facts were reported to Sherman, who, clinging stubbornly to his own conception of the situation, refused to regard them as indicating anything more formidable than a reconnaissance in force. Beauregard will not attack, he said. I know him and his habit of mind well. He will never leave his own base of supplies to attack the Union army at its base. On Saturday, April 5th, he sent this word to Grant. The enemy has cavalry in our front, and I think there are two regiments of infantry and one battery of artillery about two miles out. The enemy is saucy but got the worst of it yesterday and will not press our pickets far. I do not apprehend anything like an attack on our position. At this moment one corps of the Confederate army was deployed in line of battle not two miles from his camp, and the other three corps were in supporting distance. If Beauregard had been in command, Sherman's conjecture would not have been far wrong. He had agreed to the attack of the Union force, but, when it proved impossible to make it on the Saturday, he feared that the skirmish the day before, the drumbeat and bugle calls, had given a sufficient warning, and that they would be found entrenched to the eyes and ready for an attack. He accordingly advised that the Confederate army be withdrawn to Corinth. Two of the Corps commanders differed with him, and Johnston closed the discussion with, we shall attack at daylight to-morrow. I would fight them if they were a million. Even if Sherman had realized that Johnston was in command, he, like Grant, would have had no idea of the desperate energy that was pushing him forward. An incident will show the proximity of the armies. Hearing the drumbeat at the hour of tattoo, Beauregard ordered it suppressed when, after investigation, his staff officer informed him that the drumming was in the Union camp. After the downpour of Friday and that midnight's violent storm, the sun rose on Sunday in a cloudless sky. From student to student of military campaigns went the word, the son of Austerlitz. Johnston, in the bracing air, shared the exaltation, declaring, Tonight we will water our horses in the Tennessee River. Better informed than Grant and Sherman, he knew the exact position of the Union Army and planned to turn their left cut off their retreat to the Tennessee River, and compel their surrender. While taking his coffee at 5.14, he heard the first gun, the prelude to a vigorous attack that surprised Grant, Sherman, and nearly all their officers and men. A major of an Ohio regiment was still in bed. Officers' servants and company cooks were preparing breakfast. At least one sutler had opened his shop. The sentinels were pacing their beats, the details for brigade guard and fatigue duty were marching to their posts. All at once the regular order of the day was changed to haste and confusion. 
Between seven and eight o'clock the camp of the sixth division was carried. The surprise was complete, wrote Johnston's aide-de-camp. Cutters, arms, stores, and ammunition were abandoned. The breakfasts of the men were on the table, the officers' baggage and apparel left in the tents. About eight a.m., wrote Sherman in his report of April 10th, I saw the glistening bayonets of heavy masses of infantry to our left front, and became satisfied for the first time that the enemy designed a determined attack on our whole camp. Recovering from his surprise, wasting not a moment in vain regret, Sherman plunged into the contest, making his presence felt by command and example. In the thick of the fight he had three horses killed under him and was himself twice wounded. History may accept with only slight reservation Halleck's report sent a week later from Pittsburgh Landing. It is the unanimous opinion here, he wrote, that General Sherman saved the fortune of the day. He was ably supported by McClernand and the other division commanders, but by ten o'clock Sherman's and McClernand's camps with their supplies had been taken. As the Union soldiers were outflanked, they fell back until at the close of the day they occupied, if McClernand's division may be taken as an example of those who had not been captured or fled, their eighth position. The Union force of 36,000 resisted in this manner the Confederate of 40,000. Johnston's troops were almost entirely raw. Twenty-five of Grant's 63 regiments had fought at Donelson. The stragglers and the skulkers from the Union Army were a large number. Many of the Green regiments broke and ran at the sudden onset, but the soldiers who stood to their colors and supported the strenuous efforts of Sherman showed a high degree of physical and moral courage. The grant of Shiloh was not the grant of Donelson. Nevertheless, he worked hard to retrieve, as best he might, the mistake occasioned by his careless disregard of the enemy. At six o'clock, while eating his breakfast at Savannah, he received word from a private on detached duty at headquarters that artillery firing was heard in the direction of Pittsburgh Landing. Leaving the table at once, he wrote an order to General Nelson, who commanded the advance of Buell's army, and who had arrived the day before, to move his division to Pittsburgh, and then took steamer himself for the same place, stopping on the way at Crump's Landing to tell Lew Wallace to hold his 6,500 in readiness to march to the scene of action. Arriving at Pittsburgh at about eight, he went to the front, and at once sent the order to Lew Wallace to come to the assistance of his army. The military critics say that Grant counted for little or nothing in the conduct of the battle. The layman, unable to dissociate him from his earlier and later career, feels that during his frequent visits and verbal injunctions to his division commanders, his coolness and deportment of a courageous soldier must have helped them in their efforts to maintain confidence among their hard-pressed soldiers. At noon, Grant became very anxious. He sent word to Lew Wallace to hasten forward and dispatch this entreaty to Commanding Officer Advance Forces, Buell's Army, near Pittsburgh. The appearance of fresh troops in the field now would have a powerful effect, both by inspiring our men and disheartening the enemy. If you will get upon the field, leaving all your baggage on the east bank of the river, it will be more to our advantage and possibly save the day to us. The rebel forces are estimated at over 100,000 men. This dispatch was received by Buell himself, who had arrived at Savannah the evening previous, and was now proceeding up the river by steamboat. Elated at their first success, the Confederates pressed forward with vigor encouraged by Johnston, who kept well to the front. An assault seemed necessary to occupy an important ridge for the turning of the Union left. He led the charge, escaping harm during the hottest of the fight, but, as the Union soldiers retired from the crest, they kept up a desultory fire, and one of their minier balls severed an artery in his leg. The blood flowed freely. In ten or fifteen minutes he was dead. Had his surgeon, who had attended him during most of the morning, still been with him, he would have been saved, but during the advance they passed a large number of wounded, many of them Union men, and Johnston ordered his surgeon to stop, saying, these men were our enemies a moment ago. They are our prisoners now. Take care of them. Johnston's death happened at half-past two in the afternoon. Then Beauregard assumed command with his headquarters at Shiloh Church, a log cabin where Sherman had been the night previous. A lull in the battle ensued, but presently the struggle was renewed with fury. The Sixth Union Division had made a remarkable fight, contesting the ground as they fell back but surrounded their general to save a useless sacrifice surrendered with twenty-two hundred men this was at half-past five 
a last desperate effort was made by the confederates to turn the union left and get possession of the landing it was necessary to carry a hill guarded by a battery of rifled guns and by two union gunboats which opened fire with shot and shell on the confederate forces grant sat on his horse quiet thoughtful almost stolid somebody said to him does not the prospect begin to look gloomy not at all was the quiet reply they can't force our lines around these batteries to-night it is too late delay counts everything with us to-morrow we shall attack them with fresh troops and drive them of course although lew wallace had failed to reach pittsburgh help other than nightfall was at hand the energetic nelson and his division were hastening forward from savannah after three miles of good road they had to proceed through a black mud swamp and then through a forest where the subsiding waters left but indistinct traces of the way they could hear the roar of cannon and as they drew nearer the volleys of musketry while yet two miles away a courier riding at full speed reined up at the head of the column with this word for the general hurry up or all will be lost the enemy is driving our men on reaching the east bank of the river a brigade crossed in boats climbed the bank a hundred feet in height and in obedience to the orders of grant and buell both cool and calm formed in support of the batteries an advance was immediately made upon the point of attack wrote grant april tenth and the enemy soon driven back darkness was close at hand beauregard sent orders to his troops to cease fighting and to sleep on their arms the contest had lasted more than twelve hours and was a confederate victory inasmuch as the union troops were driven back from a mile and a half to two miles and lost shiloh church the point which as grant wrote was the key to our position but the victory did not meet the expectations of johnston who had hoped to capture the union army or at any rate to drive it from the field in complete rout at the time of his death he must have felt that his hopes were in a fair way to be realized for the demoralization of a part of grant's army began with a sudden attack and continued to the end of the day greatly impressing nelson as he crossed the river in the late afternoon i found cowering under the river bank he wrote on april tenth from seven to ten thousand men frantic with fright and utterly demoralized who received my gallant division with cries we are whipped cut to pieces the battle of sunday wrote henry stone was like an old-fashioned country wrestling match where each combatant uses any method he chooses or can bring to bear to force his adversary to the ground next day monday april seventh twenty thousand of buell's well-disciplined soldiers lew wallace's sixty-five hundred and such troops of the four divisions that had borne the brunt of sunday's battle as could be brought into line attacked beauregard under orders from grant and buell and largely outnumbering him drove him after eight hours fighting from the field recovering the lost positions beauregard's army badly demoralized retreated to corinth bragg who had commanded the second corps in the battle wrote to him on april late during the retreat our condition is horrible troops utterly disorganized and demoralized road almost impassable no provisions and no forage the enemy up to daylight had not pursued like most victories of our civil war whether confederate or union no effective pursuit was made grant himself and his army except lew wallace's division were too fatigued for immediate active service and he did not exercise the authority over buell's army for which he had the warrant from halleck any later pursuit was rendered impossible by halleck's instructions and by his project of joining the army in person and taking over the command End of chapter three part one three part two the union casualties during the two days were thirteen thousand forty seven the confederate ten thousand six hundred ninety four never before had a battle of such magnitude been fought on this continent the confederates failed to repair the disaster of donelson on the other hand grant might have crushed johnston had he anticipated the attack his lack of correct information is evident from his dispatch to halleck two days after the battle saying that he had been attacked by one hundred and sixty-two regiments which was a much larger number than he had actually to contend with it was a battle between men from the southwest and northwest and these sections went into deep mourning over their dead and wounded the hilarity in chicago at donelson gave place to grief over shiloh private letters from soldiers to their homes in the western states told of the useless slaughter and aroused a feeling of indignation toward grant 
the press and members of congress faithfully reflected this sentiment washburn in the house and john sherman in the senate alone defended him there is much feeling against grant wrote the senator to his brother the general and i tried to defend him but with little success all sorts of charges were made against him stanton telegraphed to halleck at pittsburgh landing the president desires to know whether any neglect or misconduct of general grant or any other officer contributed to the casualties that befell our forces on sunday halleck in his immediate answer was evasive and in his dispatch of may second as printed there is a tantalizing ellipsis but so far as i have been able to discover there is no evidence in the printed record of misconduct on the part of grant it was the tragedy of his career that whenever he was at fault the popular judgment harked back to his early record in the regular army and charged his shortcoming to intemperance and drink a large number in the north believed this to be the cause of his recklessness at shiloh and exerted a strong pressure on the president for his removal a k mcclure related that carried along as he was by the overwhelming tide of popular sentiment and backed by the almost universal conviction of the president's friends he urged this course upon lincoln late one night in a private interview of two hours at the white house during which he did most of the talking mcclure advocated with earnestness the removal of grant as necessary for the president to retain the confidence of the country when i had said everything that could be said from my standpoint mcclure proceeded with his story we lapsed into silence lincoln remained silent for what seemed a very long time he then said in a tone of earnestness that i shall never forget i can't spare this man he fights in his private letter to washburn grant is pathetic and at the same time obstinate in his determination to defend his conduct of the battle and his procedure anterior to the confederate assault to say he wrote that i have not been distressed at these attacks upon me would be false for i have a father mother wife and children who read them and are distressed by them and i necessarily share with them in it then too all subject to my orders read these charges and it is calculated to weaken their confidence in me and weaken my ability to render efficient service in our present cause those people who expect a field of battle to be maintained for a whole day with about thirty thousand troops most of them entirely raw against fifty thousand as was the case at pittsburgh landing while waiting for reinforcements to come up without loss of life no little of war looking back at the past i cannot see for the life of me any important point that could be corrected general halleck arrived at pittsburgh landing on april eleventh he did not displace grant until the thirtieth when on reorganizing the army he deprived him of any actual command of troops but made him second to himself grant chafed at this asked more than once to be relieved from duty under halleck and then decided to quit this semblance of active service saying to general sherman you know that i am in the way here i have stood it as long as i can and can endure it no longer sherman with whom he had begun that fast friendship which endured throughout grant's whole life urged him to stay if you go away he said events will go right along and you will be left out while if you remain some happy incident will restore you to favor and your true place grant acted upon this reasonable counsel and stayed with the army this conversation followed the occupation of corinth by the union troops halleck had concentrated a force of one hundred thousand with which he moved slowly and cautiously upon corinth entrenching at every halt so that sherman described the advance as one with pick and shovel he forced the evacuation of corinth a place of strategic importance and worth having but the crushing of beauregard's army which was possible would have been a far more profitable achievement the navy at the outbreak of the war was small and many of the ships were on distant cruises where orders to return were long in reaching them through the indefatigable exertions of the secretary gideon wells and his chosen assistant gustavus v fox and the purchase and charter of merchant steamers a navy was improvised which was powerful enough to maintain a reasonably effective blockade bases for the blockading fleet and for other naval and military operations were needed in hatteras inlet port royal and roanoke island were successively captured by joint naval and army expeditions the english wrote adams from london must abide by the blockade if it really be one they will set it aside if they can pick a good flaw in it ever present to the english and american mind was the cotton crop of eighteen sixty one which england and france wanted and which the south was eager to exchange for cannon rifles munitions of war iron in many forms and general merchandise 
the bar to this trade was the blockade which to be binding must be effective one day in march eighteen sixty two the blockade at norfolk was broken which gave rise to the apprehension lest it should be raised at all the atlantic ports until eighteen fifty eight the navies of the world were wooden vessels but in that year the french applied armor plating to the steam frigate la gloire whereupon the british admiralty speedily constructed the ninety two hundred ton iron steamship warrior probable though it was that an immense change was imminent in naval construction the united states navy department was slow to make a venture in the direction indicated richmond was in advance of washington as early as may eight eighteen sixty one the confederate secretary of the navy wrote i regard the possession of an iron armored ship as a matter of the first necessity and in july he gave an order to raise the steam frigate merrimac one of the ships partially burned and sunk when the gosport navy yard was destroyed and convert her into an ironclad this was accomplished as rapidly as could be expected under the imperfect manufacturing and mechanical conditions in the south by an act of august third eighteen sixty one the united states congress constituted a naval board four days later the navy department advertised for plans and offers of ironclad steamboats of light draft suitable to navigate the shallow rivers and harbors of the confederate states john erickson submitted a plan which was rejected but on the persuasion of a friend he went to washington and demonstrated to the entire satisfaction of the board that his design was thoroughly practical and based on sound theory his proposal was accepted and secretary wells told him to begin the construction forthwith without awaiting the execution of the formal contract inasmuch as the knowledge of the progress on the merrimac had impressed the naval people with the necessity for speed erickson's ironclad was the monitor her keel was laid on october twenty fifth eighteen sixty one she was launched on january thirty eighteen sixty two and on march six left new york for fort monroe on saturday march eight a fine day with a calm sea the blockading fleet in hampton roads were on their usual watch off newport news the frigate congress of fifty guns and the sloop of war cumberland of twenty four both sailing vessels swung lazily at anchor soon after noon a monster resembling a huge half-submerged crocodile belching out smoke was described coming from the direction of norfolk no such ship had ever before been seen in american waters few if any of the union men had ever looked upon her like elsewhere but all knew at once that she was the merrimac the congress and the cumberland cleared their decks for action the merrimac opened with her bow gun on the congress received a broadside and gave one in return the cumberland and the shore batteries fired at the monster and their balls rebounded from her iron sides as if they had been of india rubber passing the congress the merrimac steered directly for the cumberland brought her guns to bear upon the union sloop of war killing and wounding men at every shot and steaming on under full headway rammed the cumberland opening her side wide enough to drive in a horse and cart water poured into the hole the ship canted to port the mass swaying wildly she delivered a parting shot and sank with the american flag at the peak this action had lasted thirty minutes seeing the fate of her sister ship the congress slipped her anchor set her jib and topsails and assisted by a tug ran ashore hoping in the shoal water to escape the merrimac which drew twenty-two feet but she did not get beyond the confederate range of fire the merrimac raked her fore and aft with shells being now on fire she hauled down her colors and hoisted a white flag a misunderstanding that ensued with regard to her surrender led the merrimac firing hot shot into the congress this completed her destruction as soon as the merrimac was sighted the frigate minnesota left her anchorage at fort monroe and steamed toward newport news to the support of the congress and cumberland she ran aground and as there still remained two hours of daylight she was apparently at the mercy of the ironclad but the pilots were afraid to attempt the channel at ebb tide the merrimac therefore returned to sewell's point and anchored to await the light of next day when her commander expected to return to destroy the minnesota and the rest of the fleet at fort monroe that night there was consternation in the union fleet and among the union troops in fort monroe and at newport news the stately wooden frigates in the morning deemed powerful men of war had been proved absolutely useless to cope with this new engine of destruction the following day in washington a sunday was one of profound disquietude 
Seward Chase, Stanton, and Wells hastened to the White House to confer with the President, who was much perturbed. Stanton, wrote Hay in his diary, was fearfully stampeded. He said they would capture our fleet, take Fort Monroe, be in Washington before night. The President and Stanton went repeatedly to the window and looked down the Potomac, the view being uninterrupted for miles, to see if the Merrimack was not coming to Washington. The dispatches from the War Department that day reflect the general excitement and apprehension. The capability of the Merrimack for future performance was much exaggerated, but one consideration could not rationally be ignored. She had broken the blockade at Norfolk and might do as much at other ports. During the excited meeting at the White House, Wells said to the President and his advisers, The Monitor is now in Hampton Roads. I have confidence in her power to resist, and I hope to overcome the Merrimack. The Monitor had been towed from New York, and, despite a gale and stormy passage, had reached Hampton Roads on the Saturday evening at nine. Thence, in obedience to further orders, she proceeded two and a half hours later to a point alongside the Minnesota. At daylight on March ninth, the Confederates saw a craft such as the eyes of a seaman never looked upon before an immense shingle floating on the water with a gigantic cheese-box rising from its center. No sails, no wheels, no smokestack, no guns. They knew it was the monitor. At eight o'clock the Merrimack bore down upon the Minnesota and opened fire on her. The monitor, which was commanded by Lieutenant John L. Warden, steered directly for the Merrimack, laid herself right alongside and opened fire. The monitor was of 776 tons burden, drew only ten and a half feet, and had two eleven-inch Dahlgren guns fired from a revolving turret. The Merrimack was a ship of thirty-five hundred tons carrying ten cannon. It was said that a pygmy strove against a giant. David had come out to encounter Goliath. Then, for nearly four hours, ensued a fierce artillery duel at close range. The distance between the two vessels varied from half a mile to a few yards. Gun after gun was fired by the monitor, without result except to draw broadsides from the Merrimack, which apparently had no more effect than so many pebble-stones thrown by a child. At one time Lieutenant Jones, who was in command of the Merrimack, inquired, "'Why are you not firing, Mr. Eggleston?' "'Why, our powder is very precious,' was the reply. "'And after two hours' incessant firing, I find that I can do her about as much damage by snapping my thumb at her every two minutes and a half. Jones determined then to ram the monitor as the Cumberland had been rammed the previous day. But the engines and boilers of the Merrimack were defective. Her speed was only five knots. She was unwieldy and her iron prow had been twisted off and lost in her encounter with the Cumberland. Opportunity offering, however, she made for her antagonist at full speed, but the monitor being easily handled got out of her way, receiving only a glancing blow. She gave us a tremendous thump wrote the chief engineer, but did not injure us in the least. The Merrimack got the worse of the collision, springing a leak. She had also, wrote Jones, received a shot which came near disabling the machinery. But Warden was hurt. In the pilot house, which was constructed of iron logs in the manner of a log cabin, he used a lookout chink to direct the movements of his vessel. A shell struck and exploded just outside, severely injuring his eyes and leading him to believe that the pilot house was seriously damaged. He gave orders to put the helm to starboard and sheer off. Jones, either because he thought the monitor had given up the contest or because his own boat was leaking badly, steered towards Norfolk and the struggle was over. The monitor was uninjured and in condition to engage the Merrimack if she appeared on the morrow. But the Merrimack was too badly damaged for further operations. She had to dock for repairs and did not re-enter Hampton Roads until a month later. Captain Erickson wrote the chief engineer of the Monitor from Hampton Roads on the day of the fight. I congratulate you upon your great success. Thousands have this day blessed you. I have heard whole crews cheering you. Every man feels that you have saved this place to the nation by furnishing us with the means to whip an ironclad frigate that was, until our arrival, having it all her own way with our most powerful vessels. This momentous encounter demonstrated that the naval ships of the future must be ironclad. The wooden walls of England were no longer her security. 
the performance of the monitor on sunday did not entirely dispel the apprehensions in washington and throughout the country occasioned by the destructive work of the merrimac on saturday mcclellan had decided to transport his army to fort monroe and using that as his base advance on richmond by the peninsula between the york and james rivers but this movement required the control of the sea in hampton roads and at fort monroe by the union navy and this was rendered dubious by the possibility of the merrimac appearing again he therefore asked assistant secretary of the navy fox march twelfth who was still at fort monroe can i rely on the monitor to keep the merrimac in check so that i can make fort monroe a base of operations fox replied the monitor is more than a match for the merrimac but she might be disabled in the next encounter i cannot advise so great dependence upon her Meg, still alarmed wrote from washington march thirteenth i would not trust this city to the strength of a single screw bolt in the monitor's new machinery if one breaks the merrimac beats her as late as march fifteenth wells confessed there is a degree of apprehension in regard to the armored steamer merrimac which it is difficult to allay the merrimac made two more appearances in hampton roads the first one on april eleventh when she directed the capture of three merchant vessels by a confederate armed steamer and a gunboat the monitor was on the watch but neither ventured to attack the other her second appearance was on may eighth when in the words of her commander she stood directly for the enemy for the purpose of engaging him but the monitor and her consorts would not give battle secretary chase who with the president and secretary of war was at fort monroe on a brief visit wrote this account of the incident the merrimac came on slowly and in a little while there was a clear sheet of water between her and the monitor then the great rebel terror paused then turned back and having finally attained what she considered a safe position became stationary again on may eleventh as a consequence of the evacuation of norfolk by the confederates due to mcclellan's advance she was fired and after burning fiercely for upward of an hour blew up the opportune appearance of the monitor was a piece of good fortune for the navy department but her construction was due to its foresight nevertheless her restraint of the merrimac was in the nature of defensive warfare whilst the conditions of the war required offensive work on the part of the union forces in this the navy now bore its share under the leadership of a man of sixty who had been in the naval service from boyhood up had thirsted for fame but had not achieved it this was farragut whose opportunity had now come from washington he wrote to his home i am to have a flag in the gulf and the rest depends upon myself the importance of the mississippi river had been appreciated from the first if the north could get possession of it the confederate states would be cut in twain and the rich supplies from the west could not reach the east new orleans one hundred miles from its mouth commanded the lower part of the river and was moreover the chief commercial city of the south its capture would be a damaging blow to the confederacy gustavus v fox the assistant secretary of the navy though drawn from civil life by wells had been in the navy eighteen years and afterwards commanded mail steamers acquiring the practical knowledge wherewith to support his fertile thought fox now conceived a plan for accomplishing the desired object the main defences of new orleans were two strong fortifications st philip and jackson situated on opposite sides of the river about seventy-five miles below the city fox proposed that an armed fleet should run by these forts after which as the navigation of the river was not difficult the great city would be at their mercy he won the approval of his chief and the two broached the plan in conference with the president mcclellan and commander david d porter who had been engaged in the blockade of the southwest pass of the mississippi porter suggested that the naval fleet be accompanied by a mortar flotilla which should reduce the forts before the passage was made the chief engineer of the army of the potomac whom mcclellan designated to represent him in the adjustment of the details agreed emphatically with porter's suggestion writing to pass these works merely with a fleet and appear before new orleans is a raid no capture in spite of his high opinion of porter fox stuck to his original plan and thus the matter stood when the commander of the expedition was decided upon wells and fox selected farragut for the command basing their choice on porter's knowledge of the man due to an intimate personal acquaintance from his youth up farragut was summoned to washington where he learned from fox the object of the expedition the number of vessels he should command and the plan of attack he entered into the affair with enthusiasm 
had no doubt that the fleet could run by the forts but had little faith in the bombardment by the mortar flotilla which would occasion delay but as it seemed to have been decided upon he was willing to give it a trial i expect he said to restore new orleans to the government or never come back wells's letter of instructions was far from possessing the definiteness of fox's verbal explanation to farragut it stated in a general way that he should reduce the defences which guard the approaches to new orleans before he should appear off that city while at ship island the base of operations about a hundred miles from the mouth of the mississippi farragut wrote to wells that the capture of donelson and the surrender of nashville had caused fear and demoralization in new orleans there could be not a better time he added for the blow to be struck by us and you may depend upon its being done the moment the mortar boats arrive by the middle of april farragut with six ships and twelve gunboats and porter with a mortar flotilla of nineteen schooners and six armed steamships for guard and towing service were before forts jackson and st philip on april eighteenth the bombardment of fort jackson by the mortar boats began and continued for two days inflicting considerable damage but not sufficient to compel the confederates to entertain the idea of surrender at ten o'clock in the morning of april twentieth while the bombardment was at its height farragut signalled from his flagship the hartford that he wished a conference with the commanding officers of his fleet all who were not engaged in active work came porter who commanded the mortar flotilla subject to farragut was unable to be present but sent a communication in which he advised against running by the forts we should first capture the forts he said and then we may easily take new orleans but if we run the forts we should leave an enemy in our rear some of the commanders agreed with porter as farragut had promised fox he had given the bombardment by the mortar boats a trial but as forty-eight hours firing had failed to reduce the forts he reverted to his original plan which at the end of the conference he put into a general order the flag officer he wrote having heard all the opinions expressed by the different commanders is of the opinion that whatever is to be done will have to be done quickly and that the forts should be run with all possible celerity he proceeded to execute his plan on the night after the conference he sent a force to remove an obstruction in his way opposite fort jackson a chain which crossed the river supported by eight hulks which were strongly moored not all that he intended was accomplished but enough was done to enable his ships to pass up the river farragut needed all his nerve and resolution his trusted friend porter a man of conspicuous naval capacity did not believe in his plan his instructions from the secretary of the navy were ambiguous if he failed he would be regarded as a foolhardy captain who had run counter to the orthodox principles of naval strategy in breasting a current of three and a half miles an hour in front of strong fortifications and in the face of the enemy's fire rafts and gunboats during the next days and nights of anxiety however though he neglected no precaution and availed himself of every condition in his favor he moved straight towards his goal by april twenty third his arrangements were completed in the afternoon he wrote i visited each ship in order to know positively that each commander understood my orders for the attack and to see that all was in readiness i had looked to their efficiency before every one appeared to understand their orders well and looked forward to the conflict with firmness but with anxiety at about five minutes of two o'clock a m april twenty fourth signal was made to get under way at once was heard in every direction the clank clank of the chains as the seamen hove the anchors to the bows an hour and a half was consumed in getting all the vessels under way during the days of preparation porter had kept up the bombardment from his mortar boats and now aided the movement by pouring a terrific fire of shells into fort jackson the first to be passed as the fleet advanced they fired at the forts which briskly returned the fire the passing of the forts jackson and st philip wrote farragut next day was one of the most awful sights and events i ever saw or expect to experience the smoke was so dense that it was only now and then you could see anything but the flash of the cannon and the fire-ships or rafts the fire-rafts were immense flatboats piled loosely with wood twenty feet high and saturated with tar and resin from which the flames rose a hundred feet into the air in the effort to avoid one of these farragut's flagship the hartford was run ashore but a tug pushed the firecraft alongside and in a moment the hartford was one blaze all along the port side halfway up to the main and mizzen tops 
Thinking it was all over with them, Farragut exclaimed, My God, is it to end this way? But the fire department poured streams of water on the flames and put them out. At the same time, the Hartford backed off and got clear of the raft. She was then opposite Fort St. Philip. The fierce fight continued, and at this time, if not before, the Confederate gunboats and two ironclad rams took part in the contest, but most of these were destroyed. At length the fire slackened, wrote Farragut. The smoke cleared off, and we saw, to our surprise, that we were above the forts. We had a rough time of it, was his word to Porter, but thank God the number of killed and wounded was very small, considering. Thirteen of his little fleet were now assembled above the forts. Four were missing, but only one had been sunk. Leaving two gunboats to protect the landing of the troops who were part of the expedition, he proceeded up the river to New Orleans, seeing on the way ships laden with burning cotton floating downstream and other signs of the destruction of property, all evidence of the panic which had seized upon the city. During the morning of April 25th he reached the Chalmette batteries three miles below the city and by a vigorous attack silenced them in thirty minutes. His dispatch is headed, at anchor off New Orleans. The town was at his mercy. The levee, he wrote, was one scene of desolation. Ships, steamers, cotton, coal, etc., were all in the common blaze. As he had divined, the passage of the forts compelled the evacuation of New Orleans by the Confederate military force and its surrender, and furthermore, since the enemy's communications were now severed, the surrender of the forts. On April 29th he sent this dispatch to the Secretary of the Navy. Our flag waves over both Forts Jackson and St. Philip, and at New Orleans over the Custom House. The passage of the forts and the possession of the Mississippi River made the way clear for General Butler and his troops to reach New Orleans by boat. On May 1st, Farragut formally turned over to him the city. After any successful achievement, nothing is so grateful as the appreciation of experts. This Farragut received. From Fox came, Having studied up the localities and defenses and conceiving this attack, I can fully appreciate the magnificent execution which has rendered your name immortal. And from Captain Mahon, the conquest of New Orleans and of its defenses was wholly the work of the United States Navy. It was a triumph won over formidable difficulties by a mobile force skillfully directed and gallantly fought. It was the crowning stroke of adverse fortune, wrote later the Confederate Secretary of War. A less just estimate was formed generally at the North, where the victory was not considered so great a one as the capture of Fort Donelson. At all events, the two victories had this important point in common, that each had brought forward a great commander possessed of original thought and the nerve and energy to carry it into execution. A naval victory is none the less striking than won by the army once the reason of the lesser casualties is comprehended, and the cool northern attitude may have been due to the apparent ease with which a very difficult task was accomplished. The capture of New Orleans, a city of 168,000, the chief commercial port and the largest city of the South, a place well known in Europe as an important trading point, made Emperor Napoleon III waver from his intention to recognize the Confederate States and it caused Palmerston to abandon for the moment a project which he may have had constantly in mind of joining with the Emperor in taking steps toward the breaking of the blockade. End of Chapter 3, Part 2 3, Part 3 On April 7th, General John Pope and Flag Officer Foote captured Island No. 10, an important fort on the Mississippi River. The occupation of Corinth compelled the evacuation of Fort Pillow, which opened the river below. In a battle off Memphis, June 6, the Union gunboats defeated the Confederates, securing the occupation of that city. Only the strongholds of Vicksburg and Port Hudson remained to the Confederacy wherewith to dispute the control of the Mississippi River. McClellan, who had failed to take advantage of the demoralization in Richmond after the fall of Donelson, was further delayed by the performance of the Merrimack, but, on the assurance that the Navy Department would hold the ironclad in check by the Monitor and other war vessels, he proceeded to the execution of his plan, a plan over which he and the President had differed from the first. The President desired the advance to be made directly over land, while McClellan proposed to go by water to Fort Monroe and advance on Richmond up the peninsula. It was evident from the discussion that good service could not be had from the General unless the strategy as well as the active command were left to him. Lincoln therefore yielded. 
but lacking sufficient confidence in mcclellan to give him supreme authority the president relieved him of the command of all military departments except the potomac march eleventh and directed the organization of the army into four corps naming the corps commanders himself through a misunderstanding with mcclellan as to the force necessary to cover washington he withheld from him mcdowell's corps of thirty five thousand men in order to ensure the safety of the capital he had previously detached from the army of the potomac a division of ten thousand and sent it to fremont who had owing to the pressure of the radicals upon lincoln been unfortunately entrusted with a command in the shenandoah mountains it is difficult now to see any way out of the unlucky situation in so far as the command of the army of the potomac was concerned no general in sight was fitted to replace mcclellan who possessed in an imminent degree the love and confidence of his soldiers moreover lincoln still held to the belief that when once in the field he would accomplish important results during april eighteen sixty two mcclellan with one hundred thousand men was besieging yorktown the confederates were reorganizing their army and strengthening their fortifications about richmond on april sixth the president telegraphed to mcclellan i think you better break the enemy's line at once a suggestion which the general received with contempt writing to his wife i was much tempted to reply that he had better come and do it himself three days later the president wrote to him in great kindness once more let me tell you it is indispensable to you that you strike a blow i am powerless to help this suggestion and entreaty were of no avail glorious news comes borne on every wind but the south wind wrote hay to nicolay april ninth the little napoleon mcclellan sits trembling before the handful of men at yorktown afraid either to fight or run stanton feels devilish about it he would like to remove him if he thought it would do no one but mcclellan wrote joseph e johnston to lee would have hesitated to attack it is the mature judgment of almost all military authorities that outnumbering the confederates as he did three to one he could at this time have broken their line from the york river to the james and have reached his position on the chickahominy a month earlier than he did he missed his opportunity by april seventeenth the confederates at yorktown numbered fifty three thousand and johnston himself was in command from this time on nothing but scientific siege operations was feasible and as mcclellan was a capable engineer these were undoubtedly as good as could have been devised on may third johnston evacuated yorktown he was followed on the retreat by the union forces who brought on a battle at williamsburg resulting in their defeat on may twenty first mcclellan was in camp on the chickahominy seven to twelve miles from richmond he had in the meantime received a reinforcement by water of franklin's division of mcdowell's corps and the promise of the rest of this body thirty-five to forty thousand strong who were now opposite fredericksburg preparatory to joining him by an overland march shortly previous to this directly after the destruction of the merrimac an advance of the monitor and a number of gunboats of the james alarmed richmond fearing the fate of new orleans people packed their trunks and crowded the railroad trains in their flight from the city the government archives were packed for removal to lynchburg and columbia the families of the confederate cabinet officers fled to their homes and davis sent his wife and children to raleigh he himself received baptism at his house and the rite of confirmation in st paul's church he appointed by proclamation a day for solemn prayer the richmond examiner a bitter critic of davis's acts spoke of him as standing in a corner telling his beads and relying on a miracle to save the country had mcclellan realized the importance of celerity as did grant and farragut he would have made an attack upon richmond in cooperation with the navy he had a good chance to take it but in case of failure he had behind him the authority of the president who had written to him that he must strike a blow while mcclellan dallied before richmond robert e lee planned and stonewall jackson conducted a series of maneuvers in the course of which playing on lincoln's anxiety for washington they succeeded in bringing to naught the plan for the reinforcement by mcdowell of the army of the potomac on may eighth jackson defeated a detachment of fremont's sending this word to richmond god blessed our arms with victory having bigger game in sight than fremont's army he retraced his steps for the purpose of cooperating with ewell in an attack upon banks in the shenandoah valley when he made this junction he had seventeen thousand men an index of jackson's character is to be found in two of the books he had constantly with him the bible and napoleon's maxims of war 
He interpreted the Bible literally and was guided by its precepts. Piety pervaded his being. Religion was the affair of every moment. He prayed frequently for divine guidance in the most trivial affairs of life. But for his strategy he had recourse not to Joshua, but to Napoleon. He read and re-read these maxims so that he had for the theory of his profession the best of masters. The result of his study was seen in the Shenandoah campaign, which was truly Napoleonic. Celerity and secrecy were his watchwords. He sometimes marched with his whole army thirty miles in twenty-four hours, and his infantry became known as Jackson's foot cavalry. Himself apparently incapable of fatigue, he seemed to think that everybody should equal his endurance. After a sleepless night, a long march, hard fighting, he would say to his officers, We must push on, we must push on. Moreover, he converted his cavalry into mounted riflemen. To mystify, mislead, and surprise was his precept. To hurl overwhelming numbers at the point where the enemy least expects attack was his practice. On May 23rd, he swooped upon a detachment of Banks' forces at Front Royal and put it to rout, capturing a large part of it. Banks himself was then at Strasbourg with 6,800, but next day, fearing that his retreat would be cut off, he ran a race with Jackson to Winchester. The pursuit was hot, but the fighting of his rear guard prevented his capture, and he reached Winchester first. During these two days, however, Jackson had produced big results. The War Department in Washington received dispatch after dispatch from the theater of operations, each more alarming than the last. Reinforcements were ordered to Banks from Baltimore. Harper's Ferry sent him a portion of its garrison. Until May 24th, the faulty disposition of the Union forces was largely due to orders from the War Department coming in Stanton's name. Now the President tried his hand at strategy. He directed Fremont to move into the Shenandoah Valley to a point in Jackson's rear. He suspended the order which had been given to McDowell to unite with McClellan and instructed him to send 20,000 men to the Shenandoah Valley to assist Fremont in the capture of Jackson. Or, if Fremont should be late, he suggested that McDowell's force alone would be sufficient to accomplish the object. At daybreak on Sunday, May 25th, Jackson routed Banks at Winchester, gave hot pursuit to the mass of disordered fugitives, was at one time on the point of destroying the entire force, and finally drove them across the Potomac River. There were never more grateful hearts in the same number of men, wrote Banks, than when at midday of the 26th we stood at the opposite shore. The dispatches sent to Washington on the Sunday came chiefly from panic-stricken men and greatly alarmed the President and the Secretary of War. The main objective, which on Saturday had been the capture of Jackson's army, was now mixed with fear for the safety of the capital. Intelligence from various quarters leaves no doubt that the enemy in great force are marching on Washington, telegraphed Stanton to the several governors of the northern states. You will please organize and forward all the militia and volunteer force in your state. This dispatch and the response to it reflecting the alarm at the Capitol caused wild excitement at the North, which was afterwards spoken of in Massachusetts as the Great Scare, elsewhere as the Great Stampede. The militia and home guards of many of the states were called out. A number of regiments, among them the 7th New York, were hurried to Baltimore and to Harper's Ferry. It was called the Third Uprising of the North. The President took military possession of all the railroads in the country. I think the time is near, said Lincoln in a dispatch to McClellan, when you must either attack Richmond or give up the job and come to the defense of Washington. Part of McDowell's force was recalled to the capital city. Our condition is one of considerable danger, wrote Stanton, as we are stripped to supply the army of the Potomac and now have the enemy here. By May 26, the President and Secretary of War deemed Washington secure. In fact, the capital had at no time been in danger. Lee and Jackson had no further design than to threaten it, and so caused the President to withhold the reinforcements intended for McClellan. The result fully realized their expectation. But now Jackson himself was in danger. Hearing of the movements for his capture, he began on May 30th a rapid retreat. Through the blessing of an ever-kind providence, he wrote, I passed Strasburg before the Federal armies effected the contemplated junction in my rear. By June 1st, his safety was practically assured. 
followed by the Union troops, he was successful in two engagements with them, after which they desisted from pursuit. Jackson, so Lieutenant Colonel Henderson wrote, fell, as it were, from the skies in the midst of his astonished foes, struck right and left before they could combine and defeated in detail every detachment which crossed his path. With an effective force of but seventeen thousand men, he had within the space of a month won five battles, taken rich spoil and many prisoners, given Washington a scare, and prevented forty thousand men from joining the Union army before Richmond. McClellan seemed to be aware that while Jackson was making havoc in the Shenandoah Valley, he should embrace the opportunity to strike at Johnston. On May 25th, he telegraphed to the President, The time is very near when I shall attack Richmond. McClellan had an army of 100,000. Johnston had 63,000. Yet it is doubtful if McClellan would really have taken the initiative. He never reached his ideal completeness of preparation. While he overestimated the enemy's force, he at the same time depreciated the energy of the Confederate commander. Richmond papers, he telegraphed on May 27th, urge Johnston to attack now he has us away from gunboats. I think he is too able for that. Johnston had exact intelligence of the positions, movements, and numbers of the Union armies. He knew that McClellan had three corps on the north side of the Chickahominy River, and two on the side toward Richmond, and that the purposed reinforcement of the Army of the Potomac by McDowell had been abandoned. He therefore resolved to strike on May 31st at the two corps nearest to Richmond. On the night of the 30th there was a heavy rain turning the treacherous and already high Chickahominy into a torrent and increasing the danger of the divided Union army and the eagerness of Johnston to give battle, despite the roads deep with mud and the consequent difficulty of moving his artillery. At some time after midday he attacked the two corps with vigor, drove them back and came near inflicting on them a crushing defeat, Battle of Fair Oaks or Seven Pines. But General Sumner saved the day. Receiving the order from McClellan to be ready to move at a moment's notice, but comprehending the danger better than his chief and construing the order freely, he at once marched his two divisions to his two bridges, halted and anxiously awaited further commands. Word at last came to cross the river. Sumner's corps went over the swaying and tossing bridges and preserved the Union left wing from rout. The southern army suffered a grievous loss in the severe wounding of General Johnston, who was knocked from his horse by the fragment of a shell near the end of the fight and borne unconscious from the field. On the next day the battle was renewed. The Confederates were driven back, and some of the Union troops pushed forward to within four miles of Richmond. These were from the left wing. Receiving no orders to advance farther, they fell back to the lines they had occupied before the battle. The action of the two days may be summed up as a partial success of Johnston, and in the end a repulse of the Confederates. For nearly a month the Union army lay quietly in camp on the Chickahominy. Their line of pickets ran to within six miles of the city, and the sentinels guarding the Mechanicsville Bridge could read on the guidepost, to Richmond, four and a half miles. McClellan's soldiers could see the spires of Richmond, hear the church bells, and even the clock striking the hour. The Confederate outposts were within musket range. The people of Richmond could see the reflection of the Union camp fires and at times could hear the enemy's bugle calls. The heavy rains continued, and the Chickahominy became a flood. Movements of artillery were difficult. The Union camps were in a swamp, and much illness was caused by the damp and malarious atmosphere and by the soldiers drinking the water of the marshes. For this reason, there was, from June 1st to 20th, a perceptible lowering of the morale of the army. McClellan begged for reinforcements, and in response obtained 21,000 men who came to him by the water route. By the middle of June, the weather was fine and the roads dry. It looked as if the offensive movement so often promised by McClellan would at last be made. Having brought all of his corps but one over to the south side of the river, he probably intended to move by gradual approaches within shelling distance of Richmond, shell the city, and possibly attempt to carry it by assault. McClellan's plan to take Richmond by a siege, wrote Longstreet, was wise enough, and it would have been a success if the Confederates had consented to such a program. On account of Johnston's disability, Robert E. Lee was placed in command of the Army of Northern Virginia, as it became known shortly afterwards. Johnston had been a capable commander, but Lee at once began to show that genius for leadership which distinguished him throughout the war. 
Furthermore, he had none of the arrogance that sometimes accompanies great military parts. He got on well with everybody, and it was especially important that complete harmony should exist between himself and Jefferson Davis and Jackson. Johnston had quarreled with his president, and their correspondence bristled with controversy. But no one could quarrel with Lee, who in his magnanimity and deference to his fellow workers resembled Lincoln. When Stonewall Jackson, who had been eager for reinforcements, heard of Lee's appointment, he said to a friend, Well, madam, I am reinforced at last. Lee had a talent for organization equal to that of McClellan. In reading the orders, the dispatches, the history of the army at this time, one seems to feel that he infused a new energy into the management of affairs. Making a careful survey of the position of his army, he directed that it be at once strongly fortified. He had some difficulty in overcoming the aversion to manual labor which obtained among the southern soldiers, but his constant personal superintendence and his pleasing authoritative manner accomplished wonders. Soon his defensive works were well under way. At the same time he was becoming better acquainted with his officers and winning their respect, for he was unremitting in industry and rode over his lines nearly every day. He decided that an assault upon McClellan's left wing, the corps on the south side of the river, was injudicious if not impracticable. It would be, to use Davis's words, putting the breasts of our men in antagonism to the enemy's heaps of earth. On the other hand, information gained by his cavalry and a personal reconnaissance of the Union position north of the Chickahominy led him to form the plan of striking at the Union force on that side of the river. He reinforced Jackson, who was still in the Shenandoah Valley, and asked him to move toward Richmond in order to join in the attack. Jackson, leaving his army fifty miles away, with orders to continue their swift and stealthy march, rode rapidly to Richmond, where at midday on June 23rd he met Lee, Longstreet, D. H. Hill, and A. P. Hill in council. Lee set forth his plan of battle and assigned to each of his generals the part he should play. Jackson said that he would be ready to begin his attack on the morning of the 26th. Fitz John Porter, commanding the Fifth Corps, held the Union position on the north side of the Chickahominy, the right wing, where he protected the line of communication with the base of supplies at White House. At him and his communications Lee struck. Through unavoidable delays Jackson was half a day late. A. P. Hill waited until three o'clock in the afternoon of June 26 for Jackson to perform his part. Then, fearing longer delay, he crossed the river and came directly in front of Porter, bringing on a battle in which the Confederates met with a bloody repulse. McClellan went to Porter's headquarters in the afternoon or early evening while the battle was still on. They knew that the attack had come from Lee's immediate command, and also that Jackson was near, would unite with the other Confederate forces and probably give battle on the morrow. On returning to his own headquarters on the south side of the river, McClellan made up his mind that Porter's position was untenable, and ordered him to withdraw to ground that had been selected east of Gaines Mill, where he could protect the bridges across the Chickahominy, which connected the Union right and left wings, and were indispensable should a further retreat become necessary. Porter received this word at about two o'clock in the morning, and at daylight began the movement, which was executed without serious molestation and in perfect order. He sent word by Barnard, the chief engineer of the army, who had conducted him to the new position, that he needed additional troops. This request, although of the utmost importance as matters turned out, never reached McClellan. Barnard came to headquarters about nine or ten in the morning, and being informed that the commanding general was reposing made no attempt to see him. Different from the habit of most generals when a morning battle is imminent, McClellan was not stirring at an early hour. Nevertheless, it is remarkable that Barnard, having apparently no special duty elsewhere, did not await his general's convenience to impart Porter's reasonable request. Conditions were different on the Confederate side. Jackson had neither rest nor sleep, but, reviewing his preparations, paced his chamber in anxious thought, wrestling with God in prayer. On this Friday, June 27th, was fought the Battle of Gaines Mill. Porter, who had under him at the commencement of the battle but twenty-five thousand men, contented against Jackson, Longstreet, and the two hills whose combined forces amounted to fifty-seven thousand. Lee was in immediate command. In their first onset, the Confederates met with a stubborn resistance and were driven back. At two o'clock in the afternoon, Porter called for reinforcements, and McClellan, who did not visit the field of battle that day but remained at the headquarters on the south side of the Chickahominy, sent a division of nine thousand men to his support. 
cool and collected as on parade, his tactics seemingly without defect even in the heat of the contest, Fitz John Porter was everywhere inciting his officers and men to supreme efforts. He succeeded in repelling the assaults of nearly double his numbers, directed by the genius of Lee and Stonewall Jackson, and led by the courage and determination of the Hills and Longstreet. Higher praise no general can receive than that which Lee and Jackson unconsciously gave Porter in their reports. The principal part of the Federal Army was now on the north side of the Chickahominy, wrote Lee. Both speak of the superior force of the enemy. All accounts agree as to the discipline and bravery of the soldiers of both armies. The impetuous attack of the Confederates may be described in the words that Jackson used of one of his regiments as an almost matchless display of daring and valor. He well characterized the defense as stubborn resistance and sullen obstinacy. George G. Meade and John F. Reynolds, commanders of brigades, made their mark that day. From Lee's statement, the principal part of the Federal Army was now on the north side of the Chickahominy. The inference is clear that had he been in McClellan's place, he would have had it there. McClellan's error was due to his overestimate of the Confederate force. Relying upon the report of the Chief of the Secret Service Corps, he believed it to be 180,000, of whom 70,000 were attacking Porter, while 110,000 lay behind entrenchments between him and Richmond. As a matter of fact, 57,000 were assailing Porter, while about 30,000 held the earthworks protecting Richmond. These last led McClellan and his corps commanders into a gross exaggeration of their number by attacking their pickets from time to time, and by frequently opening fire on their works with artillery. McClellan's timid tactics are revealed in his hesitation in reinforcing Porter. He loved Porter, and would have rejoiced without a spark of envy to see him win a glorious victory. His dispatches show how anxious he was to give him efficient support, and purely military considerations should have induced him to send large reinforcements to Porter's aid. His telegram to the Secretary of War at the close of the day that he was attacked by greatly superior numbers in all directions on this side, the Richmond side of the Chickahominy, remains an ineffaceable record of his misapprehension. Skillful though the leader, brave though the men, 34,000 without entrenchments, with barriers only erected along a small portion of their front, could not finally prevail against 57,000 equally brave and as skillfully led. The end came at about seven o'clock. Lee and Jackson ordered a general assault. The Confederates broke the Union line, captured many cannon, and forced Porter's troops back to the woods on the bank of the Chickahominy. Two brigades of Sumner's Corps, who had been tardily sent to the support of their comrades, efficiently covered the retreat of the exhausted and shattered regiments who withdrew dejectedly to the south side of the river. In his dispatches during the battle, McClellan does not betray panic. At five o'clock he thought Porter might hold his own until dark, and three hours later his confidence was only a little shaken. But by midnight he had reached a state of demoralization, which revealed itself in his famous savage station dispatch to the Secretary of War. I now know the full history of the day, he wrote. On this side of the river, the right bank, we repulsed several strong attacks. On the left bank men did all that men can do, all that soldiers could accomplish, but they were overwhelmed by vastly superior numbers even after I brought my last reserves into action. The loss on both sides is terrible. The sad remnants of my men behave as men. I have lost this battle because my force was too small. I feel too earnestly tonight. I have seen too many dead and wounded comrades to feel otherwise than that the government has not sustained this army. If you do not do so now, the game is lost. If I save this army now, I tell you plainly that I owe no thanks to you or to any other persons in Washington. You have done your best to sacrifice this army. The news was a terrible blow to the President. His finally equipped army, costing such a tale of treasure and labor, had gone forth with high hope of conquest and bearing, so it seemed, the fate of the Union on its shoulders. Now it was defeated and in serious danger of destruction or capture. This calamity the head of the nation must face, and he failed not. Overlooking the spirit of insubordination in his general's dispatch, he sent him a reply as wise as it was gentle. With equal forbearance and circumspection, he offered the most charitable explanation possible of the disaster. Save your army at all events, he wrote. We'll send reinforcements as fast as we can. 
I feel any misfortune to you and your army quite as keenly as you feel it yourself. If you have had a drawn battle or a repulse, it is the price we pay for the enemy not being in Washington. We protected Washington and the enemy concentrated on you. Had we stripped Washington, he would have been upon us before the troops could have gotten to you. It is the nature of the case, and neither you nor the government are to blame. As the Battle of Gaines Mill ended the offensive attitude of the Army of the Potomac, some general considerations will here be in place. Nearly all writers agree that McClellan should have strongly reinforced Porter, who in that event could have held his own until night when he could have made an orderly retreat. He might even have won the battle. If McClellan had known of Lee's division of the Confederate force, he would of course have followed the plan of the military critics. Nevertheless, there is no doubt that his judgment was bad on the basis of such information as he possessed. This may be affirmed after conceding that by no possible means could he have gained the correct knowledge of the enemy which Lee had of the Union forces. If I were mindful only of my own glory, wrote Frederick the Great, I would choose always to make war in my own country, for there every man is a spy and the enemy can make no movement of which I am not informed. This advantage was Lee's but in addition he understood McClellan. Only in dealing with a timid commander would he have so divided his force. When Lee was planning the campaign, Davis said, If McClellan is the man I take him for, as soon as he finds that the bulk of our army is on the north side of the Chickahominy, he will not stop to try conclusions with it there, but will immediately move upon his objective point, the city of Richmond. Lee replied, if you will hold him as long as you can at the entrenchment and then fall back on the detached works around the city, I will be upon the enemy's heels before he gets there. No doubt Lee would have been as good as his word, but McClellan neither reinforced Porter properly, nor did he take advantage of his general's gallant fight to advance on Richmond. The dispatches between McClellan and his officers on the south side of the river during the day of the battle show that they were paralyzed, so far as an offensive movement was concerned by vigorous demonstrations of the troops guarding the Confederate capital. Some writers have thought that while Porter was engaged with the larger Confederate force, McClellan could easily have gone into Richmond. But as Lee's entire army was now fully equal in number to McClellan's, it is difficult to regard such a movement as other than extremely hazardous. The reinforcement of Porter was more prudent. Moreover, to take toll from the Army of Northern Virginia was, as Lincoln perceived, quite as effective offensive work as the capture of Richmond. No speculation is necessary to explain why the Confederates were successful. Their victory was due to the greater ability of Lee and Jackson. Lieutenant Colonel Henderson, in his enthusiasm over Jackson's Valley Campaign, wrote, The brains of Lee and Jackson did more for the Confederacy than 200,000 soldiers for the Union. Although this remark need not be taken literally, the germ of the truth is in it. They greatly excelled their adversary both in strategy and tactics. McClellan was never on the battlefield, not through a lack of physical courage, since in making reconnaissances he was cool under fire, but because he could not endure the sight of blood. Jackson, wrote Lieutenant Colonel Henderson, rode along the line of battle with as much composure as if the hail of bullets was no more than summer rain. Lee loved the fight and yearned to be in it. His own son, as well as President Davis and other friends, remonstrated with him for exposing himself to danger and once, when he was for leading a charge himself, his men cried out, General Lee, to the rear! It is well war is so terrible, he once said. We should grow too fond of it. The match between Lee and Jackson on one side and McClellan on the other was unequal, and McClellan, of course, went down. Into the dispute between him and Lincoln's friends touching the withdrawal of troops from his command and the alleged failure properly to reinforce him, we need not go further than to refer to one point which the general made. But for an unwise order of the Secretary of War, there would have been troops enough for all. Emboldened by the Union successes, he stopped recruiting on April 3rd, at a time when it was not difficult to get men and when the impulse to volunteer should not have been checked. But no matter how many troops had been given to McClellan, he could not have handled them in such a manner as to get the better of Lee and Jackson. It is certain that Lincoln and Stanton desired his success as ardently as he did himself. Although McClellan could not manage 100,000 men on the offensive, he made a masterly retreat. He was able to carry out Lincoln's injunction, Save your army, when a lesser man might have lost it. 
Lee expected to capture or destroy the Union force, but failed to divine McClellan's plan until too late to frustrate it. Convinced as he was that the retreat would be down the peninsula, he neglected to interfere immediately with the movement for a change of base to the James River, which McClellan had determined on making should his communications with White House be severed. On the night of Gaines Mill, he gave the necessary orders to his corps commanders who began their preparations next morning and wrought the whole day without molestation. Six hundred tons of ammunition, food, forage, medical and other supplies were the daily requirements of this army, and the change of base in presence of a victorious foe of equal number was attended with great difficulty, and could not have been made had not the United States had the command of the sea. By sunrise of June 29th, the Confederates discovered that the Union army had fled toward the James River, and they started in immediate pursuit, bringing on a fight at Savage's Station in which they were repulsed. Next day was fought the stubborn battle of Glendale or Fraser's Farm, in which neither side prevailed, although the Union troops continued their retreat in good order. It was thought that if Jackson had come up at the time he was expected, a portion of McClellan's army would have been destroyed or captured. The morning of July 1st found the whole Union army posted on Malvern Hill, a strong position near the James River. By noon, the Confederates appeared and attacked with bravery, but were mowed down by the fire of the splendid artillery and the efficiently directed infantry of the Union Army. Porter was in the fight, and his generalship was of a high order. The Confederates were repulsed at all points with a loss double that of the Federals. McClellan was not with his fighting troops in any one of the battles during the retreat, but was doing engineers' work in preparing the position for the next day. In the seven days' battles, as the fighting is called from June 25th to July 1st inclusive, McClellan's loss was 15,849 men, Lee's 20,614. Lee's was naturally the greater as he fought constantly on the offensive, but the victory was his as he had driven the enemy away from Richmond. In these seven days, Lee's soldiers began to love him and to acquire a belief that he was invincible, a belief which lasted almost to the very end of the war. Next day after Malvern Hill, McClellan with his army retired to Harrison's Landing, a safe position on the James River, where he might have the help of gunboats and where the Navy ensured him constant communication with the North. But from being in sight of the steeples of Richmond, he was now twenty to twenty-five miles away. His peninsular campaign had been a failure. McClellan wrote Meade privately of his friend six months later, was always waiting to have everything just as he wanted before he would attack and before he could get things arranged as he wanted them, the enemy pounced on him and thwarted all his plans. Such a general will never command success, though he may avoid disaster. On July 8th, Lee fell back to his old quarters in the vicinity of Richmond. Our success, he wrote to his wife, has not been so great or complete as we could have desired, but God knows what is best for us. Nevertheless, all conditions united to brighten the hopes of the South. To the work of conscription which was urged with vigor, a response seemed assured that would show the enthusiasm of the people to have been quickened by their army's success. End of chapter 3 4. Part 1 That war is an economic waste is a commonplace. That the man is much more valuable than the dollar a truism, for the great evil of war is the killing of men. Homer's thought when speaking of a lusty stripling who was smitten to the death cannot fail to occur. He repaid not his dear parents by the recompense of his nurture. It is the tragedy of war that the high-spirited men are at the front and the skulkers in the rear, that the hearts of a large number of men are not in the fight, and these flee from danger, saying with Falstaff, the better part of valor is discretion, in the which part I have saved my life. In the course of this story, we have seen how civilians were made into soldiers to fight bloody battles which presaged still greater sacrifices, and a carnage of nearly three more years. We have now to consider another factor in the situation, to wit, money which has come to mean the sinews of war. It was indispensable that the United States should keep up its credit among nations, and this in view of its daily expenditure having increased from $178,000 to a million and a half dollars was work requiring the highest kind of financial ability. 
Until December 31, 1861, the war had been carried on by the placing of loans through the cooperation of the United States Treasury and the banks, and by the issue of about 25 millions of United States notes payable on demand without interest. All transactions had been on a specie basis. But the loans had exhausted the resources of the banks, and at the end of the year 1861, they were obliged to suspend specie payments, leaving the government in the same plight. At home and in England it was thought that national bankruptcy was threatened. By the end of January 1862 there were 100 million of accrued indebtedness and further requirements to June 30th of 250 to 300 millions. Both popular sentiment and congressional resolution approved heavy direct and indirect taxation, but it was certain that no tax bill could be framed and got to work in time to meet the pressing exigency. The expedient finally adopted was a striking innovation in finance. Congress authorized the Secretary of the Treasury to issue 150 million United States Treasury notes payable to bearer, not bearing interest, and made these notes a legal tender for all debts, public and private. Action so unprecedented was not taken without serious consideration and debate. Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury, came with reluctance to the conclusion that the legal tender clause is a necessity. The two best financial authorities in the Senate, John Sherman and William Pitt Fessenden, the chairman of the Committee on Finance, differed, Sherman favoring the cause, Fessenden opposing it. Fessenden wrote in a private letter, This legal tender clause is opposed to all my views of right and expediency. It shocks all my notions of political, moral, and national honor. The argument which prevailed was urged by Thaddeus Stevens, chairman of the House Committee of Ways and Means. This bill is a measure of necessity, not of choice. Sumner came to its support, but warned the Senate that the medicine of the Constitution must not become its daily bread. Sumner, Sherman, and many others, perhaps most of the Senators and Representatives favoring it, regarded the measure as only a temporary expedient. But the apparent ease of solving a financial difficulty by making irredeemable paper a legal tender acted like a stimulant which called for repeated doses. Additional legal tenders, which became known as greenbacks, were authorized and issued until January 3, 1864, when the amount reached but a little short of 450 millions. The Act of February 25, 1862, under which the first legal tenders were issued, authorized also the issue of 500 millions, 5 to 26 percent bonds, into which these legal tender notes might be funded. Interest on these bonds was payable in coin, for which the duties on foreign imports, payable in the same medium, were pledged. It is impossible to read the debates covering the Legal Tender Act without recognizing the patriotic note. The advocates felt that it was necessary to avoid bankruptcy and to carry on the military and naval operations. True enough, we see its ill effects in increasing the cost of the war and in debauching the public mind with the idea that the government could create money by its fiat and we know not what would have been the result of the alternative scheme. But as the legal tender clause was opposed to sound principles of finance and to valuable precedent, it might have been worth while to try the other plan first. It was generally conceded that treasury notes must be issued. The difference arose on the proposition to make them a full legal tender. With the issue of the amount deemed necessary and made legal tender only as between the government and the public, even as Pitt had restricted that quality of the Bank of England notes during the Napoleonic Wars, it is reasonable to suppose that the war might have been carried on for six months or a year longer and possibly to the end. Provided also that the Secretary of the Treasury had made a proper construction of Section 2 of the Act of February 25th, which authorized him to dispose of the five hundred millions, five to twenty-six percents, at their market value for coin or for treasury notes. Chase construed market value to mean par, the result of this construction being very different from what would have been obtained if the bonds had been sold in the market for what they would fetch. The difference of the plans was the difference between a forced loan without interest and a voluntary loan secured by selling the bonds at their real market value. Our financiers who carried through their scheme were victims of the illusion that to make money by legislation was cheaper and better than to obtain it by bargaining. Congress at this session authorized the President to take possession of the railroads and telegraph lines when necessary for the public safety, and it created a comprehensive and searching scheme of internal taxation, which became a law by the President's approval on July 1st and may be briefly described as an act taxing everything framed on the principle 
Whenever you find an article, a product, a trade, a profession, or a source of revenue, tax it. This Congress was further notable in imposing for the first time in our history a graduated federal income tax, a tax of 3% on incomes less than $10,000, and of 5% on incomes over 10000 with an exemption of $600 was laid, although certain deductions were permitted in making the return. The tax upon the incomes of citizens residing abroad was 5% without the usual exemptions. The duties on imports were increased by an act approved by the President on July 14th. Lincoln was not an adept in finance and left this department to his Secretary of the Treasury, who, in spite of mistakes and some personal failings, made a good finance minister. In diplomatic matters, Lincoln's hand may be traced and generally for the good. He was a hard student of the art of war and through untoward circumstances and miserable failures groped his way to the correct method of conducting large military operations but from the first he handled the slavery question with scarcely a flaw the action of congress during the spring and early summer of eighteen sixty two indicated the progress of public sentiment since the first shot at sumter the republicans in neither of their national platforms had deemed it prudent to demand the abolition of slavery in the district of columbia but in April, Congress enacted this, providing at the same time for compensation to the loyal owners of the slaves, which was duly made. In June, it crystallized in a formal statute the cardinal principle of the Republican Party, the very reason of its existence, by prohibiting slavery in all the territories of the United States. Lincoln went further than Congress. As early as March 1862, he proposed the gradual abolishment of all slavery with compensation for the slave owners and Congress adopted his recommendation. This offer was made during the military successes of the North and though as a practical measure, there was no expectation that any but the Union border slave states would avail themselves of it, the offer was open to all. And if the people of any or all of the Confederate states had at this time laid down their arms and respected the authority of the national government, they would have received, in a plan of gradual emancipation, about $400 for each slave set free. Lincoln measured the steps forward with discretion and kept the determination of the slavery question entirely in his own hands. On May 9th, General Hunter, who commanded the Department of the South, issued an order declaring free all the slaves in South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. Lincoln heard of this a week later through the newspapers, and at the same time received a letter from Chase, saying that in his judgment the order should be suffered to stand. The President replied to his secretary, No commanding general shall do such a thing upon my responsibility without consulting me, and on May 19th he issued a proclamation declaring Hunter's order void. In this proclamation, he made an earnest appeal to the people of the Union border slave states to give freedom gradually to their slaves and accept the compensation proffered them by himself and Congress. I do not argue, he said. I beseech you to make arguments for yourselves. You cannot, if you would, be blind to the signs of the times. The abolition of slavery contemplated would come gently as the dews of heaven, not renting or wrecking anything. Then came the utter failure of McClellan's campaign, which convinced the President that slavery must be struck at. He grew eager to develop his policy of gradual emancipation of the slaves, compensation of their owners by the federal government, and colonization of the freed Negroes in Haiti, South America, and Liberia. For he believed that the abolition of slavery by the slave states in the Union would make it difficult for the Southern Confederacy to maintain the contest much longer. Before Congress adjourned, he invited the senators and representatives of the Union border slave states to the White House, July 12, and asked them earnestly to influence their states to adopt his policy. If the war continues long, he said, slavery in your states will be extinguished by the mere incidents of the war. It will be gone and you will have nothing valuable in lieu of it. How much better for you and for your people to take the step which at once shortens the war and secures substantial compensation for that which is sure to be wholly lost in any other event. He told them of the pressure upon him to interfere with slavery and of the dissatisfaction with him by the radical supporters of the government, threatening division among those united are none too strong. Our common country is in great peril, he continued and as lofty views and bold action on their part would bring speedy relief, he begged them to emancipate their slaves. But Lincoln was unable to secure the assent of the border states to his plan. 
bound up as was slavery with their social and political life they could not understand that its doom was certain the lack of military success hampered the president in this as in all other action it was a part of the plan that payment for the slaves should be made in united states six per cent bonds and though property in negroes had become admittedly precarious the question must have suggested itself in view of the enormous expenditure of the government the recent military reverses and the present strength of the confederacy whether the nation's promises to pay were any more valuable gold now become a measure of the union fortune sold on june third at three and one half per cent premium on july twelfth owing to mcclellan's defeat and the further authorized issue of paper money it fetched fourteen per cent but it is certain that if the border slaves had acted promptly they would have received for their slaves a fair compensation in united states bonds instead of having subsequently to sustain a flat monetary loss through the gift of freedom to the negroes during a drive to the funeral of secretary stanton's infant son on the day after his interview with the border state representatives lincoln broached to seward and wells the subject which was uppermost in his mind the reverses before richmond the formidable power of the confederacy convinced him of the necessity of a new policy since the slaves were growing the food for the confederate soldiers and served as teamsters and laborers on entrenchments in the army service he had about come to the conclusion that it was a military necessity absolutely essential for the salvation of the nation that we must free the slaves or be ourselves subdued as he afterwards described the situation things had gone on from bad to worse until i felt that we had reached the end of our rope on the plan of operations we had been pursuing that we had about played our last card and must change our tactics or lose the game on july twenty second lincoln read to his cabinet to the surprise of all probably except seward and wells a proclamation of emancipation which he purposed to issue reiterating that the object of the war was the restoration of the union he proposed emancipation as a fit and necessary military measure for effecting this object seward pleaded for a delay fearing that on account of the depression of the public mind the proclamation might be viewed as the last measure of an exhausted government a cry for help the government stretching forth its hands to ethiopia in a last shriek on the retreat now while i approve the measure he added i suggest sir that you postpone its issue until you can give it to the country supported by military success instead of issuing it as would the case be now upon the greatest disasters of the war the president had not seen the matter in this light struck with the wisdom of seward's objection he put the draft of the proclamation aside waiting for a victory the secret of this conference was well kept and the radicals not knowing that lincoln was disposed to go as far as they wished continued their criticism what a pity wrote charles elliot norton that the president should not have issued a distinct and telling proclamation thaddeus stevens characterized lincoln's proposal of compensated emancipation as the most diluted milk and water gruel proposition that was ever given to the american nation and declared that the blood of thousands mouldering in untimely graves is upon the souls of this congress and cabinet the administration he said should free the slaves enlist and arm them and set them to shooting their masters if they will not submit to this government sumner restlessly pacing up and down his room exclaimed with uplifted hand i pray that the president may be right in delaying but i am afraid i am almost sure he is not i trust his fidelity but i cannot understand him carl schurz sympathized with sumner and criticized the president for not adopting the policy of immediate emancipation but afterwards frankly confessed that lincoln was wiser than he greeley in his prayer of twenty millions printed in the new york tribune said to the president we complain that the union cause has suffered and is now suffering immensely from your mistaken deference to rebel slavery this gave the president an opportunity for a public reply august twenty two my paramount object in this struggle he wrote is to save the union and is not either to save or destroy slavery what i do about slavery and the colored race i do because i believe it helps to save the union and what i forbear i forbear because i do not believe it would help to save the union lincoln and greeley may be looked upon as representative exponents of the two policies there was in their personal relations a fundamental lack of sympathy they could not see things alike lincoln knew men greeley did not 
Lincoln had a keen sense of humor. Greeley had none. Indeed, in all their intercourse of many years, Lincoln never told the serious-minded editor an anecdote or joke, for he knew it would be thrown away. Greeley and the Tribune, though not so powerful at this time in forming public opinion as they had been from 1854 to 1860, exerted still a far-reaching influence and gave expression to thoughts rising in the minds of many earnest men. No one knew this better than the President, who, in stating his policy in a public dispatch to Greeley, complimented the editor and those for whom the Tribune spoke. Lincoln's words received the widest publication and were undoubtedly read by nearly every man and woman at the North. They were sound indeed. His position could not have been more cogently put. His policy was right and expedient, appealed to the reason of his people, and inspired their hopes. The months of July and August, 1862, were one of the periods of gloom when the northern people would probably have abandoned the contest had they not had at their head an unfaltering leader like Abraham Lincoln. The retreat to the James was a rude shock to their confidence in McClellan and the Army of the Potomac. When Norton asked George William Curtis, Do you think the army on the James River is safe? He was expressing the anxious solicitude of many, as Lowell put into words the apprehensions of countless others when he wrote, I don't see how we are to be saved but by a miracle. History has answered Norton's question. Will Lincoln be master of the opportunities, or will they escape him? Is he great enough for the time? Schurz wrote to Lincoln that his personal influence upon public opinion, his moral power was immense. This he now used to raise the men necessary to continue the war. From McClellan's dispatch of June 28th, he was convinced that the plan for taking Richmond had failed and that the Union armies must be increased. With a view to starting fresh enlistments, he furnished Seward with a letter making clear the need of additional troops. This letter was used by the Secretary during his journey to New York City, Boston, and Cleveland, in his conferences with men of influence and with the governors of several states. In it Lincoln declared, I expect to maintain this contest until successful, or till I die, or am conquered, or my term expires, or Congress or the country forsakes me. And I would publicly appeal to the country for this new force, were it not that I fear a general panic and stampede would follow, so hard is it to have a thing understood as it really is. The result of Seward's conferences and of his counsel by wire with the President and Secretary of War was a telegram to the governors of the States of the Union asking them to unite in a letter to the President, in which they should request him to call upon the several states for men enough to speedily crush the rebellion. The governors fell in with the plan. The President accepted the patriotic offer, and, after a free interchange of thought between him and Seward and between Seward and the governors, made the call for 300,000 men. From June 28 to July 1st, Lincoln had no news of McClellan, and was in doubt as to the safety of his army for yet two more days. During this period he grew thin and haggard. Sumner in despair wrote to Schertz, I wish you were here to tell the President the true way. In vain will he appeal for troops at the North, so it seems to many of us. I have insisted that the appeal shall be made to the slaves and the rear guard of the rebellion and changed into the advance guard of the Union. A month later, Sumner appreciated the hold Lincoln had on the people, writing to John Bright. The last call for 300,000 men is received by the people with enthusiasm, because it seems to them a purpose to push the war vigorously. There is no thought in the cabinet or the president of abandoning the contest. We shall easily obtain the new levy, wrote Lincoln in a private letter, August 4th. In spite of the misfortunes of the Army of the Potomac, he had the support of the plain people, who shared the enthusiasm of a mass meeting in Chicago that listened to the reading of a poem whose theme was, We are coming, Father Abraham, three hundred thousand more. Gloomy as was the outlook, worse was yet to come owing to further blunders in generalship. What General Meade wrote in May, We must expect disaster so long as the armies are not under one master mind. Lincoln knew perfectly well, and gladly would he have devolved the military conduct of affairs on one man could he have found that mastermind for whom he made a painful quest during almost two years. The armies of the West, as contrasted with the Army of the Potomac, had accomplished positive results, and to the ability there developed he looked for aid. He brought John Pope from the West, where he had achieved an inconsiderable victory and made him commander of the Army of Virginia, composed of the Corps of McDowell, Banks, and Fremont. 
At the same time, he appointed Halleck general-in-chief of the whole land forces of the United States with headquarters in Washington. It is difficult to comprehend the assignment of Pope, whose reported wonderful military operations on the Mississippi and at Corinth had not somehow been fully substantiated. Admiral Foote used to laugh at his gasconade and bluster. Halleck's promotion is easily understood. He had received much more than his share of the glory for the capture of Forts Henry and Donelson. This and his advance upon Corinth gave him the confidence of the country and of most of the army. It is remarkable that there was apparently no thought of three really able generals in the West, Grant, William T. Sherman, and George H. Thomas, whose achievements at the time were greater than Pope's and Halleck's. Pope began his brief career as commander with a tactless address to his army. I have come to you from the West, he said, where we have always seen the backs of our enemies. I presume that I have been called here to pursue the same system and to lead you against the enemy. It is my purpose to do so, and that speedily. He followed his address with four published orders, one of which was unjustifiable and impossible of execution, and the other three unnecessary. Lee at once began the study of Pope. Frederick the Great wrote Carlyle, always got to know his man after fighting him a month or two, and took liberties with him or did not take accordingly. Learning to comprehend one's adversary was comparatively easy in our civil war, as most of the opposing commanders had been acquainted at West Point or during service in Mexico. Longstreet was graduated in the same class with Pope, and undoubtedly conveyed to Lee his judgment of West Point days that Pope was a handsome, dashing fellow and a splendid cavalryman, who did not apply himself to his books very closely. At all events, Lee accepted the general academic estimate of the new commander as a boastful, ambitious man and not a hard student or a close thinker. When he heard of Pope's address to the army, his estimate was lowered. The federal general had shown contempt for the military maxim of centuries. Do not despise your enemy. End of chapter 4, part 1 4, part 2 McClellan's army was at Harrison's Landing on the James River. He desired that it should be reinforced, after which he would again take the offensive against Richmond. At first the President inclined to the General's view, but he returned from his visit to the army July 8th, perplexed in mind. In May he had told General Meade, I am trying to do my duty, but no one can imagine what influences are brought to bear on me. Conditions in this respect were worse in July. The radicals not only pressed him to make a declaration against slavery, but urged him to remove McClellan, whom they denounced as incompetent or disloyal, and utterly out of sympathy with any attack upon slavery. They had induced the President to give Fremont another command after he had shown his incapacity in Missouri. They had another favorite in Benjamin F. Butler. But Pope had a military education which the others lacked and seemed to be equally zealous against slavery. Stanton and Chase desired the President to remove McClellan and send Pope to take command of the army on the James River. This he declined to do, but he offered the command of the Army of the Potomac to Burnside, who peremptorily declined it. On July 23rd, Halleck reached Washington, went next day to the headquarters of the Army of the Potomac, and had a frank talk with McClellan, who, eager to remain on the James River, said that with a reinforcement of twenty to thirty thousand he would cross the James River, attack Petersburg, an important railway center, and cut the communication between Richmond and the states farther south. Halleck did not approve this plan, and on his return to Washington the President, guided by his and other advice, determined to withdraw McClellan's army to Aquia Creek in spite of the General's warm protest. Then Lee decided to attack Pope, who, well informed and wary, retreated before the superior Confederate force. Lee, watching the movement from a hill, said to Longstreet, with a sigh of disappointment, General, we little thought that the enemy would turn his back upon us thus early in the campaign. The rest of Pope's campaign consisted of a series of blunders on his part aggravated by the indecision of Halleck, who evinced an utter incapacity for directing the movements of the two armies. There was also a lack of hearty cooperation with Pope by the Army of the Potomac. Halleck, Pope, the President, Stanton, Chase, and McClellan all had a hand in the management of the troops. Against these contented one able head, Lee, who had two powerful arms in Jackson and Longstreet. By a swift march, Jackson got in Pope's rear, 
tore up the railroad and cut the telegraph wires, severing his line of supplies and direct telegraph communication with Washington, but before Pope could catch him, he had fled and taken up a position to await calmly Longstreet's arrival. Pope, reinforced by two corps from the Army of the Potomac, attacked the Confederates on August 29th and was repulsed, although he thought that he had gained a victory. In pursuance of this illusion, he brought on next day the second battle of Bull Run, wherein, acting as if in obedience to Lee's own wishes, he delivered himself into the enemy's hands, met with a crushing defeat, which became a rout, the men fleeing in panic from the field. The common belief in Washington was that Pope had, on August 29th, won a great victory. Everything seemed to be going well and hilarious on Saturday, August 30th, wrote John Hay in his diary, and we went to bed expecting glad tidings at sunrise. But about eight o'clock the President came to my room as I was dressing and calling me out said, Well, John, we are whipped again, I am afraid. The enemy reinforced on Pope and drove back his left wing, and he has retired to Centerville, where he says he will be able to hold his men. I don't like that expression. I don't like to hear him admit that his men need holding. The dispatches from Pope were indeed alarming. In one of them he asked whether Washington were secure if his army should be destroyed. In another he disclosed his lack of confidence in the Army of the Potomac and its officers' lack of confidence in him. McClellan, who was now at Alexandria, did not regard Washington as safe against the rebels. If I can quietly slip over there, he said in a letter to his wife, I will send your silver off. September 2nd was an anxious day in Washington. Early in the morning came a dispatch from Pope telling a sad tale of demoralization of his own army and of excessive straggling from many regiments of the Army of the Potomac. Unless something can be done, he continued, to restore tone to this army, it will melt away before you know it. The President knew the one remedy, and, in spite of the bitter opposition and remonstrance he was certain to encounter, placed McClellan, who, in the shifting of troops, had been deprived of all actual authority in command of all the soldiers for the defense of the capital. Halleck had already ordered Pope to bring his forces within or near the lines of the fortifications. There his authority passed to McClellan. In view of the great danger to Washington, Halleck asked that all the available troops be sent as rapidly as possible to the capital. A number of gunboats were ordered up the river and anchored at different points in proximity to the city, and a war steamer was brought to the Navy Yard. All the clerks and employees of the civil departments and all employees in the public buildings were called to arms for the defense of Washington. The sale of spirituous liquors at retail within the District of Columbia was prohibited. It was a moment of acute anxiety. McClellan, elated at being called to the rescue, went forward to meet his soldiers. Encountering J.D. Cox, he said, Well, General, I am in command again. Warm congratulations ensued. The two rode on until they met the advancing column of the army, Pope and McDowell at its head. When it became known that McClellan had been placed in command, cheers upon cheers from the head to the rear of the column were given with wild delight. Inspired by the confidence of his men, he wrought with zeal. His talent for organization had full play, and in a few days he had his army ready for an active campaign. Lincoln's comment was, McClellan is working like a beaver. He seems to be aroused to doing something by the sort of snubbing he got last week. At the cabinet meeting of September 2nd, the opposition to McClellan broke forth. Stanton, trembling with excitement, spoke with a suppressed voice. Chase maintained that as a military commander McClellan had been a failure, that his neglect to urge forward reinforcements to Pope proved him unworthy of trust, and that giving command to him was equivalent to giving Washington to the rebels. This and more, I said, said down Chase in his diary. All the members of the cabinet except Seward, who was out of the city, and Blair, expressed a general concurrence. Lincoln was distressed and perplexed. He would gladly resign his place the presidency, but he could not see who could do the work wanted as well as McClellan. Chase replied that either Hooker, Sumner, or Burnside could do it better. The president again offered the command of the army in the field to Burnside, who again declined it, saying, I do not think that there is anyone who can do as much with that army as McClellan, if matters can be so arranged as to remove your and the Secretary of War's objection to him. At the cabinet meeting two days later, September 4th, all the members present except Blair were unanimous against McClellan, 
and almost ready to denounce the president for reinstating him in command. On the morrow, Lincoln said to John Hay, McClellan has acted badly in this matter, but we must use what tools we have. There is no man in the army who can man these fortifications and lick these troops of ours into shape as well as he. Unquestionably he has acted badly toward Pope. He wanted him to fail. That is unpardonable. But he is too useful now to sacrifice. And at another time Lincoln said, If he can't fight himself, he excels in making others ready to fight. The intelligence came that Lee with his army was crossing the Potomac into Maryland. The Union troops must be sent in pursuit, and a commander for them must be designated. The President said to McClellan, General, you will take command of the forces in the field. To Pope was sent an order which ended his service as a general in the Civil War. Nothing is easier than to point out the mistakes in a military campaign after the event, but some contemporary expressions disclose the fact that, in trusting so much to Halleck and to Pope, the President was leaning on broken reeds. Wells thought that Halleck's mind was heavy and irresolute, that he did not possess originality, and had little real military talent. Admiral Foote, who was under Halleck in the West, insisted that he was a military imbecile, though he might make a good clerk. Montgomery Blair, who knew Pope intimately, said of him in the cabinet meeting of September 2nd, He is a braggart and a liar with some courage, perhaps, but not much capacity. And in the meeting of September 12th, he declared that Pope ought never to have been entrusted with such a command as that in front. McClellan, Blair also said, is not the man, but he is the best among the major generals. We have offers of capacity, depend upon it, and they should be hunted out and brought forward. The Secretary of War should dig up these jewels. And one of the men Blair had in mind was William T. Sherman. Let us take a look at Lee, as Longstreet saw him in these days. Instead of the well-formed, dignified soldier mounted at the head of his troops, and exhibiting in every movement the alertness and vigor of rich manhood, we have now before us the closet student, poring over his maps and papers, with an application so intense as sometimes to cause his thoughts to run no longer straight. Often on these occasions he would send for Longstreet and say that his ideas were working in a circle and that he needed help to find a tangent. He was now at Chantilly in the midst of one of these perplexities. He had no intention of attacking the enemy in his fortifications about Washington, for he could not invest them and could not properly supply his army. He must either fall back to a more convenient base or invade Maryland. In that state, so allied in sympathy with his own, he even hoped for a rising in his favor, but all events deemed it likely that he could annoy and harass the enemy. Should success attend this movement, he proposed to enter Pennsylvania. Perhaps in the chances of war he might destroy McClellan's weakened and demoralized troops and thus conquer a peace. His soldiers were ragged and many of them were destitute of shoes. The army lacked much of the material of war, is feeble in transportation. Still, Lee wrote, we cannot afford to be idle, and he decided to cross the Potomac. Nothing occasioned him uneasiness but supplies of ammunition and subsistence. Desiring the friendly collision with another mind, he talked with Longstreet, who, relating how during the Mexican War, War's division had marched around the city of Monterey on two days' rations of roasting ears and green oranges, thought they now could as safely trust themselves to the fields of Maryland laden with ripening corn and fruit. On September 3rd, Lee began his march northward, and next day wrote to his president that he should proceed with his expedition into Maryland, unless you should signify your disapprobation. But before this word could have reached Richmond, the army of northern Virginia had crossed the Potomac singing, Maryland, my Maryland, and had continued their rollicking march to Frederick City, which was reached on the 6th by the van led by Jackson. We have seen that one of Lee's designs in crossing the Potomac was to give the people of Maryland an opportunity of liberating themselves. He accordingly issued an address to them declaring that the South had watched with deepest sympathy their wrongs and had, seen with profound indignation, their sister state deprived of every right and reduced to the condition of a conquered province. To aid you in throwing off this foreign yoke is the object of our invasion. But he soon perceived that if the people of Maryland were oppressed, they kissed the rod of the oppressor as they gave no signs of rising. The most serious effect of the cold welcome he received was the difficulty in procuring subsistence. 
Lee proposed to pay for his supplies, but all that he had to pay with was Confederate currency or certificates of indebtedness of the Confederate states, and these the farmers, millers, and drovers would not take for their wheat, their flour, and their cattle. The army which had defeated McClellan and Pope could not make the farmers thresh their wheat and the millers grind it, nor prevent the owners of cattle from driving them into Pennsylvania. The citizens of Frederick, caring not for the custom offered them by the officers and soldiers, closed their shops. Lee was hoping to place the Confederacy in a position to propose peace to the northern government and people on the condition that the independence of the southern states should be recognized. The rejection of the offer might help the Democratic Party at the coming fall elections when a new House of Representatives was to be chosen, and might even induce the people to declare for a termination of the conflict. He purposed to attack neither Washington nor Baltimore, but he probably aimed at Harrisburg and the destruction of the long bridge of the Pennsylvania Railroad across the Susquehanna River, which as communication by the Baltimore and Ohio had been severed, would leave no land connection between the eastern and western states except the railroad line along the lakes. At the same time, by drawing the Union forces away from the capital he might, if he defeated them, prevent them from falling back upon the entrenchments of Washington. At no time during the war were Confederate prospects so bright. Kirby Smith had defeated a Union force in Kentucky, had occupied Lexington, and was threatening Louisville and Cincinnati, having pushed a detachment of his army to within a few miles of Covington, one of the Kentucky suburbs of Cincinnati. Bragg, with a large army, had eluded Buell, and was marching northward toward Louisville in the hope that Kentucky would give her adhesion to the Confederacy. Cincinnati and Louisville were excited and alarmed. Lee found out that he could not live upon the country, and decided that he must open a line of communication through the Shenandoah Valley if he would secure adequate supplies of flour. But Harper's Ferry, commanding the valley, was held by a federal garrison, although according to the principles laid down in military books, it should have been abandoned when the Confederate Army crossed the Potomac. Lee had expected and McClellan had advised its evacuation, but Halleck would not give it up. It was a lucky blunder, for Lee was forced on September 10th to divide his army, sending Jackson back into Virginia to capture Harper's Ferry, while he proceeded with Longstreet toward Hagerstown. The state of feeling at the North now approached consternation. That Lee should threaten Washington and Baltimore, then Harrisburg and Philadelphia, while Bragg threatened Louisville and Cincinnati, was a piling up of menace that shook the nerves of the coolest men, and those who were in a position to receive the fullest information were more anxious than the general public, for it was the inner councils of the nation that were the most sorely perturbed. Although the number of the Confederates was exaggerated, their power as an invading army, by virtue of their mobility and the genius of their leaders, was rated none too high. Considering that 55,000 veteran soldiers led by Lee, Jackson, and Longstreet marched out of Frederick with high spirits and confidence of victory, the alarm which spread over the North was no greater than a community so gravely imperiled might be expected to feel. In Washington, the anxiety was no longer so much for the safety of the capital, which was well fortified and garrisoned, as for the danger to the cause. Stanton's uneasiness showed itself in the fear that communication with the North might be cut off. The President said he had felt badly all day, September 8. He was sadly perplexed and distressed. Men in New York City were terrified and panic-stricken. When Lee left Frederick and made directly for Pennsylvania, the farmers on the border sent away their women and children, then their cattle, then armed themselves for the protection of their homes against cavalry raids. The dispatches from Governor Curtin at Harrisburg manifest concern for that capital. He called out 50,000 militia for the defense of the state. The words which came from Philadelphia were such as one expects from a wealthy city in time of panic. The country is very desponding and much disheartened, wrote Wells. It is evident, however, that the reinstatement of McClellan has inspired strength, vigor, and hope in the army. Officers and soldiers appear to be united in his favor and willing to follow his lead. The peril in which the country lay could be averted only by McClellan and his army. McClellan started his troops from Washington on September 5th, he himself following two days later. The necessity of reorganizing his depleted army and of covering Baltimore and Washington, together with his own habitual caution and his uncertainty as to the enemy's movements, caused him to proceed slowly. The morale of the army is very much impaired by recent events. The spirits of the enemy proportionately raised 
wrote General Meade. But fortune turned McClellan's way. Lee's written order, disclosing the division of the Confederate Army and the exact scheme of their march, was sent to three generals, of whom one pinned it securely in an inside pocket, another Longstreet memorized it, and then chewed it up, whilst the third copy was lost, found by a private soldier of the Union Army and at once taken to McClellan, who showed his elation in his dispatch to the President, I have all the plans of the rebels and will catch them in their own trap if my men are equal to the emergency. McClellan acted with energy, but not with the energy that Lee and Jackson would have shown under similar circumstances. He marched his army forward, and on September 14th won the Battle of South Mountain, securing a passage over the South Mountain Range to the field of Antietam. By this victory he restored the morale of the Union Army and gave heart to the President and people of the North. He did not, however, relieve the Harper's Ferry garrison, which fell without a struggle. A citizen friendly to the Confederate cause had been present when Lee's lost order was brought to McClellan. He got an inkling of its importance to the Union Army, made his way through the lines, and after nightfall gave the information to a cavalry officer, who at once transmitted it to the Confederate commander. Having this knowledge before daylight of September 14th, Lee, who was disappointed and concerned at the rapid advance of McClellan, left Hagerstown, disputed the passes of South Mountain, and took up strong position behind the Antietam Creek around the village of Sharpsburg. In the order for the division of the Confederate Army, Jackson and the different detachments acting with him for the capture of Harper's Ferry were directed to join the main body of the army after accomplishing their object. Lee awaited them with his small force. His Maryland campaign so far was a failure. Circumstances had beaten him, and only a decisive victory could bring back that prestige which was his when he marched out of Frederick. Philadelphia and Harrisburg were no longer in danger, but his own army stood in jeopardy. The general opinion is that McClellan should have fought Lee before the Harper's Ferry detachments rejoined him, instead of waiting until September 17th when he had to contend with the whole army. On this day was fought the Battle of Antietam, a day of isolated attacks and wasted efforts. Seventy-five thousand Union soldiers endeavored to overcome fifty-one thousand Confederates, Lee handling the inferior force in a manner absolutely above criticism. The Union loss in killed and wounded was eleven thousand six hundred, the Confederate about the same. The victory was McClellan's, as on September 19th Lee withdrew from the field and recrossed the Potomac into Virginia. At the time it was exasperating to think how much more McClellan might have accomplished, but, as we see it now, no other result was probable as long as McClellan was McClellan and Lee was Lee. Still, to overcome Lee in any way and on any terms was matter for congratulation. His army had marched through the streets of Frederick full of pride and hope, singing, The girl I left behind me. Now it was a horde of disordered fugitives and the state of feeling at the North had changed from despondency before South Mountain to positive buoyancy after Antietam. The chief historical significance of the Battle of Antietam is that it furnished Lincoln the victory which in his opinion must precede the issuance of his proclamation of emancipation. This, as we have seen, he had laid aside on July 22nd until some military success should give support to the policy. The working of his mind in the interval of two months is an open page to us up to day. Although he had already come to a decision, he showed the true executive acumen in not regarding the policy of striking directly at slavery as absolutely and finally determined until it had been officially promulgated. From the cabinet meeting of July 22nd, when he announced his purpose, to that of September 22nd, when he informed his advisers that he should issue the irrevocable decree, he endeavored in his correspondence, formal interviews, and private conversation, to get all possible light to aid him in deciding when the proper moment had come to proclaim freedom for the slaves. To conservatives he argued the radical side of the question. I shall not surrender this game leaving any available card unplayed, he wrote to Reverdy Johnson. To radicals he put forth a conservative view or laid stress on the necessity of proceeding with caution. He said to a committee of clergymen who presented a memorial in favor of national emancipation, I do not want to issue a document that the whole world will see must necessarily be inoperative like the Pope's bull against the comet. There was pressure on the President to issue a proclamation of emancipation, and there was pressure against it. He talked with conservatives and radicals, listened to their arguments, reasoned with them, and left different impressions on different minds. 
Much of his talk was after his characteristic manner of thinking aloud when the stimulus of contact with sympathetic or captious men afforded him an opportunity to revolve his thoughts and see the question on all sides. There was indeed much to be considered. His warrant was the war powers of the Constitution. There must be a reasonable probability that the proclamation would help the operations of his army in spite of the strong opposition among many officers of high rank to a war for the Negro, that it would weaken the Confederates by fostering in the slaves their inborn desire for freedom and so making of them all the secret friends of the North, that it might further lead to the employment of blacks as soldiers. But these considerations being granted, Lincoln must then satisfy himself that public opinion at the North would sustain him in the action. He could not doubt that the cavilling support of the radicals would turn to enthusiasm, and that their influence in the work of raising men and money would be very powerful. But was the sentiment of the plain people, the mass of steady Republicans and war Democrats, ripe for an edict of freedom? Again, the possibility that the policy might alienate the border slave states, which had clung to the Union, was in Lincoln's mind a serious objection. But the difficulty was as great not to act as to act. On the other hand, emancipation would help him in Europe. England and France could not recognize the Southern Confederacy when the real issue between the two sections was thus unmasked. Yet there was no reason to fear that an avowed war against slavery would revive the opposition of the Democrats and give them a club to use against the administration. But the President did not regard this an objection of great moment, since party opposition in the North must be expected in any event. In sum, it was only by turning the question over and over in his mind that he finally settled his doubts. He believed that a proclamation of freedom was a military necessity, and that the plain people of the North would see this necessity even as he did. As the days went on, he was confirmed in the conclusion to which he had come in July, and felt that public sentiment was growing in that direction. Calling his cabinet together on September 22nd, the President read from a book which Artemis Ward had sent to him, the story entitled, High-Handed Outrage at Utica. In the fowl of 1856 I showed my show in Utica, a truly great city in the state of New York. The people gave me a cordial reception. The press was loud in her praises. One day, as I was given a description of my beasts and snakes in my usual flowery style, what was my scorn and disgust to see a big burly feller walk up to the cage containing my wax figures of the Lord's Last Supper, and seize Judas Iscariot by the feet and drag him out on the ground? He then commenced fur to pound him as hard as he could. "'What under the sun are you about?' cried I. "'Says he.' "'What did you bring this pussy enormous cuss here fur? "'And he hit the wax figure another tremendous blow on the head. "'Says I, "'You egregious ass, that air's a wax figure, "'a representation of the false fossil. "'Says he, "'That's all very well for you to say, "'but I tell you, old man, "'that Judas Iscariot can't show hisself in Utica "'with impunity by a darn sight.' With which observation he caved in Judas's head. The young man belonged to one of the first families in Utiki. I sued him, and the jury brought in a verdict of arson in the third degree. Lincoln thought the story very funny and greatly enjoyed the reading of it, while the members of the cabinet except Stanton laughed with him. Then he fell into a grave tone and told of the working of his thoughts since the meeting of July 22nd. The rebel army is now driven out of Maryland, he said, and I am going to fulfill the promise I made to myself and my God. I have got you together to hear what I have written down. I do not wish your advice about the main matter, for that I have determined for myself. He then read his proclamation of freedom. On the first day of January, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. In the case of the loyal slave states, he declared again for his policy of compensated emancipation and colonization of the freed Negroes, and said that he should in due time recommend compensation also for the loss of their slaves to loyal citizens of the states in rebellion. All the members of the cabinet except Blair approved the proclamation on the whole, and Blair's objection was on the ground of expediency, not of principle. 
on the morrow, September 23rd, this edict was given to the country. End of Chapter 4 5. Part 1 the judgment of the people at the ballot-box was unfavorable to the President. At the October and November elections, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin, all of which except New Jersey had cast their electoral votes for Lincoln, now declared against him. The Democrats made conspicuous gains of congressmen, and if they had had a majority in the other states, would have controlled the next House of Representatives. From such a disaster, Lincoln was saved by New England, Michigan, Iowa, California, Minnesota, Kansas, Oregon, and the border slave states. The Emancipation Proclamation was a contributing cause to this defeat. That the war begun for the Union was now a war for the Negro was held up as a reproach. And, in contravention, the Constitution as it is and the Union as it was became a maxim to conjure with. And there were other contributing causes. But the chief source of dissatisfaction was the lack of success in the field. Elation over the victory of Antietam had been followed by disappointment at Lee's army being suffered to recross the Potomac without further loss. But if McClellan had destroyed it and if Buell had won a signal victory in Kentucky, Lincoln would certainly have received a warm approval at the polls. The view of a radical who had a remarkable way of putting things will give us an idea of the criticism Lincoln had to undergo. The result of the elections was a most serious and severe reproof to the administration, wrote Carl Schurz from the army to the president, and the administration is to blame. It placed the army, now a great power in this republic, into the hands of its enemies. What Republican general has ever had a fair chance in this war? Did not McClellan, Buell, Halleck, and their creatures and favorite claims obtain and absorb everything? The system should be changed. Let us be commanded by generals whose heart is in the war. Let every general who does not show himself strong enough to command success be deposed at once. If West Point cannot do the business, let West Point go down. Another radical was more hopeful. The administration, wrote Charles Elliot Norton, will not be hurt by the reaction, the defeat in the fall elections, if the war goes on prosperously. While Lee was advancing the cause of the Confederacy in Virginia, Bragg and Kirby Smith, by their operations in Kentucky, were endeavoring to retrieve the Confederate losses in the West. Smith, defeating the Union force which opposed him, occupied Lexington, the home of Henry Clay and the center of the Bluegrass region, the Garden of the State. The loss of Lexington, telegraphed Governor Morton of Indiana to the Secretary of War, is the loss of the heart of Kentucky and leaves the road open to the Ohio River. Smith's army did indeed threaten Cincinnati and Louisville, causing great alarm. In Cincinnati, martial law was declared, liquor shops were closed, all business was ordered to be suspended, every man who could fight or work was commanded to assemble at his voting place for the purpose of drill or labor. The street cars ceased to run, and long lines of men were drilled in the streets, among them prominent citizens, ministers and judges, many beyond the age of forty-five. A newspaper alleged to be disloyal was suppressed. Todd, the governor of Ohio, hastened to Cincinnati and called out for military service all the loyal men of the river counties. Meanwhile, Kirby Smith pushed a detachment to within a few miles of the city. Consternation reigned. Bells were rung in the early morning to summon men to arms and hundreds of laborers were put to work in the trenches. Women were asked to prepare lint and bandages for the approaching battle. The war has come home to us, was the thought of all. The alarm spread through the state. The call of the governor for all the armed minute men met with a prompt response, and thousands with double-barreled shotguns and squirrel rifles, known henceforward as squirrel hunters, poured into the city. But Smith did not deem himself strong enough to attack Cincinnati. Awaiting a junction with Bragg, he withdrew the threatening detachment much to the city's relief. Bragg and Buell had a race for Louisville, but the Confederate who had the shorter line of march got ahead and placed himself between the city and the Union army. It is thought that if he had pressed on vigorously he might have captured Louisville, but Bragg procrastinated. Overawed, perhaps, by the magnitude of his enterprise, he lost heart and would not press forward. Then Buell came up in his rear. The two armies confronted each other, and while each commander was willing to fight if he had the advantage of position, neither would risk attacking the other on his chosen ground. 
there ensued a contest in manoeuvring. Buell feared that defeat would result in the fall of Louisville. Bragg feared the serious crippling of his army. Both were short of supplies. Finally, when reduced to three days' rations, Bragg turned aside from the direct road north, leaving the way open for Buell, who moved rapidly to Louisville. Thus the Kentucky campaign of the Confederates was a failure, even as was their Maryland campaign, and mainly for the same reason, that in each case the denizens of the invaded territory were for the most part favorable to the Union. We must abandon the garden spot of Kentucky to its cupidity, wrote Bragg. The love of ease and fear of pecuniary loss are the fruitful sources of this evil. Buell, having ensured the safety of Louisville, started in pursuit of the enemy. They met in severe battle at Perryville, both generals claiming the victory. Next day, Bragg fell back and soon afterwards took up his march southward. Buell did not make a vigorous pursuit. He failed to overtake the Confederates and bring them to battle, but he drove them out of Kentucky. Western radicals opposed Buell as their eastern fellow laborers opposed McClellan, and they had at their head Oliver P. Morton of Indiana, who was the ablest and most energetic of the war governors of the western states. The governors of the northern states were important factors in the early conduct of the war, because the national administration was at first dependent on the state machinery for furnishing troops, and to some extent their equipment. Owing to the geographical position of his state and the bitterness of the democratic opposition within its borders, Morton had more obstacles to surmount than any other governor. He threw himself into the contest with a vigor and pertinacity that could not be excelled. Wishing to see operative in military affairs the same force which he put into the administration of his state, he made no secret of his contempt for the generalship of Buell, whom he even accused in his communications with Washington of being a rebel sympathizer. Morton, though personally incorrupt, took his coagitators from amongst the vulgar and the shifty, making his test of fitness for civil and military office a personal devotion and unscrupulous obedience to himself, rather than intrinsic honesty and high character. He and Buell became enemies, and he held it a duty to his country, as well as an offering to his self-interest, to crush the man whom he could not use. Lincoln had been dissatisfied with Buell's slowness and influenced by the pressure of Morton and Stanton, and the manifestations of public sentiment in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois took the general at his word when, aware of the government's discontent, he suggested on October 16th that, if it were deemed best to change the command of the army, now would be a convenient time to do it. Buell was relieved, and Rosecrans put in his place. In this decision, the President erred, as the opinion expressed by Grant fourteen years after the war is doubtless sound. Buell had genius enough for the highest commands. If now the scene be changed to the banks of the Potomac, the leading actor is McClellan, the action much the same. The General did not take the aggressive promptly enough to satisfy the President and the people of the North. On October 1st, Lincoln went to see McClellan, remained with the army three days, and, as a result of the conferences and observations of his visit, directed the general after his return to Washington to cross the Potomac and give the battle to the enemy or drive him south. Still, McClellan procrastinated, aiming always at his ideal completeness of preparation. On October 13th, Wells recorded, the mortifying intelligence that the rebel cavalry rode entirely around our great and victorious army of the Potomac, crossing the river above it, and recrossing the Potomac below McClellan and our troops. This will be a mortifying affair to McClellan, wrote Meade, and will do him, I fear, serious injury. On October 22nd, Wells sat down in his diary. It is just five weeks since the Battle of Antietam and the army is quiet, reposing in camp. The country groans, but nothing is done. McClellan's inertness makes the assertions of his opponents prophetic. He is sadly afflicted with what the President calls the slows. Meade had a high respect for McClellan, but held the opinion that he errs on the side of prudence and caution, and that a little more rashness on his part would improve his generalship. On October 26th, the army, 116,000 strong, began to cross the Potomac, and six days later, the last division was over. The Confederates fell back. On November 7th, the Union army was massed near Warrenton and received word from the President that he had relieved McClellan and placed Burnside in command. The army is filled with gloom, wrote Meade next day. 
burnside it is said wept like a child and is the most distressed man in the army openly says he is not fit for the position and that mcclellan is the only man we have who can handle the large army collected together the pressure of the radicals led by stanton and chase undoubtedly influenced the president to remove mcclellan but he ought not to have issued the order unless he and his secretary of war knew of a general of equal ability for the command this obligation he seemed indeed to feel in a letter to carl schurz he intimated that the war should be conducted on military knowledge not on political affinity and he said to wade a leading radical senator who pressed him to remove mcclellan put yourself in my place for a moment if i relieve mcclellan whom shall i put in command why said wade anybody to which came the reply wade anybody will do for you but not for me i must have somebody meade reynolds and the other generals of their corps called upon mcclellan expressed their deep regret at his departure and sincerely hoped he would soon return mcclellan was very much affected almost to tears meade wrote and said that separation from this army was the severest blow that could be inflicted upon him the army meade added is greatly depressed the officers and soldiers undoubtedly felt as general francis a walker afterwards wrote that he who could move the hearts of a great army was no ordinary man nor was he who took such heavy toll of joseph e johnston and robert e lee an ordinary soldier this judgment may be supported by a comparison of the losses and battles between mcclellan and the confederates in nearly every one of them their loss was greater than his inasmuch as the number of men fit for military service was greater at the north than at the south the confederacy must if continuing to suffer equal losses in battle be thrust to the wall provided the union could and would maintain the contest while the confederacy was young and fresh and rich and its armies were numerous wrote francis w palfrey mcclellan fought a good wary damaging respectable fight against it grant's candid expression fourteen years after the war is of great value in any judgment on mcclellan he asserted there must be considered the vast and cruel responsibility which at the outset of the war devolved upon him a young man watched by a restless people and congress if he did not succeed it was because the conditions of success were so trying if mcclellan had gone into the war as sherman thomas or meade had fought his way along and up i have no reason to suppose that he would not have won as high distinction as any of us nineteen days after the removal lincoln confessed his mistake writing to carl schurz i certainly have been dissatisfied with the slowness of buell and mcclellan but before i relieved them i had great fears i should not find successors to them who would do better and i am sorry to add that i have seen little since to relieve those fears even though lincoln felt that he must yield his better judgment to political considerations he might have exercised greater discretion in the choice of mcclellan's successor a certain radical reflecting deeply in his quiet retreat at cambridge suggested the test that william t sherman afterwards applied in january eighteen sixty five a test that should have been seriously considered by the president his secretary of war and halleck burnside may be able to command one hundred thousand men in the field but is he burnside had given no proof of his fitness had refused the place twice and had told the president and secretary of war over and over again that he was not competent to command so large an army and that mcclellan was the best general for the position had he simply been asked to take it he would have refused but as the promotion came to him in the form of an order he deemed it his duty to obey ropes thought that franklin should have been given the command it is among the possibilities that meade or reynolds or humphreys may have been considered meade had served with distinction as a brigade commander during the seven days fighting in virginia at antietam he and his division were in the thickest of the battle and when hooker was wounded he was placed by mcclellan in command of the corps during the president's visit to antietam after the battle meade accompanied him and mcclellan on their survey of the battlefield on which occasion mcclellan highly commended the work of his subordinate if meade created a favorable impression in the president's mind it is surprising that mcclellan's comments did not lead to his being considered for the post of commander of the army of the potomac he would probably have proved as capable at this juncture as he did eight months later burnside was a man of high character and gentle nature he deserved a better fate but he had not a happy hour during the eighty days of his command 
he soon gave evidence of the incompetence to which he had so often confessed. The removal of McClellan implied the ascendancy of the radicals and the assumption of a vigorous offensive in the conduct of the war. Burnside lent himself to that policy, but neither he nor the President took sufficiently into account the great ability of the commander whom they opposed. By the last week of November, Burnside, with his army 113,000 strong, was on the north bank of the Rappahannock River, opposite Fredericksburg, where Lee had 72,000. Burnside proposed to cross the river and strike at the enemy in his chosen strong position. No movement would have given Lee greater satisfaction. The night before the battle, Burnside was bewildered as he found himself committed to a greater undertaking than he had the ability and the nerve to carry through. Contrary to his habit of mind, he became headstrong, irritable, and rash. In a muddled sort of way, he thought out the semblance of a plan and gave a confused order for an attack by his left, which in the manner of its execution was certain to fail. His right, with even greater madness, he sent forward to a useless butchery. These regiments, retiring slowly and in good order, many of the soldiers singing and hurrahing, ended the battle. The Confederate loss was 5,309 the Union 12,653. Next day, Burnside was wild with grief. Oh, those men, those men over there, he wailed, pointing across the river where lay the dead and wounded. I am thinking of them all the time. In his frenzy, he conceived a desperate plan. He thought of putting himself at the head of his old corps, the Ninth, and leading them in person in an assault on the Confederates behind the stone wall, from which they had done such deadly execution on the soldiers of his right. Generals Sumner, Franklin, and a number of corps and division commanders dissuaded him from this undertaking, and on the night of December 15th, during a violent storm of rain and wind, he successfully withdrew his army to the north side of the river. Burnside's loss in killed, wounded, and missing was heavy but with regard to the army's fighting power this was a small matter in comparison with the loss in morale officers and soldiers feeling that they had been put to a useless sacrifice lost confidence in their commander at a review of the second corps couch and the division commanders called upon the men to give a cheer for their general they rode along the lines waving their caps or swords but failed to elicit a single encouraging response some soldiers even gave vent to derisive cries Indeed, the demoralization of the army was complete. Officers resigned and great numbers of men deserted. The president was exceedingly perturbed and depressed at the repulse before Fredericksburg, the responsibility for which he must share with his general since he had placed him in command. Nearly three months earlier, he had confessed to his cabinet that he was losing his hold on the northern people, which he knew, as we all know now, was the prime requisite of success. Since then he had suffered defeat at the ballot-box and in the field, and the defeat of his army was aggravated in the popular estimation by his mistaken change of generals. Had McClellan appeared to take command once more, those soldiers who had received Burnside so coldly would have rent the air with joyful shouts. When the full story of Fredericksburg became known, grief wrung the hearts of the northern people at the useless sacrifice of so many noble lives. Gloom and despondency ensued, taking the religious tinge so common during our civil war. An Ohio congressman spoke for many people in his diary. It would almost seem that God works for the rebels and keeps alive their cause. Some time earlier, Lincoln had given utterance to a similar thought. Being a humble instrument in the hands of our Heavenly Father, if I find my efforts fail, I must believe that for some purpose unknown to me, He wills it otherwise. And thus, Mead, it does seem as if Providence was against us. The remainder of Burnside's service is marked by desperate energy on his part, making plans to retrieve the disaster by recrossing the river and attacking the Confederates again. By his officers and soldiers' distrust of him and opposition to his projected offensive movement, by the inefficiency of Stanton and Halleck and the painful perplexity of the President, who restrained his general with this order, you must not make a general movement of the army without letting me know. Lincoln had a conference with Burnside in Washington at which Stanton and Halleck were present, but being sadly in need of expert guidance which his secretary and general-in-chief were unable to supply, failed to reach a positive decision. Afterwards he gave a qualified consent to Burnside, who was still bent on crossing the river and delivering another attack. 
Very different now was his counsel from that which he had been accustomed to give McClellan. Be cautious, he wrote to Burnside, and do not understand that the country or government is driving you. Burnside moved his army four miles up the river. The pontoons, artillery, and all other accessories were up in time, wrote Meade, and we all thought the next morning the bridges would be thrown over and we should be at it. But man proposes and God disposes. About 9 p.m. a terrific storm of wind and rain set in and continued all night. For the next two days it rained incessantly, rendering the roads deep with mud and any movement impossible. But the interference of the elements was most undoubtedly to the advantage of the Union side, for an attack of Burnside's demoralized soldiers on Lee's compact and devoted army would have been merely a further wanton sacrifice of men. Carl Schurz wrote from the army to the president, I am convinced the spirit of the men is systematically demoralized, and the confidence in their chief systematically broken by several of the commanding generals. I have heard generals, subordinate officers, and men say they expect to be whipped anyhow, that all these fatigues and hardships are for nothing, and that they might as well go home. Add to this that the immense army is closely packed together in the mud, that sickness is spreading at a frightful rate, that in consequence of all these causes of discouragement, desertion increases every day, and you will not be surprised if you see the army melt away with distressing rapidity. The disaster of Fredericksburg brought about a cabinet crisis, as it is called by the contemporary authorities in conformity with English political phraseology. But the procedure when a national calamity calls for prompt administrative action reveals a difference between the English and American constitutions. Lincoln was the head of the administration, the commander-in-chief of the army, and if any one other than Burnside was responsible for the defeat on the Rappahannock, it was he. So declared the Democrats without reserve. The Republicans, too, in private conversation and confidential letters, expressed the same conviction, although in public they were cautious and reticent. If the American government had been like the English with Lincoln prime minister, Congress would probably have voted a want of confidence in him, and he would then have resigned or appealed to the country. But, as Lincoln had said on September 22nd, and might now have reiterated with equal force, If I was satisfied that the public confidence was more fully possessed by anyone else than by me, and knew of any constitutional way in which he might be put in my place, he should have it. I would gladly yield it to him. But though I believe that I have not so much the confidence of the people as I had some time since, I do not know that all things considered any other person has more. And, however that may be, there is no way in which I can have any other man put where I am. I am here. I must do the best I can and bear the responsibility of taking the course which I feel I ought to take. In view of this constitutional limitation, the Republican senators in two successive caucuses, assuming to speak for a majority of their party and the nation, reverted unconsciously to earlier English precedents, and by word and deed plainly indicated their belief that the failure to prosecute the war with vigor and success arose from the President being badly advised and dominated by his Secretary of State. A committee of nine was appointed to present their view to the President, who arranged the meeting for the evening of December 18th, and who was prepared for the attack, having received Seward's resignation on the previous day. This the secretary had sent him immediately on learning of the proceedings of the Senate caucus. The conversation between the president and the senators was animated and free. Wade said that the conduct of the war was left mainly in the hands of men who had no sympathy with the cause, and that the Republicans of the West owed their defeat in the recent elections to the President, having placed the direction of our military affairs in the hands of bitter and malignant Democrats, meaning McClellan, Buell, and Halleck. Fessenden said that the Senate had entire confidence in the patriotism and integrity of the President, but that Republican senators were inclined to believe that the Secretary of State was not in accord with the majority of the Cabinet and exerted an injurious influence upon the conduct of the war. The officers of the regular army, largely pro-slavery men and strongly imbued with the Southern feeling, he continued, had little sympathy with the Republican Party. It was singularly unfortunate that almost every officer known as an anti-slavery man had been disgraced. He instanced Fremont, Hunter, Mitchell, and others. Sumner, Grimes, and other senators expressed their lack of confidence in Seward. Next day the President told his cabinet, who were all present except the Secretary of State, that the point and pith of the senator's complaint was of Seward. 
they charged him if not with infidelity with indifference with want of earnestness in the war with want of sympathy with the country and especially with the too great ascendancy and control of the president and measures of administration in more homely phrase he described the senator's attitude while they seemed to believe in my honesty they also appeared to think that when i had in me any good purpose or intention seward contrived to suck it out of me unperceived finally the president requested the members of his cabinet to meet the senatorial committee that evening december nineteenth at the white house the senators came in response to his summons to continue the conference of the previous evening although somewhat surprised at having to treat with the members of the cabinet except seward as well as with the president he opened the meeting with a defense of the cabinet and the administration secretary chase endorsed the president's statement fully and entirely this was a surprise to the radical senators who regarded chase as their leader and had been influenced by his strictures of the president and the secretary of state but chase when thus brought to bay found himself swayed by esprit de corps and by the thought that he and seward had for many years wrought together in the anti-slavery cause he therefore stood up manfully for the secretary of state and for the rest of his associates grimes sumner and trumbull were pointed emphatic and unequivocal in their opposition to seward whose zeal and sincerity in this conflict they doubted each was unrelenting and unforgiving the president managed his own case speaking freely and showed great tact shrewdness and ability he considered it most desirous to conciliate the senators with respectful deference whatever may have been his opinion of their interference Pessenden objected to discussing the merits or demerits of a member of the cabinet in the presence of his associates, whereupon the members of the cabinet withdrew. Though it was nearly midnight, Fessenden and some of the senators remained. Fessenden said to the president, You have asked my opinion upon Mr. Seward's removal. There is a current rumor that he has already resigned. If so, our opinions are of no consequence on that point. The president admitted that Seward had tendered his resignation, but added that he had not yet accepted it. Then, sir, said Fessenden, the question seems to be whether Mr. Seward shall be requested to withdraw his resignation. Yes, from Lincoln. I feel bound to say, then replied the senator, that as Mr. Seward has seen fit to resign, I should advise that his resignation be accepted. It was 1 a.m. when the senators left the White House on this saturday morning december twentieth the president sent for chase telling him on his arrival this matter is giving me great trouble chase replied that painfully affected by the meeting last evening he had prepared his resignation of the office of secretary of the treasury where is it said the president quickly his eye lighting up in a moment i brought it with me said chase taking the paper from his pocket i wrote it this morning let me have it said the president reaching his long arm and fingers toward chase who held on seemingly reluctant to part with the letter which was sealed and which he apparently hesitated to surrender the president was eager took and hastily opened the letter this said he with a triumphal laugh cuts the gordian knot i can dispose of the subject now without difficulty i see my way clear then stanton who was in the president's office with chase offered his resignation you may go to your department lincoln replied i don't want yours this holding out chase's letter is all i want this relieves me my way is clear the trouble is ended i will detain neither of you longer soon after chase stanton and wells who was also present at the interview had left lincoln still holding chase's letter in his hand said to senator harris who had called now i can ride i've got a pumpkin in each end of my bag Lincoln's elation at having in his hands the resignation of the chief of the radicals at the same time as that of the chief conservative is easy to understand. The radical senators who had attacked Seward would have viewed with great displeasure the retirement of Chase, but they it was who had brought it to pass that both must go or both remain. If I had yielded to that storm, said Lincoln nearly a year later, and dismissed Seward, the thing would all have slumped over one way and we should have been left with a scanty handful of supporters. When Chase sent in his resignation, I saw that the game was in my own hands, and I put it through. He declined both resignations and asked both men to resume the duties of their departments, which Seward did cheerfully and Chase reluctantly. The cabinet crisis was over. 
lincoln had displayed rare political sagacity in retaining in the service of the state the men who could best serve it notwithstanding the lack of harmony in the cabinet and the knowledge congress had of it his decision that the public interest does not admit of the retirement of the state and treasury secretaries is justified by a study of the existing crisis in the light of subsequent events in the misfortune and dejection which had fallen upon the country no voice could be slighted that would be raised for the continued prosecution of the war and since seward and chase represented the diverse opinions of two large classes of men who were at least in concord on the one all-important policy it was desirable that they should remain in the cabinet the loss of either or both of them would have meant a subtraction from the popular support of the administration that could in no other way be made good there were also other reasons why the president did not wish to part with them since april eighteen sixty one seward had rendered him a loyal support sinking his ambition for the presidency he had come to appreciate lincoln's ability and to acknowledge in him the head of the government in reality as in name he had been an efficient minister although slavery in the confederacy was a stumbling block in the way of its recognition by england and france and whilst the influence of lincoln adams and sumner in foreign relations was of great weight much credit is still due the secretary of state for managing the affairs of his department in such a way as to avert the interference of europe in our struggle chase was supreme in his own department and wrote the financial part of the president's message of december first eighteen sixty two Lincoln had had no business training and, like many lawyers, had little or no conception of the country's resources and sustainable outlay. Having no taste for the subject, he did not try to grasp the principles of finance, and being obliged to master, as a layman may, the arts of war and diplomacy, he was wise to attempt no more. But Lincoln, though unversed in finance, had a first-rate knowledge of men, and this it was that led him to retain as his Secretary of the Treasury one whose inflexible honesty and receptive mind justify the popular estimate of him as a strong finance minister. That the war had gone on for nearly two years with an immense expenditure of money, and that the government could still buy all it needed of food and munitions of war and could pay its soldiers, was due primarily to the patriotism and devotion of the northern people but honor should also be given to the manager of the country's finances the secretary of the treasury was probably not a pleasant man at the council board moreover his temperament differed so essentially from the president's that sympathetic relations between the two men were impossible chase was handsome of commanding presence careful in dress courtly in manner a graduate of dartmouth he had a fair knowledge of latin and greek and the reverence for them of an educated lawyer he was widely read, and even in his busy life as member of the cabinet, found his recreation in improving his acquaintance with good English and French literature. He cared neither for cards nor for the theatre. A serious, thoughtful man in every walk of life, he brought to the business of his department a well-thought-out method. Lincoln, plain and ungainly, gave no thought to the graces of life and lacked the accomplishments of a gentleman, as no one knew better than himself he had no system in the disposition of his time or in the preparation of his work during his term of office he confined his reading of books mainly to military treatises and to works which guided him in the solution of questions of constitutional and international law although he occasionally snatched an hour to devote to his beloved shakespeare and revealed in his state papers an undiminished knowledge of the bible he found recreation in the theatre and has left on record his pleasure at hackett's impersonation of falstaff as Hamlet had a peculiar charm for him, Edwin Booth's presentation of the role must have afforded him a rare delight. Possessed of a keen sense of humor, he was a capital storyteller, and in this capacity must often have grated on the serious temper of his finance minister, who had no humor in him and but little knowledge of men. Chase's private correspondence reveals him to our surprise in friendly communication with many cheap persons, mainly it is true political followers on whose help he counted for obtaining the much-desired presidency this ambition or rather the unseemly manifestations of it became the greatest hindrance to his usefulness his opinion of lincoln's parts was not high and could hardly have remained unperceived by the president who in return made no attempt to conceal his judgment that chase was a very able man at this time the secretary was by no means alone in his estimate of the president in the minds of many senators and representatives existed a distrust of his ability and force of character which had been created in those who met him frequently by his lack of dignity 
his grotesque expression and manner, and his jocular utterances when others were depressed. These eccentricities, when viewed in the damning light of military failure, could not but produce in certain quarters a painful impression. Of the interview between Lincoln, the Cabinet, and the Senators during the Cabinet crisis, Fessenden wrote sarcastically, The President related several anecdotes, most of which I had heard before. While his popularity was waning, he was stronger with the country than with the men at Washington. The people did not come in personal contact with him, and judged him by his formal state papers and his acts. Posterity, having seen his ultimate success, judges him on the same ground and looks with admiration on the patience and determination with which he bore his burden during this gloomy winter. The hand that draws the grotesque traits of Lincoln may disappoint the hero-worshipper, but veracity in the narrative demands the inclusion of this touch which helps to explain the words of disparagement so freely applied to him, and serves as a justification for those who could not in the winter of 1862-63 to see with the eyes of today. Had his other qualities been enhanced by Washington's dignity of manner, not so many had been deceived. But, as it was, we cannot wonder that his contemporaries failed to appreciate his greatness. Since his early environment in fostering his essential capabilities had not bestowed on him the external characteristics usually attributed to transcendent leaders of men, it was not suspected that, despite his lowly beginning, he had developed into a man of extraordinary mental power. Seward, with his amiable and genial manners, was an agreeable man in council. Fertile in suggestion, he must, in spite of his personal feelings, have been exceedingly helpful to Lincoln, whose slow-working mind was undoubtedly often assisted to a decision by the various expedients which his Secretary of State put before him. For it is frequently easier for an executive to choose one out of several courses than to invent a policy. The members of the Cabinet who filled the public eye were Seward, Chase, and Stanton, and they demand a proportionate attention from the historian. It was either on Seward or Stanton that the President leaned the most, and the weight of evidence confirmed by the fact of his urbanity points to the Secretary of State as his favorite counselor. Though Lincoln made up his mind slowly, once he had come to a decision, he was thenceforth inflexible. By gradual steps he had evolved the policy of emancipation, and he was determined to stick to it in spite of the defeat of his party at the ballot-box, and of his principal army in the field during the hundred days that intervened between the preliminary proclamation of September 22nd and the necessary complement of January 1st, 1863. Although the form of the preliminary proclamation implied that some of the Confederates or all might lay down their arms to avoid the loss of their slaves, no such outcome was seriously regarded as possible. Doubt no longer existed that a united people in the South were earnest in their desire to secure their independence, and that if the proclamation had affected them at all, it had only stiffened them in their resistance by adding force to the argument that the War of the North was a crusade against their social institutions. Regarding the proclamation, as a fit and necessary war measure, the President wrote on January 1, 1863, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves, in the states or parts of states resisting the United States government, are and henceforward shall be free. Upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. Lincoln had the American reverence for the Constitution and the laws, and he could find no authority for the proclamation in the letter of the Constitution or in any statute. But he thought out what were satisfying reasons to his own mind. My oath to preserve the Constitution to the best of my ability, he wrote afterwards, imposed upon me the duty of preserving by every indispensable means that government, that nation of which that Constitution was the organic law. I felt that measures otherwise unconstitutional might become lawful by becoming indispensable to the preservation of the Constitution through the preservation of the nation. I could not feel that to the best of my ability I had even tried to preserve the Constitution if to save slavery or any minor matter I should permit the wreck of government, country, and Constitution altogether. I think the Constitution invests its commander-in-chief with the law of war in time of war. The most that can be said, if so much, is that slaves are property. Is there, has there ever been, any question that by law of war, property both of enemies and friends may be taken when needed? 
the proclamation making clear as it did the real issue of the war was of incontestable value in turning english sentiment into a favorable channel it already had the approval of the house of representatives and when enforced by victories in the field received the support of the majority of the northern people in addition to military emancipation the president purposed giving the slaves their freedom in a strictly legal manner and ensuring the compensation of their owners by the federal government in his annual message to congress of december first eighteen sixty two he took as his text the sound and now familiar proposition that without slavery the rebellion as he and the north called the civil war could never have existed without slavery it could not continue and showed in his argument a grasp of the subject which in the light of our subsequent experience has proved him a consummate statesman he pleaded for gradual emancipation appointing january first nineteen hundred as the time when it should be completed to spare both races from the evils of sudden derangement it is to be regretted that this prophetic appeal was not reinforced by victories in the field such as were wont to point the utterances of caesar and napoleon as matters stood distrust of lincoln pervaded both the senate and the house and for the moment his personal prestige amongst the people had paled because his armies had made no headway so it was hardly surprising that his policy of gradual and compensated emancipation failed to receive the approval of either congress or the country nevertheless he had been happy in seizing the right moment for issuing his proclamation of emancipation as from antietam in september eighteen sixty two to gettysburg in july eighteen sixty three the north gained no real victory and her army of the potomac suffered two crushing defeats a glimmer of hope from the west lightened the intense gloom following the disaster of fredericksburg influenced undoubtedly by the president's desire for a victory and deeming the conditions auspicious rosecrans moved out of nashville the day after christmas with the intention of attacking the confederates for a number of days he advanced skirmishing as he went and finally took up a position within three miles of murfreesboro tennessee where bragg's army had gone into winter quarters on the last day of the year he determined to make the attack but bragg had resolved to take the offensive at the same time and obtain the advantage of the initial onset the bloody battle of stones river or murfreesboro ensued wherein forty one thousand union troops were pitted against thirty four thousand confederates the confederates won the day but rosecrans stubbornly maintained his ground on january second eighteen sixty three bragg again attacked the union army and met with repulse on the night of the following day his troops being somewhat demoralized he retreated from murfreesboro this gave rosecrans a chance of which he at once availed himself to claim the victory in the campaign the president telegraphed to him god bless you halleck called it one of the most brilliant successes of the war throughout the north it was proclaimed a victory at last ran the sentiment of the people our great general has appeared the loss on both sides was heavy and both armies were so crippled that a long time was required to repair the damage although the casualties of rosecrans were the larger the superior resources of the north inclined the balance against the confederates who sustained moreover the loss in morale in eighteen sixty five however grant declared that murfreesboro was no victory for the north and william t sherman wrote at the time that rosecrans victory of murfreesboro is dearly bought End of chapter 5, part 1